Ready? Now we are. All right, looks like we're, we're broadcasting now. Okay, so good morning. Welcome to the 11 a.m. public portion of the closed session of the May 26, 2020 meeting of the City Council. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely and I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's City Council meeting. If you wish to comment on closed session items, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Please note that there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your te television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement. The time will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have finished commenting. Now I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers. Bonnie, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Byers. Here. Matthews. Here. Brown. Here. Boulder. Here. Oh. Council Member Golder. Um, uh -huh. Was here. After all that. Um, Councilmember Watkins was going to be late. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. At this moment in time, I'd like to see if there's any member of the public who would like to speak on our closed session item. Please call in one of the numbers that are on your screen and please press star nine to raise your hand and uh, you'll be acknowledged to speak. It looks like Council Member Bowler's back as well. Okay, um, seeing no comments, I guess we can close the meeting to other members of the public and start our closed session item. I'd also like to ask if there's any staff on, on the line who are not uh, part of closed session, please log off and uh, log back on at 1.30. Good afternoon and welcome to our 1.30 p.m. session of the May 26, 2020 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely and I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's City Council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are on your screen. Use your streaming device upon calling in and listen through your phone. Please note that there's a delay in streaming. If you need to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. Call in the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The timer will be then set to two minutes, and you may hang up once you've uh, commented on your item. You may also send an email to cityclerk at cityofsantacruz.com. Your comment will be shared with the council members as they are received and will be entered into the public record. And with that, I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Here. Matthews? Council Member Matthews? She's, I will confirm that she is here. Can you hear us, Cynthia? Oh, you know, it, it all went dead for a little bit. Okay. Uh, and you've come back alive now. Okay. Uh, Council kind of the pros, yeah. Council Member Brown? No. Here. Holder? No. Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings. Here. 
would like to acknowledge that the land upon which we gather is the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Ahmudson tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historic trauma. Okay, and to begin our meeting today, we have a presentation uh, from Sharon Papo, Executive Director of the Diversity Center. Is Sharon on to call with us? Yes, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for, for inviting me to be here. I'm really honored to be here. And Bonnie, can you um, can you keep up my presentation? Yep, it, it's up. Oh. We have it up. Okay, can folks see it? Uh, Bonnie council members can't see the presentation. You might need to share a screen. Great, we're working on it. Cool. Okay, yeah. fantastic, great. Wonderful. Uh, first of all, I want to um, just thank the Santa Cruz City Council for your longtime commitment to being great allies to the LGBTQ plus community. And as we are about to go into Pride Month, I really appreciate your time to, to give this presentation. All right, next slide, please. I wanted to talk about a few things today. One is how COVID-19 has been affecting the LGBTQ plus community, what the Diversity Center's response has been, and then what is going on with Pride 2020. So I wanted to make sure that the City Council knows that COVID-19 has had significant impacts on the LGBTQ plus community. And some of the reasons why that is, is because there are higher rates of smoking and asthma in our community, which means that a respiratory illness will impact us significantly. We have higher rates of HIV, AIDS, and cancer, so we have more folks who are immunocompromised. One in five LGBTQ people live in poverty, and uh, we are overrepresented as essential workers who are clearly at risk of more exposure uh, to, to COVID-19. As I'm sure you all know, COVID-19 is not impacting all communities equally who, who, who get it. And folks who are Latino, Latino, and African-American are at greater risk for dying. And if you put in sexuality and gender as risk factors, um, then, then the risk is even higher. And so it's important to, to know who, who is really bearing the brunt of, of the death and the impact. 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBTQ+. This number comes from the Williams Institute of UCLA. Uh, our local point-in-time homeless count survey uh, said that 33% um, of local homeless folks identify as LGBTQ+. So it's, it's in this range um, of overrepresentation. And LGBTQ plus elders are less likely to reach out for help because of real or perceived discrimination from service providers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we did our own community survey. It's still in process, but I wanted to share some of the, the early top issues that have come up. Uh, one is that 31% of respondents have lost income due to COVID-19 and 20% are, are not sure yet. So that's a lot of folks who are, are really having an economic impact. 20% of our survey respondents expect to learn less than $25,000 this year, which is uh, in alignment with what I shared in the last uh, slide, which is one in five folks in poverty. 25% of LGBTQ folks don't know how to access community resources like food, housing, and unemployment. Mental health remains a top need, uh, with 33% of folks expressing uh, concerns about their mental health, and 24% of those folks feel they don't have access to the mental health resources that they need. Next slide, please. Sheltering in place has been a, a, a really important um, effort to reduce the spread of COVID, but it's also had impacts on people's health. For LGBTQ plus youth, 
they, some of them are home isolated with families that are not accepting of, of who they are, and that has had some really uh, very hard impacts on some young folks. Um, I think about one of our, our young folks who used to come in all the time and being at home in, in a, a not accepting household started really talking a lot about self-harm and we started getting very worried. So we reached out, found them a free therapist. They could talk to you twice a week and they're sleeping now and, and thankfully doing much better. Uh, we see that these impacts in the national suicide hotline calls, which have doubled since we've gone into shelter in place. And many LGBTQ plus seniors were already suffering from loneliness and isolation. And of course, sheltering in place has only um, expedited that, that impact. I think about one, one elder in our community who I, I called to check in on and she said, you know, I am so painfully alone. And this woman has cancer and lives by herself um, in, in our trailer. And um, so we connected to give her 30 books and a DVD player and you know, 20 DVDs to help her just get through this time in addition to to grocery delivery support and other, other support. Next slide, please. So the Diversity Center has been a really big pivot from an in-person space of having folks walk in and ask for resources to having in-person events and gatherings. We have really said, okay, who do we need to be now? So the first thing we did was we called over 350 of our active LGBTQ plus elders to check in on them. We've done those calls three times and we found that some of them have had um, needs that they really need support around that we've met. One of our elders fell down and broke two bones and needed help with a ride back from the hospital and getting groceries and figuring out how to get in and out of their bed and, and other things that we have been essential support around. We partnered with the Volunteer Center to deliver groceries to folks' houses, non-contact of course, and one of our donors uh, to support restaurants donated a bunch of meals that we now can support the restaurants and have been delivering meals to those who are more vulnerable to COVID. And we have multiple weekly online social activities for elders, discussion groups, theater groups, singing groups. Uh, we have sip and chat spaces where uh, Jimmy Panetta came two weeks ago, John Laird is coming next week, so we're, we're having um, wonderful gatherings that are uh, vibrant and, and good places for folks to connect and, and not feel alone. Next slide, please. For our youth program, we know that the internet can be a very dangerous place. So we immediately created our own online platform 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for young people to connect with other young people locally. And at any given time, we may have 60 or more young people actively involved. So there's always a space for them to connect with each other. And we have daily activities from homework help queer history classes, cooking classes, and our three regular support groups. Um, we are still continuing virtually. We also started a new English-Spanish bilingual young adult group during this time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> For our transgender program, we moved our 18 monthly transgender support groups online. All of our groups are available through, uh, online through Zoom and through conference calls and we provided additional transgender specific programming. Next slide, please. <laughs> At the Diversity Center, we like to say that every door is the right door. And if someone is gonna reach out for help, we're gonna do all we can to say yes. For example, last week, uh, <clears throat> Dominican Hospital social worker called us and said, I have a patient here who needs some help and they're connected to the diversity center. Can you go get these things and bring them here from their house? And within an hour, a staff person was in their car um, going to get this person what they needed. Um, we are making mental health connections. We are starting next week, we're starting a coronavirus stress group led by a therapist. So we have a free weekly mental health space for folks in addition to our many other support groups that are peer led. 
and we are doing all we can to meet our goal to support our LGBTQ plus community to stay alive, strong, connected, and resilient through this pandemic and beyond. Next slide, please. As I know that you are all looking at your budgets and these are really intense times, um, we've experienced that too, that uh, some of our funders have stopped their grant making entirely and others have cut our funding in half. So while we are doing more than ever to show up for our community, we are looking at unknown funding into the future. Uh, we were very fortunate to get PPP funding, the Payment Protection Program funding, uh, which was part of the stimulus package that got us uh, funding through early June. And I want to give a big shout out to Santa Cruz, uh, at Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, who um, is our bank, who helped us through that, that process. And I know funded many local, local small organizations. Next slide, please. And we continue as the, the theme this year for Pride is nothing can stop our pride. And it's a virtual pride 2020. And I hope that city council members and folks in the community will um, connect virtually because nothing can stop our pride. And so you can find all of these events on the Diversity Center's community calendar. And some of the things going on, it's going to be a whole weekend. Fab Friday is having a virtual party for men. The Dyke Trans March is going to be happening on Saturday. A majestic dance, Majesty Dance Party with Motion Pacific. The Diversity Center will be happening on Saturday. A Pride celebration on Sunday with historical clips and interviews and entertainment. And we are encouraging folks to decorate their houses and apartments with pride flags and to be visible and prideful. And I also want to give a big shout out to the MA and their Queer History Online exhibit that the Diversity Center uh, partnered with them on is really exceptional. And I hope everyone will take time to visit it because it's a remarkable honoring of the incredible LGBTQ local history here in Santa Cruz County. Next slide, please. And that's it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your fiscal support of the Diversity Center. Thank you for your longtime support of the Diversity Center and the LGBTQ plus community. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Sharon, thank you for that presentation and for all the hard work you all are doing to ensure that people are connected and have support uh, during COVID-19. I think that you were pointing out how, you know, this has been, the sheltering in place has impacted a lot of folks. And it's great to know that your, um, that the Diversity Center has resources to support members of our LGBTQ plus community. So thank you for all the work you all are doing. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with Cynthia Matthews. Um, do you have any questions? Well, no questions, but Sharon, thanks for everything that diversity has done, will do, does <laughs> for all ages. You guys are great. And you know this, but I thought I'd just mention publicly. Uh, where is it? Here, you know about the, the, the badge that PD did for Pride. <laughs> just point that out. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Have you seen that? No, I hadn't seen that. That's amazing. These were issued to Santa Cruz PD to wear during the month of June. Oh, that's wonderful. Is that cool? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, hi, Sharon. I have not been able to catch up with you lately, so it's great to see you. It's been, been, a, been a crazy time, but um, thank you for the presentation and especially for all the um, in-depth information you've been able to focus on, especially for our community and um, to understand more about what people are faced with. Uh, it really kind of personalizes uh, the need. And um, I, even though uh, time, you know, funding and things like that are, is, is tough for everyone, I just, I really appreciate the statistics and the information that you shared today. Um, it's given me a lot of information that, um, it's specific to our community, so I, I really appreciate that. And uh, it's going to be uh, weird not to go to Pride on Sunday, but uh, it's good to see that everything will be virtual. And uh, I'll hang my 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 uh, flag on Saturday, and off we go. So thanks for everything you're doing, and 
you know, please stay in touch with us. If things come up for the community, please make sure to come and let the council know about, um, you know, any needs or situations that come, come up for us. Thanks again. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Myers for being out and proud it means a lot to our community. Uh, Council Member Golder. I just also wanted to thank you and everyone in your organization for all the hard work you do. And I appreciate the presentation because I didn't realize the parts of your work that involves reaching out to older adults. I am familiar with all of the youth outreach and I even remember having the triangle speakers come speak to me as a child. And it's just mm. super powerful just to hear um, all of the work that you're doing to, for the LGBTQ plus community. And I'm just you know, grateful to have you guys in town and thank you. Thank you. And I, I want to make sure I give a big shout out to the Santa Cruz Pride Committee, which is a fiscally sponsored project of the Diversity Center. So they really function independently. And I just want to make sure that as we're talking about Pride, you know that um, there is a whole group of amazing volunteers who are, are doing a lot of big lifting in our community. And I want to make sure I give them a big shout out. Great. Uh, Council Member Watkins. I too just want to thank you, Sharon, for your presentation, but also just for your work that you're able to do right now in this time and how you're able to pivot as an organization to really find ways to support individuals um, of all ages, but also sort of the online platforms and the opportunities for students or children who aren't feeling safe and having that community, even if it's a virtual community, is so powerful. Um, so thank you for the presentation. I look forward to participating over the weekend virtually. Um, and thank you for all the hard work you're doing, as well as keeping track of the stats and the data so that we can also know how to best support the LGBTQ plus community. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I would just echo my colleagues' comments and uh, and just add, you know, I'm I'm always amazed by uh, how much work you all do and the enthusiasm that you bring to it, even with limited resources. And I know that's true in all times. And so I I do want to um, say that. You know, I, I really want to be supportive in whatever way I can personally. So for people out there, if you're listening, um, obviously monetary contributions will be very important in this time. Um, but also if there are ways that we can support you uh, non-monetarily with our time and other, you know, other opportunities, just please do uh, stay in touch and let us know. And if you have anything now that you want to share, feel free. But otherwise, just stay in touch, please. Thank you. Council Member Gold, I saw your hand went back up. Um, that was a mistake. I was trying to put it down. Oh, okay. Uh, Council Member Byers. Hi. I've never met you, Sharon. I'm Catherine Byers, but maybe maybe I will soon. Uh, my question, it, I saw that one line, 40% po uh, people are in the poverty level. How about homeless? Are there any count? Do you have on, uh, I'm on the board of the Housing Matters, so I'm mm -hmm. really involved in homeless. So the, the local point in time homeless survey, I believe it's called, yes. mm -hmm. um, yes. mm -hmm. that, that recent count, they found that 33% of respondents uh, responded they were LGBTQ+. Oh, I didn't see that. However, the 40% number comes from the Williams Institute out of UCLA. Right, so I think yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard to get the maybe exact number because we don't talk to everybody, but we know that um, we are far over overrepresented um, than the number of folks in the community. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Great. Um, well, seeing no further questions from council members, Sharon, I just want to thank you again for reaching out and uh, for taking the time to give that presentation today. So we better understand the work that you all are doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. All right. Um, that moves us to uh, the next item on our agenda, uh, which is mayoral proclamation declaring June as LGBTQ month in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and kind of just following up on you know, the amazing work that organizations like the Diversity Center does in Santa Cruz. Uh, I wanted to take an opportunity to acknowledge um, how much we, we, we are, you know, uh, 
supporting uh, members of our LGBTQ community. And so I thought I would read a few um, lines of the proclamation. So whereas on June 28, 1969, at the Stonewall Inn in New York City, a courageous group of citizens resisted discriminatory harassment and mistreatment, setting in motion a chain of events that will become known as the Stonewall Uprising and the birth of the modern gay and lesbian civil rights movement. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz continues to create an inclusive community that welcomes and embraces all people regardless of their race, gender, religion, culture, or sexual orientation, and encourages them to fight for the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <clears throat> and whereas the rainbow pride flag first used in 1978 and the transgender flag first used in 2000 symbolize the solidarity with the LGBTQ plus movements around the world, were both flown for the first time outside of Santa Cruz City Hall in June of 2019. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz honors and celebrates all the hard work that the LGBTQ plus elders have done to create a community that embraces people who identify as LGBTQ. And whereas LGBTQ plus students and their allies from the University of California, Santa Cruz, have worked to support the efforts of the LGBTQ plus community of Santa Cruz for, for decades. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz continues to participate in and support events and organizations that support members of our, our community that identify as LGBTQ plus, such as the Diversity Center and the Pride March. And whereas this year in honor of Pride Month, Santa Cruz police officers have been authorized to wear rainbow patches to support the LGBTQ plus community and members of their department and are raising funds to support local LGBTQ plus organizations and charities. And whereas this year marks the first annual graduation ceremony for LGBTQ plus high school, junior high and middle school students on June 3rd, 2020. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim June 3rd, 2020 as LGBTQ plus high school, junior high, and middle school graduation day, and June 2020 as LGBTQ Pride Month in the city of Santa Cruz, and encourage all of our residents to embrace, respect, and support the rights and culture of all individuals who identify as LGBTQ, congratulate the LGBTQ plus students who will be graduating this year on all their achievements, and join members of the LGBTQ plus community in their fight for equal rights in our city, state, nation, and beyond. And with that, if there's any council members who would also like to speak to this item, um, I'd like to provide folks with an opportunity. And so um, I'll start with council member Brown. I, yeah, I just wanted to say congratulations to the LGBTQ plus uh, graduates and the class of 2020. Uh, your courage, your determination, and your resilience in uh, these exceptionally challenging times should be an inspiration to all of us. Uh, we see you and we applaud you on your day and I look forward to seeing you at your graduation on June 3rd. Uh, Council Member Watkins. I too just wanna to congratulate the LGBTQ plus community and the students and class of 2020. You know, now is a time where, you know, you're having an opportunity to really understand yourself to understand what it is that you want to do and and you have already took that step. And so I just applaud you for your hard work and wish you the best of luck and also just encourage you to stay connected to those that see you and support you and wanna see you thrive. So best of luck to the class of 2020 LGBTQ+. All right, Councilmember Matthews. Oh, you're muted. Just adding my congratulations. This is a graduation that will go down in the history books, but you should know at this time, you are surrounded by community, friends, and family who wish only the best for your future. So congratulations. <laughs> and Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, my wife and I just want to uh, wish the graduates all the best, and um, especially right now, let them know that um, you know they need to be thinking about their future. And um, certainly, our community has a lot of work to do 
Um, it's unfortunate that we continue to have some of our rights and other things, the focus of of, uh, you know, rescinding things that are really important to everyone, like marrying the person you love, um, keeping your children, having a safe place to live, um, and, uh, you know, being able to work at a job that you love. So um, I know that the future rests with all of you, and, uh, you know, we all, uh, we all progress by working together and uh, fighting, fighting for the things that we believe in. So we're lucky to live in a place like Santa Cruz. Um, I know you'll be extraordinary people moving into the world, and uh, just know that uh, uh, you have a community that supports you here, and congratulations to the class of 2020. I too want to um, extend congratulations on behalf of myself and fellow teachers that have watched you grow up and um, mature over the years and you're graduating in the most non-traditional circumstance I can think of, but I know moving forward you guys are going to really change the world for a better place and I'm really proud of all of you and, all, and um, wish you all the best of luck. All right, Council Member Byers. Uh, thank you. Um, a year ago, I was invited to Gardner, Montana to give a high school commencement address. Um, there were only 18 in the class. How delightful was that? But I, I just want to mention that because my theme was um, uh, fall forward, fall forward. Uh, like Reggie Jackson struck out like 2,600 times, but nobody remembers that. They only know how many home runs he made. And Thomas Edison failed in a thousand experiments, but a thousand and one invited the light bulb. So, of course, the point is to all your students is there will be those little bumps in the road, there will be those little fa failures, but just tell them to fall forward, fall forward. Congratulations to them. Thank you all for those wonderful words. And again, to reiterate, uh, for the class of 2020, um, you know, your work has just begun. Congratulations on all of your achievements. Um, as we continue to move forward, we're going to need to work together to think about how we can innovate and learn from the impacts that we've been uh, facing with COVID-19. Uh, but we also need to figure out ways that we can continue to support each other. And just know that uh, there's a lot of people who have been fighting for a long time to pave the way for um, you to have your rights and for people to, um, for there to be acceptance within our community of people who identify as LGBTQ, people who um, maybe people of color. And so just know that uh, we're here to help you and as you now take on, take on the torch of, of moving these rights forward. So thank you all for all of your hard work and achievements and we look forward to working with you all moving forward. Um, with that, I'd also like to um, and by congratulating all the nominees for the 23rd Annual Queer Youth Leadership Awards and honoring and celebrating uh, queer youth and ally leaders. And finally, uh, just to reiterate that, uh, as it was mentioned earlier, Santa Cruz Pride is still happening and will be in a virtual form. And for more information, uh, you can visit the santacruzpride.org website to find out a list of when all the uh, various events are going to be occurring. Great. And so with that, um, we will continue on to our, the next item on our agenda, um, which is well, that. Um, before we move on, I actually have a few announcements to make, um, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will be providing these instructions throughout the meeting. Whenever we move on to an agenda item, they will be opened up for public comment. Please note public comment is heard only on items on the council's agenda that we are taking action on and not on regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers five through 26, with the exception of item 21 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Okay. Uh, seeing none, I'd like to ask the clerk to announce any additions or deletions. There are none. Okay. Oral 
communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda, and oral communications will occur on or around 6 p.m. today. I'd like to ask the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Good afternoon, Mayor Cummings and members of the city council. Um, the council met this morning in closed session at 11 a.m. by a Zoom conference to consider the following matters. Uh, item A was liability claims. The claimant was CSAA Insurance Group. Uh, that item is also listed on your consent agenda this afternoon as item nine. Item B was a conference with labor negotiators in which the council received a report from its negotiators involving all bargaining groups as listed on your agenda. Item C was existing litigation in which the council received a report from and gave direction to its legal counsel in the matters of Jane Doe versus the city of Santa Cruz and Herman and Jenkins versus the city of Santa Cruz. And both of those matters are currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Item D was significant exposure to litigation, which the council received a report from the city attorney's office in regard to the claim of Gabriella Joseph, alleging that the city's system of at-large elections results in racially polarized voting in violation of the California Voting Rights Act. Now, during the closed session, the city council approved entering into a settlement agreement with Ms. Joseph, whereby the council agreed to consider adoption of a resolution of intention to begin the transition to district elections, commencing with the regular election of 2022. Uh, that resolution of intention is also listed as item five on your consent calendar this afternoon. Uh, as part of the settlement, the council also agreed to pay the sum of $30,000 to plaintiffs legal counsel to compensate for legal fees and costs. Uh, the settlement agreement is a matter of public record and once it has been executed and delivered to all parties will be available on request by members of the public. And uh, there was no other reportable action in today's closed session and that concludes my report. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to call on the city manager to report and provide updates on city's business COVID-19 response and events. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I wanted to just provide a really brief update on the COVID-19 shelter-in-place order. I uh, did email you a copy of the presentation, so if you want to reference it, uh, you can do that. And I'm going to share my screen here, see if I can make this work. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. Thanks very much. So. Uh, first of all, I want to just start off by saying that uh, uh, the changes are occurring really quickly here. Uh, from the time that I prepared the presentation, there have been a couple of changes from yesterday and even from this morning. So things uh, really change very rapidly between what ha what's happening at the state level and, and the county level. So we had anticipated that the uh, health officer was going to issue a new health order today, uh, which she did actually uh, this morning. Uh, and which is effective at uh, 11.59 p.m., so essentially by tomorrow. And so the main uh, change there is that that order brings the county more closely uh, aligned with the state shelter in place order, which has been a little ahead on the reopening, the governor's reopening plan than, than the county's. Uh, I should note though that the beach restrictions uh, that we currently have will remain, so those are not changing. Uh, the state is in what they call the early stage two, where curbside uh, for retail is allowed, uh, curbside and delivery only, uh, related to logistics and manufacturing, office workplaces, limited personal services, outdoor museums, child care, and other essential services can open with modifications. That's where the overall state is. We have not been there, but that is where we were moving. So to give you a bit of a sense of where uh, that will be beginning tomorrow. So in the order will, again, align us with the state and allow, with modifications, uh, and these modifications involve uh, putting in place measures to prevent the spread of the disease, like facial coverings and social distancing, cleaning, a number of, of different uh, uh, criteria. And then all of this is available on the state and uh, county websites. But major changes are that uh, curbside retail will be allowed, uh, 
which was not you know, previously manufacturing, will be allowed. Child care for, for those outside of the essential workforce thus far had been limited to essential workforce uh, uh, children. Now it'll be open to those other areas that have been opened. Uh, Office-based businesses will also be open now, although teleworking still remains uh, strongly encouraged. And then selective services like car washes, pet grooming, and landscape gardening will now be allowed. Also, outdoor museums, including uh, open gallery spaces and other public spaces and modifications will be allowed to open. An example locally is uh, the Mystery Spot, for example. Uh, and then uh, one of the most recent changes uh, that just happened over the weekend involves uh, political gatherings and churches uh, based on the governor's uh, recent changes. And the, those were originally in a later uh, part of stage two, but now are, or, or even later stages, but now are in early stage two. And, and the state goes by, um, there's stage two, early stage two and expanded stage two, which I'll go over next, and then a stage three happens later, and then four is, is when we're completely out. So the next stage is called uh, expanded stage two. And a number of counties uh, in the state of California are already there. And to get to stage two, you have to uh, go through the state of California and uh, you have to meet a certain criteria set forth by the state of the Department of Public Health. And there's county guidance on that. And the county has to, essentially uh, the county board of supervisors has to decide to pursue that and they have to notify the, the California Department of Public Health and then they have to submit and get an authorization and approval to be able to do that. Uh, and that is the process that our health department is going through now. And what they expect to do is call the expanded stage two at the station is that on June 2nd, which is the next uh, uh, or, or subsequent uh, county board of supervisors meeting that on June 2nd, the health department and does intend to take uh, the ask the station variance package to the board of supervisors for approval. And so once that is uh, 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 posted on the state's website, so they get approval, they go through the state, the state approves it, it's posted on the state's website, then the county would be permitted to move all, all the way to the end of stage two, which is the expanded stage two at the station. And so that uh, is uh, expected to uh, begin June 2nd, although the implementation probably will be some days after that, perhaps uh, June 8th or 9th, something to, to that effect. And we'll know more about that once uh, they go through the process. But the major milestone here is June 2 when it goes to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, here again, as I understand, the current beach restrictions are also expected to remain even after this uh, expanded stage to access station process. So uh, these, uh, what does the expanded stage two uh, mean? Um, so these counties will be able to open up some additional sectors uh, with modifications. Generally, they include destination retail, uh, like retail stores, including shopping malls and swap meets, dining restaurants, and other amenities like bars or gaming areas are, are not permitted on, in, in stage two, but dining restaurants with modifications and schools with modifications. Um, and, and so that is where we will be in the coming uh, weeks. Um, by way, and then we'll see uh, where we then move on to stage three, which uh, the the uh, the other actually the other major change that the board supervisor will be making is that the uh, health order now that the health officer has issued will just continue to follow the governor's or the state uh, shelter in place order, so it'll be consistent with that, so that uh, they essentially mirror essentially mirror uh, except for uh, specific areas that the health officer calls out, like for example the beaches. Uh, is one example. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight some of the things that are uh, not permitted just for, for reference. Uh, and I can have to move some, some that were here over, uh, but those include things like um, uh, personal services such as hair and nail salons, tattoo parlors, gyms and fitness studios, hospitality services such as bars, wineries, Kingston rooms and lounges, entertainment venues like movie theaters, gaming, gambling, arcade venues, pro sports, indoor museums, gallery spaces and zoos, community centers, public pools, playgrounds and picnic areas, nightclubs, concert venues, live audiences, festivals, theme parks, hotels and lodging for leisure and tourism, uh, hotels, lodging for leisure and tourism for non-essential travel uh, uh, as well, or oh, specifically for non-essential travel and then higher education. So these are areas that are not permitted just for, for reference. 
So that is, oh, and then finally I wanted to just kind of brief, give a brief uh, overview of how the weekend went by way of reference. So don't have a lot of data yet, but uh, we did the check-in with the department head team this morning. And the overall sense was that the Memorial Day weekend, that it went well overall. Uh, we didn't have any major incidences. And the beaches were not crowded, uh, particularly when you consider what a, a, com uh, a comparable traditional beautiful Memorial Day weekend would, would be like. Um, and so there was compliance for the most part, although nonetheless, there's still, uh, we did see individuals and groups from out of the area. Um, and also there could have been better compliance with uh, facial coverings and some of the beach restrictions, uh, but by and large, uh, it went fairly well. And uh, then we'll just have to uh, plan for uh, coming uh, 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 holiday weekends when uh, we might expect to have uh, additional uh, folks come to the area and also with uh, the additional uh, openings and, and what impact those might have on uh, people coming uh, to Santa Cruz and also with the improving weather. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have or for any of the departments uh, that uh, uh, they're available to answer questions with respect to the shelter in place order. Thank you, Martine, for that presentation. Are there any council members who have questions at this moment in time? Councilmember Brown. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you for the update. And um, just wondering a couple of things. One, um, where are we at on testing? I know there was an update in one of the county uh, communications about increased testing in the county, but I wasn't, I don't know exactly where we're at now. So, and I haven't read the most recent thing. So if you could just share that, uh, if you know. Sure. And then also uh, with respect to opening the beaches, I totally understand where that, um, it, you know, where the public health officer is at on that. And I think it's great that we've been able to um, kind of maintain some, uh, you know, some safety in that area. But just moving into the summer, has there been any discussion about how that might work. I mean, we're going to still probably be in a shelter in place situation for quite a while. And I'm just wondering if there's any consideration that maybe we would open the beaches during those daytime hours for walking or, you know, non hanging out kinds of situations. And maybe that's to be TPA, but I'm just wondering if that is on the, is in the conversation. Right. All right. I'll start with that first. Uh, Yes, with respect to the beaches, uh, it is sort of a, to be determined uh, and it's evaluated on a day by day, weekend by weekend basis. Uh, I think that with the goal of uh, trying to uh, sort of meet the, the health uh, uh, needs or uh, criteria. And thus far, it seems to be working you know, fairly well. There are modifications, but I think again, as, uh, as time uh, passes, I think there'll be a, a desire and interest in, in relooking at that. For now, it seems to be working well. Um, and which is why I think the health officer is continuing those uh, restrictions even with the expanded uh, uh, openings in the other phases uh, or in, the, in phase two. Uh, but I, again, I think they'll be revisited uh, over time. There's also a, um, a the, the county health officer has put in place a, uh, a committee that's looking at uh, working with businesses on reopening. And I imagine that many of the conversations around that will, will happen in, in that group. Uh, with respect to testing, testing is one of the criteria that has a certain amount of testing has to be met before you can go to the stage two expanded uh, at the station. And so that has been something that they've been working on. Uh, testing has opened and uh, is now more readily available. There's a state sponsored testing site in Watsonville, which is available to any person who wishes to get tested and they'll provide testing whether you have insurance or not. So anyone who actually would like to get tested can go to Watsonville and, or you can go to the website and uh, sign up and, and actually be tested. Additionally, the University of California, Santa Cruz has, uh, uh, are also providing testing and that is starting to open up and providing more testing. So the combination of the state open sites uh, as well as the university's testing has provided sufficient testing to be able to, they believe to be, to move on to ex the expanded stage two. Thanks. I'd also like to um, piggyback on that. Um, in our meeting with the county health officer, it was also mentioned that they're actually encouraging people who are 
not sick or asymptomatic to go get tested as well. It helps us better understand you know, um, what, how many people in our community might potentially can have COVID-19 and are asymptomatic. So that was also encouraged. And if people are sick, they're uh, recommending that they go to their health provider to um, get further recommendations on testing as well. Yeah, and I will add also that uh, by having uh, more demand for testing, they will then also uh, provide for uh, the ability to open up a, a new testing site on in North County too, so make it more convenient for people um, as well. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Thanks for the update, Martine. I just um, just been looking at some of the press coming out today. Um, when we uh, complete the attest, is it a testament? Is that the term? Um, when we complete that process, yeah, at a taste, whatever that is, um, there's been notes in recent press today that barbershops and other things are going to be opening for counties that have achieved that. Will we be opening those up as well once we've gone through the process, or is the county anticipating continuing to keep those activities um, not uh, not allowable for now? My understanding is that those are in stage, would be in like in stage three, and this mm -hmm. would take us to stage two, expand it. Now, the thing that's, uh, you know, really interesting about this is that uh, the governor, sometimes these things can change and they can move from one state stage to the other. Yeah. The, the prime example that just happened yesterday or, or very recently was churches. They were, they weren't on the right. list of expanded stage two, now they are. Uh, so I had to like modify my presentation, you, you know, just a few minutes ago. <laughs> So, uh, you know, it's possible that things could change, but as far as I understand, you know, places like haircut, haircut, haircutting places and salons are not in stage two expanded. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm just seeing some press that comes out, just came out within the last couple hours. So maybe just having, I mean, we, we've been updating our website really well. So um, just for the public that's listening, just a note for folks to realize that these things do can change hourly, basically. Um, I guess just I'll comment on kind of um, the face mask rules and um, probably that is the comment I get the most questions about from the public. Um, and I think especially with regards to the density when you're in our outdoor spaces and really it's places like West Coast Drive where um, you know, you actually do have people coming within contact, you know, within fairly close contact, but it is outside. Um, so I think there's a lot of, a little bit of confusion about the risk associated with an outdoor space where you really can't, you can't keep far apart and maybe you aren't running, but you're walking, but you are walking within close proximity to people. So it doesn't necessarily mean we need to go deep into this, but I think that's a piece of um, personal and community protection that people have um, a lot of opinions about, and I think that's one thing that might be helpful to get more clarification as we move forward on what is that risk level and how are, how are we weighing that, because that's something that, um, that's probably the number one question I get is why aren't people wearing face masks? and Et cetera, et cetera. So it's just that's probably going to be something we just have to figure out how to communicate the best we can about. But that's right. just just for a comment for you. Right. Thank you. Well, uh, and that is actually one of the, probably one of the most uh, uh, items that we get uh, questions about. Uh, I was talking to, to Ralph about that and uh, our communications uh, uh, a person, and uh, because uh, it is it is a bit confusing. But as I understand, the guidance is that. Really, the idea is that if you're going to go anywhere where there's going to be a crowd of individuals, uh, uh, whether it's inside or outside, uh, the distinction isn't necessarily inside or outside. It's if you're going to be somewhere where there are going to be groups of individuals and you're going to be in close contact with them, that you should wear a face mask. You know, so if you're going out on West Cliff Drive and nobody there except you and five other people on, on the whole street, you, know, you may not have to wear it. But if you're going down, down there on a day that's very, very crowded, uh, the recommendation is that you do wear it. Uh, and so the best thing to do is to always carry a mask with you and then use it when you come into contact with groups of individuals, whether you're inside or outside, is, is my understanding of the advice. If 
we could potentially think of a creative and fun way to maybe convey that more broadly in the region, I think that would be helpful. You know, I mean, I think especially after a weekend like this weekend, a lot of people coming into town, if there's a way that we could use our website or use some of these um, uh, PSAs and other outreach we've been doing out to, you know, Sacramento and all the way out to the regions that like to come to Santa Cruz, it might be just a helpful, fun, fun thing to do is to remind people to bring those with them and have them on them at all times. Um, I think that would be a, a good, a good uh, practice for us to promote as a community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Martine. And um, I guess one of the things that I, my understanding about the churches too is that they're only open at a certain capacity, which is I think 25%, which is I think an important element to highlight. And then um, in regards to the modified beach hours, the 11 to five, as we get longer days and folks can find time after 5 p.m., how, how is that going or how is that going to be monitored? Just having witnessed a lot of all of a sudden gatherings right at five on the beaches this weekend, um, I know we kind of block off that one, that one sort of that portion of time in the middle of the day, but I'm just curious what the thoughts are on that. Um, that is, uh, what, there's a two concerns around that. One is that uh, there is the, um, the longer days and also with the uh, nicer weather and uh, summer coming and the July 4th uh, uh, holiday weekends as well, there's a concern around our capacity to be able to enforce that. Uh, that is one of the issues that I think our police and fire and parks departments have a concern around. And so we'll be strategizing with the health officer and, and all the other cities to to look at that, as I noted earlier, we, we are having to evaluate um, uh, the uh, situation um, on a regular basis. And uh, our health officer is very open to receiving feedback and uh, has been very responsive to that feedback and to making uh, uh, adjustments uh, to, to address situations that evolve and change, uh, and to the general public, actually. Uh, so I think, I think as long as uh, we're able to sort of make adjustments that are consistent with, you know, good public health practices that uh, there'll be an openness to, to modify those. And we will have to look at those. I uh, don't know exactly what they would be at this point. There's some discussions that would have to occur. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think all things are really on the table at this point. I guess just the only thing I would add is maybe just some community awareness and education about wanting to maintain social distance and, and still trying to adhere to the the best public health practices if they do go after hours of Right, right. Yeah, and those flow through everything. You mentioned churches. And so all of these openings that are happening, all these modifications, all of these have modifications. They all have physical distancing requirements, cleaning. A, they all come with these restrictions. It's not just open and you can just go back to what you were doing. None of them are really going back to the way it was at this point. All right. Um, seeing no further questions, thank you again, Martine, for the presentation. Thank you. Okay. So I'd, I'd like to call the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. Okay, that moves us on to our next item, which is council memberships in city groups and outside agencies. Um, this is the time for council members to report out on uh, committee meetings that have occurred since our last council meeting, as well as any COVID-19 related community efforts um, from our partner agencies. And so um, I guess we can start with um, council member Brown. Hi, thank you. I was just looking, trying to pull up my notes here. Um, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I have a couple of um, announcements from uh, the meetings that I've been at recently. Uh, first, I think the, most importantly, the Community Action Board has um, now been um, has, has been granted as one of the grantees, uh, one of I think of 11 in California to um, do the, to manage the distribution of the one-time payments for undocumented immigrants. And 
they have had uh, some challenges initially with the phone line. Um, just to give you an idea of the need, uh, they received, uh, when, the, when the phone number went live, they received 30,000 calls in the first hour. And this is not just for Santa Cruz County, but this is Santa, so it's Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Luis Obispo, and San Benito counties. CAB is the um, administrator of the fund, and they have funding for a total of 3,400 uh, payments total in those four counties. 30,000 phone calls, and uh, by all accounts, some some pretty desperate uh, situations that people are describing. Um, so I wanted to let people know that the new number is up. Um, I can, I'll read it out, but you can go to um, Community Action Board and it should be on the front of their page. It's, um, uh, and they're open uh, Monday through Saturday, uh, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. The number is one eight seven seven. 282-7174, and if we, it might be, uh, yeah, so that's the, that's the only number they have, and um, if you get a busy signal or no answer, just keep trying, uh, and, um, you know, let, let people know that that's available, at least for the time being. I was also the Area Agency on Aging uh, Board met and we discussed mostly uh, what the state budget outlook is and the, a little bit though with the federal budget, but the state had been moving, the legislature and the governor had expressed uh, support for moving ahead with some pretty significant expansions to some of the um, senior, you know, programs that ser uh, provide services for uh, seniors in California, and most of that has just kind of been put on hold. Um, there has been uh, there have been a uh, few recommendations to partially or fully cut, um, but there are, there are significant uh, challenges with those programs. But we are sort of, you know, in limbo here, hoping that. Uh, that because the expansion is put on, has been put on hold, um, that we won't be seeing a, a massive cut uh, to those programs, and um, so, so that's kind of the, the all is uh, still up in the air, but things don't look horribly bad right at the moment uh, for those programs. And I also will report on the Regional Transportation Commission. We're just continuing to move along with. Um, the you know alternative analysis. We're going to be voting on uh, preferred uh, alternative options for the use of the rail line at our June meeting, and uh, I will report back then on what happens. And I think that's all. There may be more, but I think that's all for now. Yeah. Great. Thanks, um, Councilmember Golden. Um, thank you, Sandy, for that update. And I don't have any committees that I was able to meet with this time, but I was super excited to hear about what the work with the Community Action Board was doing. So that's fantastic. Thank you. But I do want to just extend warm wishes to the Muslims around Santa Cruz and around the world as they celebrated the end of the holy month of Ramadan this weekend. And the breaking of the fast must have been really difficult without being able to gather as families. In addition, Memorial Day was yesterday, and I want to, you know, honor the fallen soldiers and both are. Uh, typically, you know, circumstances where people gather. And so just having the social distancing guidelines, um, I'm sure it was di difficult for people celebrating both of those um, holidays this weekend. And I just hope that people took time to reflect and just spend time um, with a moment of gratitude and just quiet reflection since they couldn't get, gather in groups. That's all. Great. Thank you. Um, Martin, I saw you had your hand up. Uh, yes, I just wanted to provide a quick update on a couple of uh, uh, JPAs that I sit on, the uh, the library board and the uh, uh, 911 center board, uh, who have, whose meetings have been really dominated by the same issues, which is uh, responding to the fiscal uh, 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 constraints and uh, situation as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic. and. Uh, so both the agencies are currently uh, reviewing their proposed budgets to uh, look at the impacts of uh, the budget uh, uh, revenue declines. Both the, in particular, the library system relies on direct uh, sales, uh, countywide sales tax revenues, um, and as well as property tax revenues from the cities. 
um, and uh, the uh, 911 center uh, is, is, they don't get a direct uh, uh, funding, but they're impacted by the ability of their respective agencies to, to pay. Uh, but the, both agencies are looking at ways comparable to what all the other cities are doing, which is to look at uh, uh, temporary measures to reduce costs in order to, to get through this difficult uh, difficult time. So I just want to let you know that the, both agencies are, are working on those issues that are essentially consistent with uh, what the, we're doing and what other uh, jurisdictions are doing in the county. That's all I have. Great, thanks. Uh, Councilmember Watkins. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. I um, I guess I would just, I don't have too much to report on. I um, was looking also over the different assignments. One is the uh, Cannabis Subcommittee, as you know, on our agenda is going to be postponed into uh, our first meeting in June. Um, I, I will say the farmer's market for those who are watching to uh, continue to monitor what you can, what, when you can access the farmer's market. They have modified hours, but on their website they have information about uh, the services that they're providing still. Um, and then just in regards to education, I think there's still a lot up in the air in terms of how that's going to look in the school year in the fall, uh, as well as child care needs. So the, the County Office of Education is uh, has a, a dedicated web page to support those that are seeking more information about um, education and what is happening and changing really quickly. Um, and then I guess I would just say the help, one sort of, uh, sort of, I guess, not a subcommittee kind of update, but just in general update, uh, the health and all policies uh, work has been um, highlighted on a webinar today, which was great. And it was uh, showing how Santa Cruz is really ahead of the game, thinking about how uh, we're integrating the pillars of health and all policies in our in our efforts here now and potentially moving forward. And then, um, last but not least, I just want to give a reminder that the census is up and running. They're really working hard to increase folks uh, who haven't yet yet completed the census, and there will be certain areas that they'll target. Uh, certain populations to increase access and increase uh, people responding to the census. And I do believe that there will be some chalk art, like put like your chalk art census 2020, and I'll let you know and let the council know if and when that happens so that we can uh, raise awareness about the importance of filling out our census here. Great, thanks. Uh, council Member Byers. No, I didn't have anything. Okay, great. Uh, Council Member Matthews. A few things. The Measure U Implementation Working Group has um, is in the process of adding a few students to its community advisory group, um, although the uh, work of that group is um, in a bit of a limbo now um, because of the, um, the progress on the LRDP uh, and also um, reach, uh, unclear how many students are going to be on campus and reaching out to them, uh, well, how that's going to work. Uh, Metro, uh, as I reported last time, dealing with deep, deep, deep um, service cuts in order to try and um, they do have reserves, but they don't want to eat them all up, so they're trying to maintain basic services, um, but some real changes and also protect drivers. Uh, they are continuing to move forward with mobile ticketing um, system that uh, at some point in the future um, we'll hope to go system-wide and there'll be a big um, uh, improvement. The um, Downtown Management Corporation, we have the re renewal of their assessment district on our agenda later today, but I have been working with them also on the uh, outreach for the EBID, the property-based improvement district, which uh, has been in the process of combining DMC and DPA. Obviously, the COVID, the emergence of COVID, and all the uncertainties around our property owners and businesses has been a um, profound um, uh, disruption in that process. And so we'll see. We're still proceeding. We'll see how it uh, plays out in the next uh, couple of months. And finally, visit Santa Cruz also. Um, the visitor industry, local, state, national has been clobbered. We all know that. And um, 
Uh, I've been very impressed how the local visit Santa Cruz has been coordinating with the news coming from the state, trying to be um, both wanting to get back to business, but completely wanting to be safe. <laughs> and um, obviously there's been a good working relationship. Um, Bonnie has been um, organizing outreach specifically for our local uh, lodging properties. It's part of the effort that um, the Community Foundation um, put into gear with involving sector, different economic sectors, what do you need to adjust to the regulations, to the, to the um, uh, safety orders, uh, what are your concerns, how can we safely get back up? And so uh, there is outreach going on and um, economic development is specifically reaching out to our local uh, lodging places to engage them and find out um, how we can be of assistance to them, uh, keeping safety foremost in mind. But I think they've been good on the messages. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Apologies for disappearing there. My uh, my internet went out for a second there. I got dropped. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'll report on a number of items. Um, some have already been covered by Councilmember Matthews. I guess um, just real quickly on the Metro, um, I think it's important to also um, state that the Metro has uh, really taken it upon itself really early in the COVID-19 uh, situation to adopt um, national safety standards with regards to um, sanitizing the buses um, every day, um, in some cases multiple times of day. So um, that is a big focus of their uh, work right now is not only um, for, for uh, is to try to maintain the buses in, um, you know, the highest quality uh, to, uh, quality so that people feel safe while they're on their bus, but also to provide safety to our drivers as well. So that is a big, and they do have quite a number of um, videos, et cetera, on their website for people to understand um, how how they're they're actually sanitizing the buses to keep them as clean as possible. Um, so the other uh, update is. Um, the CALS Working Group is meeting actually this week. Um, there is a big announcement that will be coming out. Um, several of you heard that uh, through email, so I don't want to really uh, ruin, the, uh, ruin the surprise, but um, the work of the group um, has been successful and uh, we are going to be looking at some uh, uh, outreach uh, and press on uh, the findings of the latest Heal the Bay report. And uh, that will be coming out towards the end, I, I believe towards the end of June. So we have some good news to report to our community about that uh, and the work there at Cal's Beach over the last several years with the Cal's Working Group Partnership. Uh, the 2 by 2 committee, uh, which is the 2 by 2 homeless committee, which the mayor and I sit on, along with Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor McPherson, uh, we've actually been having weekly calls with um, the county and the city staff involved with our homeless uh, response system. We have been working primarily over the last two and a half months, three months now, on really understanding the um, the needs through the COVID-19 lens, but um, last week we um, we started to pivot away and also get back to the work that the county was uh, conducting with focus strategies and with the hope that we can um, begin to talk about the longer term homeless response, homeless programming that we need to put in place for the county. Uh, so we've been sort of making that pivot now and uh, just want to recognize the uh, county's commitment to starting to transition into the broader um, consideration of where our homeless uh, programs will be going in the next in the next year. Uh, and my other committees. Uh, lastly, we did have a downtown library subcommittee meeting as well uh, this month. Uh, we had good attendance at our. Um, uh, discussion and presentation by group four, which is the architecture and um, sub-consulting groups that had um, prepared plans for uh, the potential for uh, mixed use uh, alternative as well for the library. 
Uh, it was well attended, um, and um, we've received a number of public comments about that. We're planning our work uh, in, over the next uh, period to bring uh, something back to the council at some point. So uh, I think I'll end it there. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. I think that most of the committees that I was on that met have been mentioned already, and I guess I'll just highlight um, with the uh, library, one of the things that we're also working on right now is an evaluation form um, so that we have some pretty clear criteria for how our decisions are going to be made on that item. Um, in addition, with the two by two, um, as Vice Mayor Meyer said, uh, last week we were able to start having more conversations about long term planning around homelessness. And one thing that we did receive as well was. Um, some information on how the previous $10 million has been spent and kind of where that's at. And uh, we actually mentioned that it might be good to put something together that could go out to the public so the public can see how that funding, how that funding is being spent. And so we're hoping that um, something will be available that we can share out that shows where the money from uh, that $10 million uh, that we initially, the county got for homelessness, where that's going. Um, LAFCO met and uh, we approved a draft budget and in addition to that, uh, Roger Anderson and John Hunt were both reappointed uh, by the LACO committee to serve, continue serving on LACO. Um, I think that's about all I've got. Um, with regards to the cannabis subcommittee, I just also would like to mention that um, in addition to us meeting, we were also able to meet with some of the folks from the industry to hear their concerns and incorporate that into our decision-making process. So I um, just thought that we would share that as well. And that is uh, all I have at this time. And so Councilmember Matthews, see you have your hand raised. Question on the homeless two by two, I see Ron Prince is shown as the uh, staff. Is he still doing that or is that Brooks now taking that role? Yeah. Brooke? Yeah. 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 We'll have to change that. Yeah. All right. Well, that will conclude um, our council member updates. Next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, these are items 5 through 20 on our agenda today. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 5 through 20. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device. Press star 9 to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying that you've been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by council member for further discussion. Are there any council members that would like to pull an item from consent? If so, please raise your hand. Council member Matthews. No, sorry, that was put me down. Okay, Vice Mayor Myers. Um, I just have a question on uh, item number 16 and a, and a question on item 15, but I don't need to pull it. Thank you. Can you repeat those? Sorry. Oh, you're muted, by the way. <laughs> uh, item number 15, Highway 1 and 9, just a question, though, and item number 16, um, Water Street bike lane, just a question as well. Okay. Council Member Byers. I think it's, um, what's the number? Five. And the vote, uh, our resolution regarding the voting act. Okay. okay. And uh, is, uh, is 14 pulled? No. 15. Is 15 pulled? Uh, no, not currently. Okay, um, one and 15. Okay, so you'd like to pull items numbers one and 15? Perfect. Right. Five and 15. Five and, yeah. yeah, sorry, five and 15. Okay. Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, so I was gonna ask for a five and 15 as well, but I do have a question on 12, uh, item 12. And um, I also have questions on 12, 15, 5, and then I'm going to add questions for item number 8. Okay, 
are there any uh, other council members who have questions on items or would like to pull any items? Okay, hearing none. Um, if there are any members of the public who would like to speak on items on our consent agenda with the exception of items numbers 15 and five. Actually, before I open this up to the public, maybe if um, we could have the questions on item number 16 by Vice Mayor Myers, followed by questions on items numbers 12 by Council Member Brown. And I'm not sure who had questions on item number eight, but we can also ask on that, on that item as well. Oh, that was me. <laughs> so let's start with uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank uh, thank Public Works for the work on the Water Street bike lane enhancements. Um, I've, I've, I have talked to a number of residents up that way who um, are uh, excited about the changes. Um, there was one question, somebody, I can't remember if I received an email or exactly how the question came in, but um, just re with regards to sort of the street cleaning machines, are they able to, to navigate into that new set of bollards and other sort of, you know, the separation? Are there any issues with that? Um, that was the question that came to me. I was just curious if you could co uh, comment on that. Uh, Mayor, Council Members, Chris Schneider. Assistant Director of Public Works. Uh, so we work closely with um, refuse, uh, street sweeping, metro, et cetera, on the design of the project. Uh, we heard there might be one area that's a little tougher than was anticipated, so we'll be working uh, with uh, street sweeping again to see what the issue might be. Great, thank you. And yeah, uh, again, just the, the, it's really nice to see us you know, investing in really that that really um, higher level of safety for for bicyclists, uh, especially on that busy road. So thanks for thanks for the department's work. Appreciate it. Welcome, Councilmember Matthews. Since it was pulled for comment, I can't resist saying that's a spectacular improvement, and it was really wonderful to see that you were able to go even farther than anticipated because of cost efficiencies. That was. A, a bonus for that. Okay. Um, Council Member Brown, you had a question, item number 12. Uh, yeah, thank you. I um, so we I did get some information that answered uh, most of my questions on this one, and I do understand that there is some flexibility in terms of you know how this is. The early this is the early retirement incentive program for people who are listening. Um, for watching. Uh, so I think most of my questions were answered, but I am wondering, uh, because the the timeline, it's a very tight turnaround, and that's a big decision that people are making um, about whether if they weren't anticipating retiring um, right at this moment. And so I'm just wondering what if that, if there's flexibility in that timeline, I know that um, we need to get those decisions made as quickly as possible, but um, so, you know, what, what's your thinking on that piece of it? This is Lisa Murphy, Human Resources Director of City of Santa Cruz. Um, I think that if we could be fl more flexible on the timeline, but because we are trying to get these uh, the savings into this current budget, that is why we're trying to uh, make this process move as quickly as possible. Uh, I, I certainly could, if it was a council's desire, extend it maybe another week, but any longer than that, then we we start to eat into any potential savings for our, our budget. Uh, can I add also that the, it does also provide some flexibility there that the that I could the city manager could you know, provide exemptions if it needed. I think it's I think it's included in there as well. Uh, and then also this is just when they need to let us know they don't have to complete the, the retirement process by that time, time frame. It's just for them to apply. Governor Matthews. No. Okay. Um, are there any other questions or comments from council members at this, at this point in time? I thought I'd put my hand up. Oh. I think I was trying to click off something, but yeah, go ahead, Catherine. Oh, thank you. Um, Lisa, you, um, there was a question earlier today. You mentioned you might have some data available. 
that what happened was it 2009 or 10 or the last time we did this? Yes, I did. Uh, Councilman Fires. In 2009, there were three people who took advantage of the program. And then later in 2011, uh, under different circumstances with the library, there were 12 folks that did it in lieu of a layoff. Um, so it, it wasn't a large number because, again, if you remember, there must be an associated savings by freezing the position or a like position right. for at least one year in order to achieve the savings. So. Uh, I, I anticipate it would be a somewhat limited number of individuals that will be able to take advantage of this program. Thank you. Okay. There are no other questions or comments. Mayor Cummings, was item H pulled or were you going to make a comment on it? Oh, I'm going to hold off on, on um, number eight. Actually, so I was just going to move on to um, uh, to see if there were comments from the public on the other items. Okay. Councilmember Watkins. Mayor, for the item number eight, were you did you have questions or did you just want to? I was going to make sure that it was highlighted no, no matter what. Is that your uh, intention? Yeah, yeah, that was the intention. Okay, no problem. I'll go ahead and let let you do that then. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I'll do. We'll get the public to weigh in on the items that have not been pulled. And then uh, before we make the vote, I'll just make a comment on item number eight. So if there are members of the public who would like to speak um, to any of the items on consent, with the exception of items numbers five and 15, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will have up to two minutes. And again, these are items on our consent agenda with the exception of items number five and 15. Okay, we first caller, you have a few minutes. Yeah. Yes, uh, this is on item eight. If you read my most excellent letter, you would know then it is not appropriate to display the rainbow or trans flags in the council chambers. It would be promoting the full agenda of a tiny special interest group above all others. While you say it acknowledges their contributions, neither flag represents the totality of union that the American people uh, have in the national U.S. state or city flags. Flags represent ideas and beliefs, and we do not pledge allegiance to these proposed flags. Perpetuating this unique special honor, yet bestowed, bestowed on no other flag beyond your terms year after year, is inappropriate hubris. Opinion changes, leaders change, and future leaders should be deciding the manners of recognition after perhaps you are no longer there. The meaning of those flags is not as clear as you say. There are numerous beliefs of these communities which have not gained the full acceptance of the court of public opinion, and indeed not unanimous acceptance even in those communities themselves, which have no official spokespersons, although many pretend they do and speak loudly. I would cite beliefs like continuous encouragement of children with gender dysphoria to promote, maintain, and encourage such feelings, or even adults injecting such children with puberty-blocking drugs up to and beyond the age of puberty where most would normally revert to identify with their biological gender. These are vehemently questioned by many as agents of child abuse. Other beliefs, such as gender being a choice, or that there exist many dozens of multiple genders of choice, or that children as young as eight years old should be taught in school that questioning their gender is appropriate, also have many strong opponents of those beliefs. These flags are also representative of those disputed beliefs. None of those beliefs have been validated as approved or acceptable in the big court of public opinion, and so then what we are supposed to be honoring with such flags lacks sufficient clarity and full acceptance. This is more of a leftist social justice warrior agenda than actually installing a symbol deserving of such true unity, honoring, uh, uh, for instance, of, well, we should be honoring, for instance, national sacrifice or beliefs so that the American state or even national MIA flags possess. Time is up. Bye. All right, next speaker. Um, hello, this is Dana Bagshaw. I wanted to speak on item number 15, so I'm not sure how to. Okay, we'll just put you back in the queue then, um, and we'll have you uh, lower your hand for now, and when that item comes up on the agenda, we'll have you raise your hand again. Um, I'm just calling in from a phone. I don't know how to lower and raise my hand. I just hit a star nine. I can, I can lower your hand for you, but yes, okay. you just press star nine. All right, thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, next member of the public, you're on the line. If your phone number ends in 4678, you are now um, on the line and you have two minutes. I'm on number eight. I hear other people commenting. Uh, you, if you're watching this on your, on your TV, there's a bit of a delay. So now's your opportunity to speak. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is Brett Garrett, and I just want to thank you very much for displaying the rainbow flag. Um, as a gay person myself, it is very meaningful to me, and I think of when I was younger and just how important it is for people to for members of the LGBT community to see support from City Hall. So thank you very much. All right, thank you. Okay, if there's any other member of the public who would like to speak to us on our consent agenda items with the exception of items numbers five and 15, um, now is the time before we go back into, um, before we take our vote. So. Please call in if you're watching and press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Okay, you're on the line. Yes, hello, City Council. Um, I just got on to this meeting. I'm glad to be here. I didn't think I was gonna have anything to say on this subject, but I'm gonna say it anyway. So, you know, it seems like what's going down the pike is that human beings are gonna be altered. We're, the children are being taught all kinds of things in school, but this RNA force vaccine that will be a force vaccine is going to um, change the human being into a humanoid. So, I'll be speaking of that later, but um, I just appreciate finally being able to listen to you guys. Thank you very much, that's it. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'll bring it back to council. And I just wanted to make a comment on item number eight, which was displaying the LGBTQ pride flag and transgender pride flag at City Hall. Um, last year, um, Vice Mayor Myers, um, at the time Mayor Watkins and myself brought this item forward and we brought it back on our agenda because we just realized that rather than having to vote on this every year, we thought that um, it would be you know, good if we could just um, ins to ensure that we are honoring uh, and respecting the members of the LGBTQ community who are living in our city and all the people who are helping them fight for their rights that we would um, have on our agenda that we would fly these flags every year outside of City Hall to honor those members of our community and all the struggles that they've faced over, the, over generations. Uh, in addition to that, we are also interested in whether during the time of the month, during the month of June, moving forward, if we can have those flags flown inside uh, chambers as well. And so that's the item that's before us today. And as we, and we've had a number of items today um, have, that have been honoring our LGBTQ community and um, just want to find ways that we can continue to support those members of our community. So really happy to see this on our consent agenda. I want to thank Council Member Watkins and Vice Mayor Myers for joining me with putting this on our agenda. And um, I look forward to moving this forward and supporting our community during Pride Month. Uh, Council Member Byers, I see your hands raised. Oh, you, you're, you're muted. I was going on to uh, number, start the agenda number five, but you may want to pass the consent agenda first. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Brown. Oh, you're muted. I have to move the cursor. Uh, um, I will go ahead and move the consent agenda with the exception of items five and 15. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Brown, second by Council Member Watkins. Um, and I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll vote. Mayor, Council Member Byers. Aye. 
Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, so we'll move on to the items that have been pulled from our agenda, starting with item number five. And Councilmember Byers, I know you had a question on that. Well, um, I get my question, uh, I know some of you uh, council members have dealt with this over the last many months, and this is kind of the first, uh, uh, the first time, and so I'm glad it's on the public agenda, and I pulled it off the agenda, so in case people want to speak to it. Um, in, given that, there are a couple questions I had. I don't, yeah, Tony's there. Um, the demographer, are we just accepting the demographer of the Santa Barbara law firm, or tell us who the demographer is? No, um, the demographer is, uh, is, a, is a firm that has worked successfully with communities all over California, um, oh. well over 100. And, and this is someone who was identified uh, through our research and through the League of California Cities uh, City Attorneys group that we um, communicate with on a regular basis. And the, um, the company is an outfit called National Demographics Corporation, and they presented the city with a proposal on April 22nd of 2020 uh, to provide the uh, demographic services related to um, really the whole step-by-step -step process from the adoption of the resolution to the, doing the demographic analysis to the public outreach and ultimately uh, considering adopting district boundaries and an ordinance uh, to implement that. So, no, this has not, this, this came from our own research. Okay, good, thank you, I, I did not know that. Um, in terms of um, all the public hearings, that uh, you even say in the staff or, you know, staff report, there's gonna be a considerable amount of staff time and public hearing time. Uh, have, have you designed a timeline, what, what I could look at in terms of, um, is this a year we're talking about over a year or anyway, I guess what I'm looking for some kind of a, something in writing showing the timeline, nothing. Okay. Yes, and um, we have done that. Essentially, I mean, I could, I could just verbally go over it right now because we've communicated to the council um, through uh, privileged communications. But what we envision is that uh, in late 2020 and through mid 2021, we would create an outreach plan with the assistance of city staff and, and the expert demographer. Um, yet sometime in mid-2021, we expect the 2020 census data to be released. And then once that is released, we can analyze that with our expert uh, advice um, and, uh, and craft uh, districting options for the city. And then in early 2022, we would have uh, probably more multiple public hearings and outreach, uh, including website uh, announcements, press releases, uh, public meetings, uh, publication of draft district maps for, for members of the public to view and, and consider and provide input uh, on, and ultimately adoption of an, ador of an ordinance transitioning to district elections. Sometime around um, early to, to mid uh, 2020, or 2022, excuse me. 20, oh, 22, good. Yeah. Does this, these consultants, do they design the uh, district lines or have we thought about a, uh, you know, citizens committee? Um, what they do is they analyze the, the demographic data and then they make recommendations to the city okay. as to options that you would have to um, to, to adopt, you know, population balanced and otherwise um, uh, adopt the various district boundaries. And, and then ultimately um, the manner in which the districts are selected, it, it has, the council has some discretion in that regard, but ultimately it would be a city council decision. Okay, good, those are my questions. I will make the motion if uh, the mayor's ready. Uh, maybe. Uh, we'll 
I'll, I'll let everybody go through questions sure. and then I'll open up for public comment and then we'll bring it back. Motion. Uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the clarification. I think um, Council Member Byers asked the questions I was interested in. Um, and I thank you for the clarification on the demographer because I, um, in looking at it, it just looked like there was a high level of correlation between the um, communities that have uh, received these letters of intent to sue and the demographer kind of coming behind uh, those on the heels of those to um, get that business. So I just wanted to um, say thanks for clarifying that it, this was an uh, independent uh, 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 recommendation idea based upon kind of more extensive uh, conversations. And I think, you know, just while I have the floor, I'll just say really quickly, um, you know, we're, we're, we're just in a place where um, we are kind of being forced to move in this direction. And I, I think there's a lot of interest in the community in participating in this conversation. And so I'm glad we're finally uh, putting this on our open meeting agenda. And I look forward to uh, seeing a, a robust community engagement plan moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Matthews. Thanks. Um, I do want to mention, um, uh, Catherine, in case you haven't seen it, but we did get um, a pretty detailed proposal. It was part of a closed session packet from the demographer. And, oh, you good. Okay. You know, so uh, Tony can provide that to you. Yeah. Um, of what a process might look like with okay. a huge amount of. Uh, outreach and variety built into it. Yeah. And um, I'm, of course, going to support the motion, but I think it could be helpful to the general public. And I, I asked Tony about this, if that in an appropriate form could be made available to the public. Because yeah. it's, it's, it's not secret information, and I think it would be useful to advance the discussion. Great. Thank you. And send yeah. me a copy, Tony. Yeah, thank you, I'm happy to circulate that uh, to yeah. the council, and it's also... And to the uh, to the it, was, it was sent to the council under the cover of an attorney-client privileged communication, but um, the document itself I do not consider to be privileged. Um, I just, just to make sure that my point is, is clear, I'd like to clarify my statement is that ultimately it would be the city council that will decide the manner in which the oh. district boundaries are chosen. Uh, which is not the same thing as selecting the district boundaries. Right. If you saw in your, in your correspondence, there were a number of comments from members of the public who suggested forming a citizen's committee to ultimately select the boundaries, and that's an option that the council could consider. Whether or not that's a good idea um, is, is something that the council will uh, be able to, to hear from the public on and discuss as the process moves forward. Okay, thank you. Council Member Watkins. Thank you, and um, and I appreciate the questions to get more clarity. Uh, Tony, is, did you? I know that there's uh, been work done with Santa Cruz City Schools process and uh, the alignment. Is there? Can you speak to that in terms of what we received as a council in regards to um, this potential uh, resource to help us move forward in a in a neutral way? Um, could you clarify that? I'm not quite, I'm, I'm not quite following that question. So. Well, I guess I, I, I have the, um, since Santa Cruz City Schools just recently went to district elections, uh, it seems to me if, if, if you can share how that could align with how this demographer can help us navigate this forward as well. I believe it was the same consulting firm that assisted the school district with its demographic analysis. Of course, as you know, the boundaries of the school district are not coterminous with those of the city, so the districting would not, uh, I expect, look the same, although there may be similarities. Um, and I have not carefully followed the process that the school district uh, uh, underwent in order to choose its district boundaries. Uh, I was involved, as you know, in the charter amendment that was approved at the March uh, primary election that um, removed provisions from the city charter that specified at-large elections for the Santa Cruz City School District. Oddly, in my opinion, but that is no longer a part of the charter. Maybe it, just one sort of uh, suggestion or thought is uh, as we move forward, we can 
speak to them to understand what their experience had been and learn from them as we move forward as well. Certainly could do that, yes. Vice Mayor Myers. I just have a couple of questions, Tony. The, um, some of the communications we've gotten also speak to um, potentially having an, an, an elected mayor of some, some form. And so during this public process, I assume that along with the district elections, we could take up um, those kinds of ideas as well for discussion in our public meetings as well as be able to debate that with the community. Um, I think that's also something of interest, but I'm not sure that the community understands that the district elections is sort of a separate item um, from the elected, you know, looking at the possibility of an elected mayor. Um, is that correct? Um, yes. But we could run the process at the same time. I think one of the issues that uh, has already come up in communications from members of the public um, and will uh, be part of the discussion is whether or not in transitioning to district elections, the council should also, uh, uh, as part of that process, have an at-large elected mayor with uh, probably an even number of districts uh, in conjunction with that to maintain the odd number on the council. Um, so that's something that can be part of the discussion, yes. Okay, and I just, um, just um, for community, um, you know, uh, disclosure or whatever we want, I, however I want to frame it, but I did attend a number of the um, district uh, presentations and public meetings. Um, and they were, um, I would say, fairly well attended uh, for the school district um, districting process. Um, I thought that the um, presentations were really well done. It was it was a pretty solid process um, for the the events that I went to. So um, it's it's good to see that at least one of those have gone through the community. Obviously, the vote went very well, but. Uh, those were good meetings. I thought they were very well informed and, and uh, worthwhile of, of attending. Thank you. Councilmember Golder. Yeah, uh, I would just echo what Donna said because I went to some of the school board meetings and saw how it was presented, and it was like the demographers presented different, um, you know, ideas, and then there was a. Uh, community input and was a great process. So I think it, talking to them about how they structured it might be a good idea. All right. If there are no further questions from council members, uh, we'll turn it over to members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. Um, if you'd like to comment on this item, um, now is the time to call in if you haven't called in already. Uh, this is item number five on our agenda, a resolution declaring the City of Santa Cruz's intention to transition from an at-large city election process to a district-based election process. If you'd like to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And um, when, uh, when I allow you to speak, you will be given two minutes. So if anybody would like to speak to item number five on our agenda, please press star nine. Please, please call one of the numbers on your screen and press star nine to raise your hand. <clears throat> All right, you're on the line. Hello, Santa Cruz City Council and public. Um, my understanding is in 2018, the population of Santa Cruz was 64,725 and 64,725 persons. So I hope this isn't going to be enacted upon. My understanding is until 2022. So I'm hoping the public has another chance to comment on this because it seems like it's creating more bureaucracy. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's any members of the public, this is your last chance to comment on item number five, a resolution declaring the city of Santa Cruz's intention to transition from an at-large city council election process to a district-based election process. 
please uh, dial the number on your screen and press star nine on your phone once you've entered the room if you'd like to comment on this item. Okay, seeing no further members of the public who wanted to comment on this item, I'd just say that it's, I don't know, it's, it's unfortunate that we're in this position because I think that for many residents of the city, um, there's not so much of a preference to move towards uh, district-based elections. However, um, I hope that as we transition this process, um, that the community weighs in heavily on how we should do this. And as we move into district-based elections, we understand how the impact of this is having on our community as well in terms of who is able to uh, be represented on council. Council Member Byers. And so I have one more question for Tony and then I'm, I will make a motion. Um, to reconcile with our uh, charter, where normally this would be a vote of the people, where are we on solving that dilemma? Do we have to put it to the vote of the people? Um, we don't. And what courts have held uh, in dealing with other charter cities is that the provisions of the state law and particularly the, the California Voting Rights Act, uh, essentially take precedence over conflicting uh, language in a city charter. Uh, if you'll recall, what we did with the school district is they had already adopted by district elections, um, and, and I think they used them in the 2018 uh, election process, uh, but we hadn't repealed the provisions of the charter that specified uh, at large elections until March of this year. So um, I would envision something along the same lines. If the council does ultimately adopt uh, an ordinance implementing district elections, then a proposed charter amendment would come along as a cleanup item uh, after that. Okay, thank you. And Mayor, I'm ready for a motion? If you are, okay. Uh, I'll move the resolution declaring the city of Santa Cruz intention to transition from an at-large city council election process to a district-based election process. See a second. I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, <yeah. laughs> you're muted, Justin. Justin, you're muted. There you go, that's helpful. I saw Councilmember Goldberg's hand went up um, first. So. I was just going to talk, but like everyone's seconding it. I, I <laughs> so, okay, so we have a motion made by Councilmember Byers, seconded by Councilmember Golder. Um, and so I'll turn it over to um, the clerk to call roll if there are no further questions. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, sorry, I just see, and, and I don't, you're managing the participants list, but I just see a hand up in the attendees section, so I'm not sure if there's somebody still trying to speak or if that's just from the past. I just wanna make sure everybody gets to um, public comment if they're they're interested. Why don't we turn it over to this member of the public, thanks for pointing that out, to comment on this before we take it to a vote. Uh, Hi. There we go. Can you hear me now? Hi. Yes. Uh, we'll give you two minutes on this item. I'm sorry about that. I did try to call on the phone. My name is Candace Brown from East Morrissey, and I just wanted to say that if you wanted participation, broader participation from the community in our community government, then especially for the Latina X community, then it would be desirable to have materials in Spanish and also have translators easily available and make it more accessible to that demographic. That would be a genuine step, and it's not necessarily about district elections. Also, district elections can be a variety of things. In Santa Barbara, they have four districts. They have three at large, from which one is selected as mayor. And so there are many different variations on this theme, and I just wanted to mention that as a possibility also. Thank you for that. All right, thank you very much. Okay, 
I'll bring it back to uh, council for a vote on this item. We're taking a vote. Yes. Council members Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? You didn't recognize me. Aye. Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Myers. Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. Unanimously. Um, next item uh, on, that was pulled from our consent agenda is item number 15, the subject of which is the Highway 109 intersection improvements. Um, and so, another couple council members who had a question. I'll start with Council Member Byers. Did, did you say buyers? I, I don't have one now. I'm okay. Um, I know there were other cars. Um, there's a lot of feedback. Yeah, Mayor, somebody's listening to the meeting and there's a delay, so that's going to cause an issue. Chris? Uh, yeah, Mayor, somebody's listening to the meeting and there's a delay, so that's going to cause an issue. All right. Go ahead. I think that's yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I uh, do have some questions on this item. I know that we're pretty far down the road with the intersection uh, uh, changes. Um, and so I, but, and, but things are, you know, the, given the changed landscape at the moment, I just feel like there's, you know, it, there's some questions that I want to make sure we get clear before moving forward. The first is um, last year when this came before the council on another uh, action, we directed that this, uh, this intersection improvement plan go to the Transportation and Public Works Commission uh, for review. And in particular, I was interested in uh, looking at bike safety and potential, uh, you know, recommendations to make that a safer uh, intersection for bicyclists and pedestrians. And so I'm just wondering what happened with that. Um, I, I didn't see that it, it occurred. So that's my first question. And then I have, um, most of my other questions are related to the funding because we are in a uh, you know, pretty changed environment here. So I'm wondering um, kind of how much has been spent so far. I see um, kind of adding up from the resolution and the series of actions that have been taken since 2004. It looks like for the consultant here, about a million dollars, a little bit under uh, prior to uh, this action today. And, but I know we've ha incurred other costs. And so if you just have a ballpark of how much we've, we've spent to make this move forward. And then um, the, the CTC, the, the agenda report suggests that the CTC um, will fund this project um, and it's in, construction is somewhere in the $5 million range. So I'm wondering, um, is that money already like allocated and it's sitting somewhere and just getting approval is what we need to actually receive the funds to make this happen. Um, you know, I just, it's like kind of continuing to go down this road without knowing if we can actually get it done in the near future or kind of move along the timeline that we um, had uh, kind of in anticipated. It's just so I'm just wondering about those kinds of um, changes or potential changes. And then finally, uh, you know, I have some concerns about, you know, how we um, we commit our traffic impact fees. And I know that um, we do have funding through our traffic impact fee fund for this project, but I'm wondering is, are we looking at um, encumbering that, that money for from the future traffic impact fees um, for this project? What does that mean uh, for the potential to get other projects funded uh, through that fund? And finally, um, sorry, it's a long list, but I, I just kind of put them together, so I'm sorry I didn't get these two sooner. Um, the last one is, um, is there is there any potential that the um, city could request Measure D highway project funding to perhaps offset some of that cost that the city will incur that's not coming from other sources? 
and that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Mayor, Council Members, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. So the, the five questions, um, Council Member Brown, that I heard was um, the Public Works, Transportation Public Works Commission. So the project was presented at an open workshop on public works projects and programs. And so it's presented to the public relating to uh, some the design of the project and the bike lanes that were included with the project, as well as pedestrian improvements. Um, and uh, as part of that process over the last years or two now, um, by, green lanes have been added and um, there's a bike lane southbound on Highway 9 and there's a shoulder northbound on Highway 9, which include, uh, which is considered uh, the bikeway there. Um, the cost to date is approximately $3 million. Um, and that's been for the design and the right-of-way. And um, there will be other uh, costs associated with that. Um, the CTC is, uh, the city was awarded uh, five point, over five million in grant funding for the project. So that money is set aside. But we have to go, and Caltrans is um, our partner in this, and they're going to schedule it for the uh, California Transportation Commission for the required vote for the funding and to move the project forward. We're um, uh, in a really tight timeline in that the grant funding expires in the fall. Uh, we've gotten all of our extensions up to this point, so uh, this matter before the council is uh, very timely. Uh, the traffic impact fee uh, program uh, pays for uh, a number of intersections within the city of Santa Cruz for improvements. Some of the intersections that have been funded already are the, um, the two roundabouts in the beach area and a number of other projects. Uh, this is um, one of the biggest projects that's funded through the TIF program. Uh, there's also been some redevelopment agency funding early on in the project and um, the TIF has an adequate balance to fund the project. It's been funding as it goes and will have enough money plus some for um, paying the local match to the grant. Um, the TIF program also 15% uh, is uh, of the TIF program pays for bike and pedestrian projects that are separate from the intersection improvements that we do that also include typically bike and pedestrian improvements. And um, another 5% that goes to uh, uh, neighborhood improvements next to, uh, adjacent to a, um, um, shoot, I forgot the word for it, but uh, important development project. And the fifth question, um, I can't read my note. What was that? Yeah, that was about uh, me the possibility for additional measure D D funds if we, if we could apply for the highway portion of that, uh, that distribution. Right. Um, I, I believe the commission is fully committed the Measure D funding to Highway 1 improvements uh, towards Watsonville. Uh, however, it wouldn't hurt to ask, uh, but I don't think that it'd be likely that they would uh, allocate any money to this project. Yeah, thank you. Oops. I, that's kind of what I was getting at, because being on the RTC, I know that we have uh, budgeted for Measure D highway funds, but I just thought, you know, maybe we could uh, put that in the mix as well. Thanks. Council Member Byers. Um, Chris, I don't think I quite got the answer to the commission. Has, do we have, or is there before us, a recommendation from the Transportation Public Works Commission? No, it, um, we held it, um, we had a meeting, but the meeting was a public workshop where different projects were presented and that time um, the commission um, was part of that meeting and uh, were, uh, the project was represented there. Do we so have they, actual recommendation? they didn't want to weigh in on this huge project with the well, recommendation they upward? The they have in the past, however, the last several years, it's the item has been going to the city council directly because there's a variety of issues. The design had already been 
um, yeah, I know, but decided a long time ago. So it's mostly been the right of way acquisition and things like that, and permitting that we can take into the city council the details of the project. I just was kind of stunned. One of our big commissions that we use for a lot of stuff uh, just didn't have a, a more well, the, the direct commission, way. The commission wanted to have it at the workshop. So okay. that it could be presented okay. to the public okay. in, in a different format than the formal meeting. Sure, that would be a different format. Uh, you know, we just, I think only yesterday, maybe I got this morning, a really detailed um, letter from Rick Hyman on all the bicycles. I, have, yeah. I hope you've got a copy. Can you, um, I mean, there was a lot in there, and I think step by step, I hope Yeah, you there, there are about four items, and... Um, they, and as I told Rick, we would uh, discuss it with Caltrans. The majority of the items are on the state highway and require Caltrans uh, to, to approve before it can be included in the project. But we'll be forwarding that to them oh, at our good. next meeting. Because he's a real, kind of knows what he's talking about, I think. <laughs> My yeah, experience has been absolutely. Good idea, for sure. yeah, I, I want to go back to um, the CTC. Mm -hmm. So, by the way, do we have a lobbyist in Sacramento? I don't know. Do we? It, that we're lobbying for this money? Uh, well, these these were part of grant applications. Okay. Regional transportation. Nevertheless, to go before the CTC, uh, so there's a big grant sitting there, and they vote on it. I take it. Is it scheduled for a vote? Well, the, it is not yet scheduled, but Caltrans is the one that schedules the meeting with the CTC, and it won't be a, a city moving the project forward. It'll be be Caltrans since it's their they're, they're responsible they, I, for the construction. I don't know if their meeting as often as ever. Uh, I've just had a lot of experience with it going before them for that final vote. Um, do we have any idea when it's going to be? Um, I believe it'll be in August. Okay. And that's the final approval, yep. up or down? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think that's all I have. Yeah. Okay. I've had questions, but I think most of my answers have been covered. So for the sake of time, um, if there's no other questions from council members, we'll open it up to public comment. So if there are members of the public who are listening or who are watching, um, this is now the time to call in. Uh, there should be a series of phone numbers that you can call that are on your screen. If the first one doesn't work or is busy, I encourage you to try another one until you get through. Um, for those people who have already called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. And the timer will be set to two minutes. And I'd also like to ask that uh, Rick Longinati, if you're watching or listening, um, we did approve you for additional time. So please let us know, uh, announce yourself um, when you uh, have been unmuted and we will give you the additional time. And with that, I'm gonna open up the lines to the first member of the public. All right, you're on the line. Good afternoon, um, this is Brett Garrett. This project will bring more cars, more pollution, more carbon emissions. The city has declared a climate emergency, so it's a bad time to expand highways. The city has a serious budget shortfall, so it's a bad time to expand highways. The city is investing in transportation demand management, and this highway construction will do the exact opposite. Uh, construction costs will go up dramatically as a result of COVID-19, so again, it's a bad time to be expanding highways. I know you've received at least 60 letters asking you to drop this project, so please drop this project or at least put it on hold. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, next caller, you're on the line. Hi, it's Rick Longinati from the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. And I, I have a PowerPoint that Bonnie's going to put up, and let me know when you've got it up, Bonnie, because uh, community television's about 30 seconds behind, so I'm not watching the screen. All right, Rick, so she just put it on uh, the screen. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, what I want to talk about is 
we we have you know these these um, aspirations. We have these goals: the Vision Zero Health and All Policies Climate Action Plan, and they represent really the aspirations of our community. You know, the, really heartfelt aspirations that all of us care about. And so the opportunity today to decline to proceed with this project is the opportunity to close the gap so that we actually get to these goals. Next slide, please. So the Climate Action Plan uh, had this goal that we reduce within town car trips. I don't think anybody thinks that we actually did that from 2012 to 2020. Um, and we, in order to get to, the, to that goal, we really need to put our investments where our aspirations are. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a slide on safe streets, hopefully, that you're seeing what I'm seeing. Um, Santa Cruz is number one in cities uh, of similar size in California in injuries and, and deaths to bicyclists, and our average of number 11 in injuries and deaths to pedestrians. And so this is what I mean about the gap. We're, we're not on a trajectory to do better than this. I mean, we have, you know, this River Street project is great. It's one of the, uh, of Water Street, I should, should say. It's, it's one of the best things that I've seen in a long time. It makes me smile. But we're not, we're not getting out of that number one position unless we reorganize our priorities. Next slide, please. Um, aside from, you know, even if the issues of climate change and safety were not even around, we would have the issue of does this project make sense just from a cost effectiveness? Does it solve traffic congestion? And as we know from the research, you can't alleviate congestion by expanding highways. It just doesn't work other than just in the short run. Next slide. So the Caltrans did an environmental review of this project, and they found that the vehicle miles traveled would increase by 10% compared to not building the project. So in 2030, if you didn't build a project, you would have less vehicles on the road than, you, than if you built the project. And of course, the greenhouse gas emissions would go up. Next slide. Um, so there's going a, there's a shift in California. I hope that we can echo that shift here in our in our city. CEQA no longer considers traffic delay a significant impact. So in EIR is going forward. We're not going to have a mandate to widen intersections. Next slide, please. So hopefully you're seeing a, a photo of a, a streets of, with 60 people and in, in the amount of space that it takes to transport 60 people. This is what our general plan is talking about when it says traffic engineering in past decades generally focused on improving vehicle mobility by expanding roadway capacity, too often without consideration for increasing person trip mobility. We're in the middle of a transformation. <clears throat> and our city needs to catch up with, with what's written here in the general plan. Next slide. The general plan also says we should accept a lower level of service and higher congestion at major regional intersections if necessary improvements would be prohibitively costly or, or result in significant unacceptable environmental impacts, which I would submit that this project does. It's one of the most costly projects we've got. It drains our traffic impact fee. <clears throat> and it, has a 10% increase in greenhouse gases. Next slide. We'll skip the trans, uh, Sierra Club. I think we have a caller from the Sierra Club. Next slide. So we do have uh, alternatives. We have ways to reduce vehicle trips. We, we are seeing that downtown. There's more we can do downtown. We could do that citywide. We could do that at UCSC. <laughs> We're making progress or safe streets for bikes and pedestrians, but as you know, we have so much more to go to get off that number one spot and deaths and injuries. Um, and is that four minutes? Yes, but that was the time, so that, that was the four minutes. Okay. Um, I, I just want to uh, conclude by saying this project is not a safe project. The, the, commission's, the commission never considered this project. They never said send it to an open house. They, they didn't have the possibility of even having it on their agenda. Uh, the council really needs to, at this, at, at today, to send it back to the Transportation Commission for their input. Thank you very much. Yep. All right, next caller, you have two minutes. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for, for everything you're doing, and, and good afternoon. My name is Bob Morgan, and I'm calling representing the Sierra Club. I'm the chair of the Transportation Committee of the Sierra Club Santa Cruz. I have two statements to read. They're both brief sentences. We advocate that policies to implement charges for parking and highway access, congestion pricing and transportation control measures, rather than increasing road capacity for vehicles, be considered before highway expansion. The first statement. The second statement reads, we ask all cities to promote alternative modes of transportation that prioritize white walking and biking over vehicles, building and supporting public transit, reducing and eventually eliminating parking. Those two statements come from the National Transportation Policy of the Sierra Club. Thank you very much for all of your work. Thank you. All right, next caller. Somebody up now? Yes, you're on the line. Okay, uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, Michael Saint, uh, representing Citizens Climate Lobby, Santa Cruz chapter. Uh, our group is uh, totally opposed to this uh, one slash nine intersection project and any projects that increase greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled. Also, any project that will widen roads and highways causing induced travel should not be considered and the funds from those car eccentric projects be used for pedestrian safety, protected bike lanes, et cetera, uh, throughout not only our city, but our county. Uh, if this uh, situation worked of widening, um, and a lot of the widening has been done in California, Los Angeles would actually have no congestion. I have been an environmental advocate for four years now, and the amount of projects harmful to the environment seems to drastically outweigh the environmentally sound choices. Some examples of these are Jeep dealerships, the bad ones down on Soquel Avenue in lieu of home, um, housing, a uh, possible 400 space garage between Lincoln and Locust a library project, which increases induced demand. Ox lanes between Soquel and Freedom Boulevard, a 29% increase in vehicle miles traveled. Sustainable Soquel project was shuttled in favor of a Nissan dealership. Capitola Mall is now considering the town square with over 3,000 parking spaces, another induced demand project. Kaiser Medical Center, 700 parking spaces, induced de demand for vehicles. Mid-pin project on Capitola Road and also suggested widening of Capitola Road to uh, go along with that project, more induced demand for vehicles. And your Highway 19 intersection, inducing demand. Some of the good projects I'll throw in, protected bike lanes, which I see occasionally, rail trail is underway, free bus passes, and uh, the green paint on the pavement for bike. Uh, good projects, but they pale in comparison to the damage that the mega projects will be due to our environment. This Highway 19 intersection project. Sorry, but I, I, I'm going to have to cut you off because um, that sound was the end of your two minutes, but thank you for calling in. All right, next caller, you're on. Hello? Hello. Hi, again, my name is Candace Brown from East Morrissey, and also I joined the Transportation Public Works Commission in February, and I can attest to, to that we have not had any uh, official review of this project uh, during that period and including our, our May meeting. Also, there was mention of the, um, the circle at 190 Westcliff. It wasn't clear that there was funding for that. So, and the comment was that uh, he wasn't sure if that project would happen. So I think the traffic impact fees need to be reassessed relative to all these projects. We have so much information and we have so many decisions to make. We have to look at local versus regional impacts different modes of transportation, both yesterday and tomorrow, and what will the economy look like in the next three to five years. What is now becoming into focus is a timeline of the vaccine for COVID-19 by the Pulitzer Prize winning and UCSC alumni graduate, Lori Garrett, that says that the best care, the best case scenario for vaccine is three years best case scenario for a 
type of vaccine that has never been tested before, even on animals. So we are dealing with, from this day forward, with a new reality. We have to reassess decisions such as this that will spend all the traffic impact fees that will be for move, even moving forward. Otherwise, we cannot do anything for bike and public safety pedestrian safety through the city, throughout the city, I should say, as people adjust to low-cost transportation. What was true yesterday is not true today. As our leaders, you not only need to lead, but you need to show courage, true courage. We are at a time that we need to reassess what we are doing with this money, and if we make a mistake, we cannot make it up later. Um, so we do need true courage, and this is the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next call, you're on the line. Uh, yes, um, this project is going to cost a lot of money and probably will not increase the traffic safety. There are better ways to increase traffic safety. And they are the opposite of widening roads. They involve gradually narrowing roads so that human psychology gets people to go slower. We need the funds that would be spent for this for safer bike and pedestrian um, venues, and that could include Pacific Avenue and some other places to allow the businesses to flourish as they place, for example, uh, cafe tables outside or um, clothing racks outside, taking advantage of good weather and social distancing. So please save the money for better things. Don't do this project. Thank you. Thank you. Does any other member of the public would like to speak on this item? Um, who has called in and has not had a chance to speak yet, please press star nine on your phone at this point in time uh, so that you can have your hand raised and you can be called on. If there are other members of the public who would like to speak on this item, now it's time to call in. Please call one of the numbers on your screen. And uh, once you have, um, have entered the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand so that you can be called upon to provide a two minutes to speak. Okay, next call, you're on the line. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, welcome. Hi, this is Sheila Carrillo. Hi, hello everybody. Um, what I wanted to say is in light of our climate catastrophe, which is the crisis of all crises, we couldn't do anything less wise than facilitate the use of more cars through road widening or adding parking. I urge you to prioritize addressing the climate crisis and seek transportation alternatives. Be forward thinking, not backward thinking, to you know, contribute to saving the future of our children. Thank you. Okay, seeing no additional members of the public, who would like to speak to us on this item? I thought there's one more. Okay, you're on the line. Yeah, good afternoon. This is James Ewing Whitman again. Um, I would just like to second the cautioning of spending these funds because it seems like what's gonna happen? So I appreciate the two, at least the two other civic members that recommended cautioning these funds. That's it, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, I'll bring it back to Council for Action and Deliberation. Uh, Council Member Matthews. And you're muted, by the way. Um, yeah, I want to appreciate the, those who called in. Um, this is a project. Uh, I think the, the questions that council members had initially were were answered. Um, and this is a project that has been 
uh, in the works for a very long time, and um, we are coming upon a critical decision point, a deadline. And so I'm going to uh, go ahead and move the recommendation before us, which includes uh, approval of the plans and specs for the Highway 19 intersection improvements, motion to approve the construction management services request, and there's additional language that goes with this, and motion to approve um, an amendment to the contract with the engineers for additional additional work, um, incorporating the full language in the recommendation. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews. Um, I saw the Councilmember Byers' hand was up. Did you have a question? Or were you gonna second the motion? Not seconding the motion, and I will just have comments when we're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Myers, I saw your hand was up. Next. I will second the motion. Okay. So we have a motion made by um, Council Member Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers. Um, and I'll bring it back to uh, Council Member Byers for your comments on this item. Sure. Uh, it is true. This project has been going on for a long time. I think. Um, I mean, way, way back. And I must say, I've paid a lot of attention to it all, all these years, and it's never, ever made sense to me. Uh, and even since that, well, now we have the emergency climate change that the council has determined it is an emergency. And here we are contributing uh, an overwhelming amount of uh, anti-climate change, good, good stuff happening. Um, I don't, we talk about following the data all the time on the coronavirus, and for some reason, we just don't pay enough to the data that has come out regarding this project. Accordingly, it's going to help 10%, uh, I think, of the traffic by 2030. It's not even going to matter. It's going to be it's going to be obsolete in that many years. We've seen that with the uh, extended lanes on Highway One, uh, so it's it's a bad for our buck. But I, more importantly, it's just bad for our environment and bad for our community, who constantly is uh, raising the issue of climate change, safety. Uh, uh, we have one letter about the pedestrian safety, but if anyone ever parks there waiting for the light to change, I wish we had stats on the number of accidents. How could we think that the accidents, some are minor, but some barely get through, but it's overwhelming the unsafe conditions of all those lanes, and so now we're gonna add lanes. I, I can't imagine how it could be safer. Um, not to mention, I know somebody even raised the issue, all these trees are gonna come down too. Uh, I only put that in because it is going to be so ugly and nothing we should be proud of. We should be proud of, and I hope we are proud of, putting the tunnel for bicycles to a uh, tannery. That's a way of doing it. We, we could have pedestrian and, um, and bicycle more tunnels and so people don't have to go the current uh, uh, number of lanes, which is so difficult. You know, the general plan really did talk about reducing and uh, lowering the level of worrying about congestion. This is a good example of that. And I know it's been in the works forever. There's always a grant out there and we're always running to catch the date, the timing on that grant. It happens all the time. And nobody wants to lose access to three to $5 million. But sometimes you just say, whoa, we need to take this back. We need to relook at the safety, we want them to re let the Transportation Commission really, they're our experts. I'm not an engineer, and I'm not, no, the commissions are not either, but at least they delve into it. We, I delve into it because we got it on Thursday and didn't even know it was coming before that, so it, it's the timeline. And just the last thing, uh, we're in a, we don't know what the future's gonna look like, absolutely nobody. All I see is people, more and more people are walking, more and more people on their bicycles. We may have a whole new look of how we go about our day to day. It just could be so different. Uh, and if we did, this will scare people off for sure, walking or bicycling. But if we just delay it and, and re, you know, just delay, sit back and watch our community 
changes or doesn't change or changes one way, we simply don't know. But I think at the minimum we should delay this project till we settle down and see what's going on and really take a much deeper look at the safety, uh, both for bicycles and pedestrians. That's it. I will be voting no, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. Yes, uh, well, I won't repeat uh, the, the comments that um, Council Member Byers made, but I, I really wholeheartedly agree. Um, I have been supportive of moving this project forward um, during my time on the council and at the RTC. I am, uh, and so I don't want to uh, appear to be just completely changing course, but I do think that the changed environment really warrants that us stopping and taking a look at what we're doing here. Um, you know, we are uh, in a fiscal emergency. Uh, we have clearly a climate emergency. And um, I recognize that the fund, these funds are kind of, much of it would be extra funding and these pots of funding are not fungible. And so we, it could lead to a loss in potential funding. But you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not really ready to, to continue to move forward at this time. I, and the, in particular, I'm gonna just highlight my concerns that the Transportation and Public Works Commission did not review this. Uh, you know, I, I supported this moving forward the last time we voted with the understanding that that would happen and it hasn't. And um, it could have because we've had lots of time between that, um, that vote and today. And so coming up against this timeline, it is unfortunate, but um, I think it's unfortunate that we didn't have that, um, that commission review as directed. So I will not be supporting the motion today. Councilmember Watkins. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you. I, I understand the comments that were made in terms of hesitation, and I too have seen this project evolve over the years, and um, also somebody who patrons that intersection on a regular basis, I have to say that it's definitely due for improvement for safety. I, I, um, I, I, under general circumstances, I, I pretty much drive there to work or uh, patron the area on a regular basis, and it's, um, it, it's definitely overdue, I'd say. Um, I just wanted to get clarity, if I may. My understanding was that the uh, commission did review it, but they uh, decided to do it in a different way, and I'm wondering if, if maybe Chris is on just to clarify that uh, for us. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, that's correct. The commission decided to uh, have it at a workshop so they felt like they could get more input from the public in a more informal setting. And that's why it took that. They didn't ask to reschedule it at another meeting after that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I had a follow up question for Chris. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could just highlight or share. Um, kind of how community members were able to weigh in on this project there and kind of what was the sense that um, people were getting, that the commission got from having this in an alternative way? Um, you know, it was a little while ago. I don't remember the exact, all the exact details, but I think generally people were supportive that the uh, bike lanes had been added and um, were supportive of the design. The, um, project has been um, through the public process a number of times, through environmental review and the design, and every time we're taking uh, some kind of action on it, essentially today is administrative actions to uh, move the project forward. Um, if we, the city doesn't take this action, then essentially we're at risk of not doing the project and lose, losing the $5 million in grant funding, not only to the project, but to the region it would go back to the state and they would use it elsewhere. So there's, it's not just a question of losing the money uh, for the project, but it's losing the money uh, locally. Great, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Chris, I've been uh, taking notes that I might've missed. When was, the, when was the public workshop held that was um, requested? 
Oh, you know, I I don't recall exactly. The, I don't recall the date. Uh, it was okay. about a year ago, a little bit more. Okay. Um, I can provide that information later. Okay. Thank you. All right. Council Member Byers. Um, I mean, that was a significant meeting. I'm not surprised you don't need to remember the date, but you think it was over a year ago, a year and a half ago, two years? <laughs> that plus, did they all, did they have pictures of the, uh, I mean, a lot of information. Did they have what we're seeing in terms of the design? Uh, yes, definitely. Okay, okay good. Yes, yeah, so no, we had, uh, we had uh, boards with all the design, the number of lanes, lane widths, all the information cross section. Okay, thanks, thanks, Chris. Uh, okay. I'll just say that I know, I want to thank uh, first the public for calling and weighing in on this. I know that this has come before us on a number of occasions and we've moved to get to this point. Um, I also, um, you know, given what the impact that we're having with COVID-19, there's concerns on both sides that need to be taken into consideration. I know that, um, you know, for, for one, many people now are really concerned with being in, get, you know, gathering in groups and being in situations where they are in close confined spaces with other individuals, which really, um, you know, makes us have to wonder about how that's going to impact massive transit, right? Are we going to be, able, are people going to want to get on buses, trains? Um, and so I think we need to continue to explore those options as we move forward and hopefully we'll have a vaccine to be able to invest in that. But, you know, there, there's, it's uncertain whether we'll see a trend in people wanting to, you know, drive more electric vehicles and the capacity for that. And so I think um, as we move forward, we need to continue to understand how we can um, make our city more environmentally friendly while also meeting the needs of growing populations and people's need to get around in a way that's efficient and safe. Um, and so those are the comments that I'll make on this. And if there's no further questions or comments, we can go ahead and take a roll call vote. And so um, the motion before us is um, to approve the plans, the, the approve the recommendation that's been outlined by the staff. The motion was made by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers. Um, and so we'll, I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the vote. Mayor, Council Member Byers? No. Matthews? Yes. Brown? Yeah, I, I'm gonna vote no, but I also just wanna comment that I, I just found the direction that we gave was last June 23rd at our meeting in 2019. So um, if the decision to hold a public workshop was after that, then um, okay, but I, that's not my understanding. So um, I'll be voting no, thanks. Holder? Yes. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? I'll say that given that the information that this didn't go to the commission as it was directed after that meeting, while I'm supportive of this, I'm gonna vote no just because I feel like the council directed that it go to that commission first and um, it's kind of unfortunate that they didn't, that the, the commission didn't see this, so. But I will say that um, I am supportive of, you know, continuing to improve the highway intersection. Okay, um, so that motion passes with council members Golder, Matthews, Watkins, Vice Mayor Myers voting in favor, council members Byers, Brown, and Mayor Cummings voting against. And so with that, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is, all right, uh, item number 21, um, public hearing amendment to chapter six, oh, sorry, this is, um, it was gonna be item number 21, but that got postponed until uh, June 9th, 2020. And so the next item on our agenda is item number 22, amending the Santa Cruz Municipal Code related to election campaign expenditure and contribution limits. So I'll turn that over to Bonnie first, Bonnie Bush, City Clerk, uh, to uh, provide that presentation. 
Thank you, Mayor. Council members, um, as you all know, we have a um, contribution and expenditure limit ordinance in the city of Santa Cruz. And the last election cycle, I noticed it was really out of date and um, some of the dollar amounts needed to be updated. So it's really a housekeeping update to the current ordinance. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, are there any council members who'd like to comment on this item? Okay. Seeing none, I'll turn it over to the public. If there's any member of the public that would like to comment on item number 22, um, please call in at this time and press star nine on your phone and you will be able to speak on this item. and deliberation. Councilmember Matthews. Yes, this is really administrative housekeeping. I want to thank Bonnie for catching that it needed to be updated. So um, if, if there are no questions from others, I'll go ahead and move the motion before us. Okay. Uh, we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded, or, and I see Councilmember Watkins with your hands raised. Yep, second. I'll second the motion. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Watkins. There's no further discussion on this item, then we can move to a roll call vote. Council members Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. The next item of general business is item number 23, Downtown Association Parking and Business Improvement Area Assessments for Fiscal Year 2021. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff for the council members who brought the item forward, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for action and deliberation. And so today, our presenters on this item are Bonnie Bush, Director of Economic Development, and Abra Allen, Downtown Association, Interim Executive Director. Good afternoon, Mayor. I'm Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development, and um, I will just introduce the item and then turn it over to Abra. We are the fiscal agent for the Downtown Association, but the work conducted by the Downtown Association for this business improvement district is conducted by the Downtown Association and they prepare the annual report. Um, so I'll briefly just say that this is an annual assessment. Um, we've been the fiscal agent um, for the Downtown Association for many years. Um, this is the annual approval of the assessment. The one difference this year is that there is a larger effort to consolidate the two assessments we have. So both of our regular assessments are on the agenda today. The uh, business improvement district, which is this item, and then the next item, item 24, which is the downtown management corporation, which is a property-based improvement district. So we'll take both items. The larger process for the, um, the larger project-based improvement district that's being considered right now will come before you potentially on June 9th. Um, we're in the process of meeting with property owners right now and can answer any questions when we get to that um, item as well. Um, but with that said, I'll turn it over to Abra Allen, um, who can sort of continue the introduction to this item, and then we're both available to answer any questions that you have. Great, thank you, Bonnie. Hello, council members. Um, I wanna do a quick sound check. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. 
great. I actually have some incredibly loud neighbors. So if you start hearing a dog barking and children screaming in a pool, then flag me and I'll throw on some headsets and we can just roll from there. Um, I did want to briefly just introduce one of my colleagues who will also be speaking um, as a presenter on this agenda item, um, Sonia Bruner, who you will see um, on the Zoom call as well. She's our operations director as well as coordinates um, our membership. So she'll be speaking as well. Um, as Bonnie said, I'm Abra Allen. I'm the interim executive director for the Downtown Association of Santa Cruz. And I'm here just to give you a little bit of background and some more context um, when looking at our annual work plan and budget that we submitted to the agenda today. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Downtown Association is funded through an assessment of businesses um, within the downtown district boundaries. Um, that is an assessment in its current format that was created uh, back in the 90s. The purview of the Downtown Association, um, there's multiple pieces to it, and it evolves and changes, but most of it is working um, as advocates for our downtown businesses, and I would say that that's a piece that we're really strong at. We have very close relationships with most of our downtown businesses. Um, we work within marketing for downtown as well, and then we also provide a lot of event support downtown, whether it be through events that we present ourselves, like the downtown holiday parade or Santa or the wine walks that you see happening or working in partnership with other um, independent producers that are producing events downtown that we can support, um, whether it be Santa Cruz Dance Week or the Cabrillo Contemporary Music Festival. Um, another piece of what we do is also clean, safe, and welcoming services, and that piece of what we do has evolved and changed quite a bit over the years. We currently um, are contracted with through the Downtown Management Corporation to offer ambassador services, and we have our downtown kiosk as well that has been downtown for many years. Um, this has been quite a big year for the Downtown Association, a lot of changes. Um, back in July, my predecessor, Chip, who was with the organization for over a decade, um, stepped down and relocated to Boulder, Colorado, and I stepped in for a year-long contract. Um, that was based on Chip's recommendations to pursue a strategic plan for downtown Santa Cruz. Um, which the board approved and we moved forward and we were able to partner with economic development on that strategic plan and hire an outside firm to oversee um, that outreach. And I have to say beyond the benefits of that strategic plan, um, partnering with economic development and Bonnie Lipscomb and her team has been really invaluable in deepening the relationship and the partnership between, between our two entities so that we're able to offer better support to businesses downtown. So that's been great. Um, through that strategic plan, we did some pretty widespread outreach working with this firm, Progressive Urban Management Associates. Many of you are probably familiar have seen that acronym at some point in the last year. We did a lot of work with downtown stakeholders. Um, we met in focus groups, we met in roundtable discussions, and then we also offered an online survey to our community and received 3,000 responses with input around what people saw as um, where the need was downtown. And that work led um, to recommendations to form a PBID or a property-based improvement district. Um, you, you will hear a lot more about that potentially as time goes on, so I will not speak um, a lot more on that topic beyond to say that through all the research that we have done across the country and certainly within the state of California, the PBID is absolutely our best way to move forward um, in streamlining our efforts around maintenance and management of downtown Santa Cruz and whether it's something that we're able to move forward through now or we're able to move it forward potentially next year, it's something that is again, absolutely crucial, so I just can't reiterate that enough um, for moving forward. So through that outreach to the community and the strategic plan and what you would see reflected in the PBID um, budget is a really significantly increased clean, safe, and welcoming budget. Um, and a lot of that would look like a massive expansion of an ambassador program, most likely contracted out to an outside entity that does that kind of work in communities across the country. Um, but on that note, I thought that it would be really important to hear a little bit more about the current ambassador program as well as the kiosk program that really does serve as that um, clean, safe, and welcoming program currently. So I'm gonna pass it over to Sonia Bruner for just a quick moment to talk about those two programs. Thank you, Abra. Can everyone hear me okay? 
Okay, Sonia Brenner, Operations Director with the Downtown Association, and my role is I oversee the programs, the Information CS program, and the Downtown Ambassador program, which we currently manage in house. And um, thank you, Bonnie, for bringing up the slides. And um, we'll just talk through quickly. And I thought some pictures really would uh, connect it for everybody to show the value and understand how wonderful both of these programs have been in our downtown community. Um, so starting with the ambassador program, next slide. Uh, it, it started as a partnership of the City of Santa Cruz Downtown Association and the Downtown Management Corporation. It launched, next slide, in October 1st of 2018, and the map um, is the, showing the district of where the ambassadors patrol, and that would be Pacific Avenue from Laurel to Water Street and the side streets. Next slide. And the mission of the Downtown Ambassadors is to be the best part of people's day in downtown Santa Cruz. Next slide. They proactively look for visitors who might be needing assistance, proactively communicate with and update downtown business staff, identify and resolve vandalism, graffiti, waste, debris, cleanliness issues, they liaison with any relevant city staff and other downtown partners, including rangers, police, public works, outreach workers, offices, um, downtown streets team, and um, really strive to track uh, recurring issues work helping to manage the downtown space and the, the landscape and um, anything that's happening uh, continually looking for ways to improve each block. Next slide. And so one of the, the things they also help manage are little things like replacing the, the doggy poop bags and the pet waste dispensers along Pacific Avenue. And um, just, you know, following the best practices of downtown management organizations, being friendly faces with a smile and outreaching to anybody downtown that has questions, needs help, and um, just being welcoming and friendly and a support. Next slide. Also manage the downtown app C Quick Fix. And um, as you can see, there are a variety of shortcuts to access, which has been very handy for a lot of businesses as well as the public. Next slide. With the C Click Fix app, we've been able to collect data and reporting, and here are just some of the top categories that ambassadors help to manage to get resolved, uh, whether it be themselves taking care of it or finding who can help take care of whatever the situation is. And so um, the, it just contributes to the clean friendly atmosphere. Most people, for example, the we've had seven reports of the sidewalk benches being damaged and most people don't know who to contact about that, whether you're a visitor downtown and a business where a bench is out in front of your business, for example. So in lots of little ways, they are the connector to help manage all of downtown's um, issues and needs and questions. Uh, next slide. Here's just a couple of ambassadors thanking our public works for cleaning the sidewalks. It is the number one issue that they help resolve. So just a little quick overview, that's it, and I will move on to the information kiosk, if we can go to those slides. 
We're hoping um, for potential expansion of the ambassador program and like Abra said, um, potentially contracting out to a another company that does this around other cities and other states. Okay, the information kiosk is the wonderful little kiosk in front of New Leaf Community Market. Next slide. And um, the information kiosk, um, the city is our landlord. And um, we, next slide, we, we were established in 2012. And so we just celebrated our eight year anniversary. And it was, um, very exciting. You'll see on Facebook for the information kiosk some wonderful pictures that Venus, one of our full-time staffers, put together to commemorate and celebrate all the wonderful moments. Um, the information kiosk serves around 10,500 visitors a year from the county, regional, national, and international locations. Next question. Next. Uh, yeah. So these are some of the sample questions we get at the information kiosk. Um, it's a tiny one person operation, but definitely mighty. Um, and uh, not only do the staff at the information kiosk showcase promotions, uh, activities, flyers, posters, events, music, art, shows, festivals, same day events. Uh, the 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 staff also works really hard to know about things happening in the city and the county to be able to ask question answer questions provide maps brochures directories even maps to neighboring cities for visitors that may be headed there next next slide please um and these are just last year's totals. We keep track if anybody's ever interested. We would love to share the data that we collect. We definitely uh, collect data of each visitor where they're from. And it's really fun to see, for example, in the international, what countries they're visiting from. And as you can see in this data, for example, um, we have a lot of county from within the county visitors too that are coming to ask questions. Next slide. And everyone stops by the information kiosk. It's definitely a central hub for connecting to information in downtown Santa Cruz, providing information on all the area services the downtown businesses and um, opportunities even to find that perfect lunch. <laughs> and you'll see on the left are two of our downtown rangers. In the middle is Maverick from Santa Cruz Warriors. And on the right are some international visitors at the information kiosk. And that's it. I just wanted to give a quick overview for those who weren't familiar with either program. Um, we're really, really um, proud of our staff and people and the impact it's had downtown and with our community downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And I'll just wrap up. I'm not going to keep you too long. I know you have a really big agenda still. Um, but I did just want to reiterate that the, I mean, the kiosk program is amazing. I'm sure all of you have encountered Alan or Venus. Um, they're really at the heart of that, of that program. They're absolutely incredible. Um, and our ambassador program has been just a huge asset to the organization and to the downtown community. It really has allowed for a bridge between our downtown businesses and our organization. We get to hear from them quite often through our ambassadors about what they need and what kind of support we can offer. Um, it's also been great to create this network downtown between um, Santa Cruz PD and Carter Jones and also our Rangers downtown. Um, it's just like their little, our little kind of walking communication mechanisms downtown. So it's been incredibly valuable. Um, and as I've said, you know, these kind of programs are hugely significant in their impacts in downtowns across the country. Um, and if we would be able to expand that program, it would be it would be significant. And one of the mechanisms for that would be the PVID that's being proposed. Um, 
I did want to mention that some of the work that the DTA, the Downtown Association, is doing during this COVID um, pandemic, um, we, uh, like everybody else, had to pivot really rapidly and try to figure out what we could do to support folks. A big piece of that was offering education and advocacy um, and being that mechanism where information came through. And as soon as we heard about things, sharing them with the downtown community, um, being available at all times by phone and email, um, and educating them to the, the best of our ability um, through our website and our social media. Um, another piece of that was um, building partnerships with other city entities or other business organizations so that we could offer those resources to our downtown community as well. Um, and then lastly, one of the big pieces has been a big pivot in marketing. Um, immediately upon seeing this happen, we just quickly moved, and I'm really proud of our staff. Um, Sonia, Marina, Toft, and myself are the three administrators for the Downtown Association, and um, it, it's taken quite the effort to get us where we are, but we were one of the first downtowns to be able to shift rapidly and completely change the interface of our website to support what was happening with takeout and online sales and things like that, and actually um, have been pointed to on many national fronts for a downtown to look to. So we feel really proud of those efforts that we were able to support our downtown in that way. Um, and now, of course, we're pivoting in another direction. So it's a moving target right now, and we're just trying to be, be prepared. Um, I wanted to quickly just mention our work plan and our budget. We, I created that probably over a month ago because um, we needed to have our board vote on it. So you can imagine incredible amount of uncertainty in creating a work plan and budget currently not knowing what we're looking for. I did put in a 20% decrease um, expected in our assessment budget um, as our assessment is funded through business. We are preparing that there will likely be businesses that do not come back, or there will be businesses that will need to wait and hold off on paying any sort of assessment, and we really want to support them to be alive, survive, and thrive. <laughs> So being able to do that. Um, we're also taking a shift um, away from our group, which actually pull a lot of funds and capacity, being that that's not something that's uh, realistic at this point, um, away from that um, and moving that funding and capacity towards economic development, um, hoping to partner more um, with the staff over there and support our businesses, and then also trying to redesignate some funds back to clean, safe, and welcoming. As I have reiterated, I cannot tell you enough, the more people on boots on the ground, people walking around, the more support our downtown is gonna get. So currently we're looking at how do we expand the ambassador footprint beyond its current, and how does the Downtown Association find funding to support that, because it seems absolutely um, crucial at this point. So all in all, we're just preparing as our small staff to just you know, be ready at any moment for any change that might happen, especially as, as these reopenings are rolling out. What can we do for our downtown businesses and our downtown community? And that's it. Great, well, thank you for your, your presentation, for all the work that you all do. Um, all these programs seem really great. And um, and with that, um, I'll turn it over to council to see if any council members have questions um, on this item. Okay, seeing there are no questions. Oh, Council Member Brown. Well, I don't really have a question. I just wanna appreciate all the work that you have done and your ability to really be nimble in these challenging times. I'm glad to see uh, the team in charge is taking that very seriously. And I just, I love uh, hearing from you. So thank you for everything. Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, you're muted. Uh, if there's no other questions, Mayor, I might uh, go ahead and make a motion to, to move things forward, but I just want to be respectful to see if there's other questions. Sure, and we also, I, I just want to remind folks that we need to open up for public comment still. Public comment, right. Um, but uh, it looks like council member, oh, okay. looks like there aren't any further questions or comments. Okay, so with that, I will uh, open it up to comments from the public. So if there are members of the public that would like to comment on this item that's before us, which is item number 23, uh, Downtown Association Parking and Business Improvement Area Assessments for fiscal year
year 2021. Um, please call in at this moment in time if you haven't already. And once you are in the meeting, you'll want to hit star nine on your phone, which will allow you to raise your hand, at which point uh, we will then acknowledge you and you'll have two minutes to speak on this item. So we'll give the public a couple minutes to uh, raise their hand. Mayor, I, I just wanted to mention that the item before you is both a motion as well as a resolution of intention to levy the assessment. Thank you. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any uh, members of the public who would like to speak on this item. And so I'll bring it back to Council for Action Deliberation. Council Member Matthews, it's you. I'm happy to second the motion if it was made. <laughs> uh, for both the um, motion to approve the plan and um, adopt the resolution. I was going to say that, but go, go for it. That's great. <laughs> I'm going to come back and get into it. But yeah. and, and I think I just have to share everyone's feelings. Um, this is absolute awe in what the people downtown are doing and throughout our community, really. But, uh, particularly for downtown who've been going through the Puma project and what's their future and our grand vision and whammo, this thing comes at you. And to see the, the extraordinary energy and creativity and sense of community coming forward, we understand the profound anxiety as well. So just hats off to all you guys. Yeah, I'd like to just echo, yeah, my appreciation to the Downtown Association, all your work over the past year. Um, reading the report, especially, um, just all the amount of outreach and uh, just day-to-day -day contact that you took to tr really talk with property owners and, and business owners downtown is really, really appreciated. We don't often do that well enough and um, just really appreciate all your work and really trying to make sure that um, everyone was well informed and um, I've heard lots of compliments about your process and uh, so thank you for all your work and uh, uh, we'll see what happens as we move forward here. Hopefully things get better. Thanks you guys. And I'll just echo the sentiments expressed by my colleagues to thank you for all the hard work you're doing and, and I just also want members of the public to know because I know we as council members have been receiving lots of emails about you know closing down the streets downtown and I know that the downtown association has already gotten out in front of that and has been you know conducting surveys with the different businesses and so just really want to appreciate all the work that you all continue to do to try to meet the needs of our downtown and, of, and the visitors and residents of Santa Cruz. Okay, with that, um, seeing no further questions or comments, I'll turn it back to the city clerk um, to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council members, Byers? Oh, please unmute your microphones as well. Sorry, aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. All right, thank you all for joining us on that item today and for the presentation. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> On the next item on our agenda is item number 24. Uh, this is the Cooperative Retail Management and Business Real Property Improvement District Assessment for fiscal year 2021. And this will be presented by uh, Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. Thank you, Mayor. This is the uh, Property Based Improvement District, or PBID, um, that is managed by the Downtown Management Corporation. And the assessment this year is it's not changed from last year. 
the contract that we have, though, um, was just talked about in the previous item, and that is the, the majority of this assessment, 204000 out of the 218, goes towards the contract with the Downtown Association for the Ambassador Program. <laughs> Additionally, we supplement that for uh, waste cleanup downtown, security cameras, and other downtown specific um, uses. Can I stop you for a sec? I'd like to ask, if you're not speaking, could you please mute your microphone? No, 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 no. Yeah. Interrupting and interfering with our presentation. I I think it's a planning. Um, okay, I think we're good now. Okay. Um, so the overall assessment is 218,000. The majority of that 204,000 goes towards the contract with the Downtown Association for managing the ambassador program. We additionally supplement that with cafe extension area and our kiosk rent to provide additional waste removal services downtown. Um, and some contribution towards the trolley, as well as our security camera program. So this is the annual assessment. Um, as um, in the earlier item, we all also are looking at a larger property-based improvement district that would merge both the Downtown Association and the Downtown Management Corporation. If that does go forward, that would be on the next agenda. And we would um, include phase-out language, both for the DTA assessment that we just discussed, as well as the DMC assessment. Um, and those would phase out at the end of December if the larger P bid is approved um, at, for consideration next month. So um, if the larger P bid is approved, that would be effective in January. So we still need approval of both this district for the P bid, the smaller P bid, as well as the one that you just approved, so that we have continuity of services in the downtown. Um, there is a contribution from the city in this district. We do not own property within the district. It's approximately 39,000. The majority of that is parking related property. There additionally is the Del Mar and a couple other city owned um, properties within the district. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks, Bonnie, for that presentation. Uh, are there any questions from council members at this time? Okay, uh, seeing none, I will open up public comment on this item. So the item before us is item number 24, Cooperative Retail Management and Business Real Property Improvement District Assessment, Fiscal Year 2021. Um, there are members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If you'd like to comment on this, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Um, if you've called in and you'd like to comment on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. And the timer will be set to two minutes. Okay, uh, you're on the line. Uh, members of the public, council members, this is Robert Norris of Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. I attempted to call in on the last item, and I wasn't able to uh, get your attention, though I did get the proper numbers. So although these two items are closely related, so perhaps I can make these comments. The uh, ambassadors program has been almost universally disparaged and opposed by homeless organizations throughout the country. It is a proto-police agency which masquerades as something that's concerned with helping tourists. And I think Sandy Brown and Catherine Byer should know better than this, although Catherine Byer has initiated this whole thing back in 1995, as I think part of a well-intended mediation proposal to deal with conflicts that were in, in, involved and are still involved with the police and homeless people in public spaces and that will continue to be involved. I would say before you support this kind of assessment, and I think you should do a revote, frankly, on the last item, because members of the public, at least I, was not allowed to speak. I think maybe it's, maybe it's a fault in the system. I don't know what. But I think uh, you need to see the stats on what what are the numbers of contacts that involve uh, connecting with the police and connecting with homeless people and directing them to follow the downtown ordinances? This used to be a very heavy part of what the hosts, which is now called the Ambassadors Program, did. It's a proto-policing mentality which spends time, money, and the inappropriate use of force to privatize the sidewalks 
And I, I, while I appreciate what, the, what some of the hosts do at the Info Bureau at the kiosk, I think that's a good thing. I'm glad to see maps and tourist information given out. This other aspect is very dangerous to and, and alarming to homeless folks, uh, who you see less and less of downtown. You might say, well, you know, that's all you see downtown with the COVID crisis. But in fact, there is there because of the gentrification process happening in this community, we see less and less public space. And thank you. Please consider what I said. Okay, thank you very much. Again, if there are members of the public who would like to speak on this item, please call one of the numbers on your screen right now. Um, enter the, the code that's at the bottom and press star nine to raise your hand. No other members of the public who'd like to speak on this item. I'll bring it back to Council for Action and Deliberation. Councilmember Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move the recommendation for the item. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Watkins. I'll go ahead and second that. So we have a motion to move the staff recommendations by Councilmember Watkins, seconded by Mayor Cummings. Uh, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, thank you. I uh, I just wanted to follow up on that uh, the comment from our our last uh, speaker, Mr. North, to ask if any is there any data available about um, when those calls and the resolution of those calls, how many have involved uh, the police? Do you do you track that? Um, I don't know if that's for Abra or Bonnie or both, um, but I, it would be helpful to know if it's available. Uh, sorry, I'm just I'm processing that question. Um, you know, we do have data on um, both that the ambassadors um, um, record as far as the nature of the calls, those get, that do get referred to either the um, rangers and or some actually get called to our mental health outreach. I would say probably more of them get, call, get uh, referred to our, our mental health outreach support downtown. Um, so we do have general data. It doesn't go into the detail of all of the, the nature of the calls. I see that Abra is back on, so I'll see if she has something to add to that as well. Um, most of what I was going to chime in is similar to Bonnie, and actually there is quite a bit of data. Um, Sonia is really kind of our go-to around our, our reporting, and I'm not sure, though, that there are there is data specifically to every time they would call PD or not. We certainly could um, do a little bit more. I could do some digging and check in with Sonia and then follow up with all of you so that you have a sense of that. But I will tell you that, you know, our ambassadors are trained um, almost exclusively as welcoming and host-related services to allow visitors to feel um, like they get what they need downtown and directing people in the right directions and checking in with businesses to make sure that they also have the resources that they need as well. Thanks. And I would, I would add in just one thing is that that was actually the change we made um, two years ago from going from transition youth from the Rangers back to ambassadors was so that the ambassadors did have that friendly, welcoming, welcome to downtown um, approach. So, I, you know, I, I think that is one of the major changes and benefits that were specifically requested by downtown businesses is that they really wanted to have that friendly atmosphere. So that's one of the goals, and I think successfully um, achieved by the ambassadors downtown. Thank you. If I could just uh, say thank you, and if you know, if there is data available, it'd be great if you could just forward it along to us. Um, you know, not no need to spend a lot of time, but it would be helpful to to have that information, whatever you've got uh, available. Yeah. Thanks. Happy to. I would just add one thing that's not specific to the ambassadors, but it is specific to the data downtown, is that we do have a number of calls for service in downtown, um, so we do have that data available as well. Okay, uh, Councilmember Matthews. Mm -hmm. uh, please unmute. Yeah. Uh, Donna and I both sit on the Downtown Management Corporation Board, and we do get reports at every we meet every other month, and we do get 
pretty detailed data presented, and that's certainly available to you if you ask. And I, and I think just a brief phone call reviewing, more than just looking at it, but uh, also present at the meeting to give reports as part of the agenda. Someone from BC, but also social workers, outreach workers, um, other community resources available. Mm -hmm. So um, if you look at the numbers, um, they're not called out specifically by homeless, but uh, request for information. That's mostly from visitors. Uh, reporting of maintenance issues, abandoned by graffiti, a spill that needs to be cleaned up. So that's a huge amount of them. Um, uh, uh, maintenance needs, um, connecting to the businesses, um, informing them of news, what's happening, et cetera, uh, collaboration with the other resources. And when we hear, for example, the PV and the outreach worker talking with the um, hospitality workers, when there, when there are um, particular individuals who have some, some pre <laughs> Contrary to the impression that may have been given by the caller, uh, I would say the overall intention is to be uh, welcoming and helpful. And when people need services, get them connected. <laughs> Unmute yourself, Justin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, so is there any other um, council members would like to comment on this item at this time. Okay, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Bonnie, for bringing this forward. Okay, next item on our agenda is item number 25, monthly report on general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort and budget adjustments to appropriate SB2 grant funds. Presenters on this item are Sarah Noyes, Senior Planner, and Matthew Van Hoff, uh, Principal Planner. Whenever you're ready, yeah. can't hear your audio, Sarah, if you've started. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. I've had some trouble with my audio on my between my computer and my phone today, so I think I've got it sorted out now. Um, so what we're talking about today is um, this effort that was directed by the City Council starting last August to um, look at our current general plan, 2030 adopted general plan, and our zoning code, and look at the differences between those two documents and come up with a plan and a, a strategy for reconciling those differences. So 
For the benefit of our two new council members, I'm going to go through just a little bit of the background about how we got to this point of having a general plan and zoning code that aren't 100% in alignment with each other. Um, the city began work on the 2030 general plan in 2007 and with a little bit of background work beginning as early as 2004 and then the final plan, the, the plan that we currently operate under uh, was adopted in 2012. Um, the, the general plan was really focused, this 2030 update was really focused on a lot of sustainability goals. So think, some things that we, other, that we have come up through other topics today on your agenda. The vision of this plan was to focus on environmental, economic, and social sustainability and allow, which, you know, when we say sustainability in general, we mean allowing the current generation to meet its needs without forfeiting the ability of future generations to um, similarly meet their needs. One of the key features of these plan, this general plan, was a reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And um, one of the tools that was used to achieve that goal, and so reducing greenhouse gas emissions while also improving economic opportunity and providing opportunities for a variety of housing types, one of the key tools that was used for that was creating a set of mixed use land use designations that were new to the general plan. The city hadn't had any designations that were specifically reserved and envisioned for mixed use. And when we say that, we mean a mix of commercial uses and housing. So um, these then also, in, so again, in support of these goals of reducing GH greenhouse gas emissions and um, sort of supporting the nexus of creating good economic opportunities for folks and good housing opportunities, these new land use designations were focused around the primary transportation corridors in the city along Mission Street, Water Street, Ocean, and SoCal. So the zoning ordinance that we operate under also does allow for some mixed use, but the standards that are in that, in the zoning code, differ from the standards that are in the general plan. The zoning code, typically when a general plan is updated, the zoning code is updated, the, the zoning code is then also updated to match what's in the general plan. That process was never completed um, for Santa Cruz. And in, in fact, work was set aside on that project in 2017. And then in August of 2019, um, we got the council gave formal direction to cease work on that prior zoning effort, which was um, known as the corridors plan, and to begin work on a new effort that held as its um, priorities um, maintaining the integrity of existing residential neighborhoods, preserving existing local, local and city businesses, and focusing on creating opportunities for appropriate mixed use housing and affordable housing in appropriate locations throughout the city. So this report is the update for this month, um, for the month of May, on this reconciliation effort. And um, before we get too too much further into it, in the past, in past updates, we have kind of talked about this effort around a zoning amendment as a little bit separate from any effort we might have around a general plan amendment. And um, in sort of writing the RFP this past month and thinking through this project, um, I think it's more helpful to think of this as the reconciliation effort is an umbrella under which there are current, there's currently one project and the potential for a second. So when we're talking about reconciling two documents that govern the development of land that currently don't have 100% agreement, we can, we can amend either of those documents or both of those documents. So we could amend only the zoning ordinance, we could amend only the general plan, or we could amend both documents. Um, and at this point in time, um, we have these are distinct topics, the effort to amend the zoning code, which is our project for which we've uh, applied for an SB2 grant, and then a project that might consider changing the land use pattern that's envisioned by the general plan. So. Um, I just want to set that as the context that there is, you know, the project that we have initiated is a project to amend our zoning ordinance and um, hopefully identify some of these challenges that have caused some angst in the community and, um, and, and also kind of contributed to not very much development happening in some of these locations where we are, um, 
where we had envisioned multi or mixed use housing, multifamily housing happening. Um, and then there's, a, I want to distinguish that effort from another effort that might be making a significant change to the land use pattern that's envisioned for the general plan. Both of those efforts are about reconciling the um, current discrepancy between the two documents. So just my last little bit of background here. Um, in October, uh, some of you may recall that the council directed staff to apply for an SB2 grant, which will allow us to um, acquire consulting services to create objective standards for uh, multifamily and mixed use housing. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit on the next slide, what exactly that means. Um, we have signed the grant agreement with the state, so those funds are coming in and part of this um, Part of this effort today, or I'm sorry, part of the item today is to um, adopt the budget adjustment of $310,000 into the 2020, fiscal year 2020 budget for the planning department to um, acquire those services. Um, and then also in January of 2020, the uh, motion from the city council was to refer this item about you know considering changes to the land use pattern to the planning commission for them to provide some recommendations about um, how making a change to that land use pattern might impact the local economy and the environment for housing um, have them weigh in on um, the timeline for some kind of a general plan amendment and then consider how best to accomplish community engagement with appropriate breadth and depth for a process um, like that. So as we reported in February, staff was prepared to take this to the Planning Commission in March and um, because of the pandemic, all of those meetings were canceled. The meeting where this was scheduled to be heard in March was canceled. And so the Planning Commission has not at this point provided any recommendations to the City Council. And this additional time has, prov has allowed um, us as staff to really think through what's the best way to make sure that the Planning Commission really adds value to these processes and that we keep our um, public engagement, our community engagement really clear about the processes that are going forward. So we're gonna talk about that today also. So going into this, um, the, so focusing first on the zoning amendment. So this is a project that is launching that we are moving forward on. This is um, a project for which we have applied for grant funding, as I mentioned. The goal of this project would be to, to create some objective development standards that would apply to all multifamily housing. So multifamily housing that's residential only, multifamily housing that is part of a mixed use project at a whole range of densities. And um, our previous council members will recall that there was, there was a change in the state law at the beginning of 2020 that um, made this creation of objective standards much more relevant for all jurisdictions across the state. Essentially, we can't use subjective design criteria, which we are accustomed to using in Santa Cruz, um, to change the development capacity of a site. So if a site is zoned to allow 10 units, we have to have standards that really allow 10 units to actually be constructed on a property. So. Uh, because we don't have very many in our code, it's very important for us that we cr get these created, that we make sure they're really um, strong, robust, to the right standards that we wanna have, and that then we incorporate them into our zoning code as quickly as we can. So um, we've released the, the request for proposals, the RFP on this project, and we're, expect we're expecting our responses, or the responses are due, I should say, on June 19th. We're looking for proposals that really bring some creative points of view to a um, process like this, because what we do know about um, our community engagement process, given the current situation, is that it's not gonna look the same as it looked you know, last year. So we still are very committed to creating equitable community involvement. And so we're gonna be looking really carefully at these proposals to make sure that they're finding, finding ways to make sure that we're reaching all the sectors of the community that will really be affected by um, 
by the decisions that come out of it. You know, the, these projects, mixed use and multifamily projects, they really set the tone for a lot of our um, our built environment. So they are very, it's important that we hear from everyone who will live in these homes that are built, who will live near these homes that are built, who will move through these neighborhoods where these multifamily homes are built. So one of the, as we move into that work, one of the initial phases of that process um, will be establishing sort of the scope of parcels that are involved and then identifying um, among those parcels, where are we seeing parcels start to redevelop and where are we seeing parcels really, you know, kind of not turn over and not redevelop. Um, as we brought forward in the January update, um, staff has noticed that there haven't been as many um, development proposals submitted to the planning department for um, the parcels that were, where the land use designation was changed in the last general plan update to the mixed use high density. So um, this is a map that shows the scope, the, the parcels that are shown in color are the parcels that were changed to a mixed use designation in the last general plan update. The ones that are shown in orange are mixed use medium density or in that lighter orange are mixed use medium density. The ones in the darker orange are mixed use visitor commercial. And then the ones that are shown in brown are the mixed use high density designation. So as I mentioned earlier, the 2030 general plan created these land use designations and the intention was really to focus new growth, both economic and housing into places where transportation options could be maximized and creating both employment opportunities and housing opportunities while maintaining the existing single family residential neighborhoods that kind of surround all of that um, with established homeowners and renters. Um, so in looking at this map and thinking about how development has been happening under the current general plan, um, staff has noticed that only one of these mixed use high density sites has been entitled for development and we're wondering why. Um, part of the process of doing the zoning amendment is gonna kind of dig into what are the challenges that are happening on these properties? Like why aren't we seeing them, um, why aren't we seeing any interest in redevelopment? Because we are seeing that in the mixed use medium density and in the mixed use visitor commercial, we are seeing inquiries, we're seeing applications, um, you know, we're seeing new housing get entitled. Um, and ultimately we assume it will be built, but they're bringing forward um, proposals at this point. So we do anticipate that the Planning Commission will discuss um, these issues as we begin to sort of think about how we will address them through the zoning amendment um, and provide another venue for community input and engagement. The Planning Commission is really gonna be a component of the community outreach um, as we move forward with this zoning amendment project. So in thinking about this general plan amendment, as I mentioned, we really have seen this lack of proposals on the mixed use high density sites and we're wondering about them. So one of the, as through that analysis, it could be that um, staff and consultants kind of determine that some of these designations are unlikely to produce the housing that we know that the city needs um, and might indicate the benefit of creating some kind of uh, change to the planned development pattern, which would be uh, necessitate a, an amendment to the general plan. So um, a general plan amendment could be handled in a few, couple of ways. There could be a standalone general plan amendment process. Um, the an amendment sort of reallocating a number of housing units could be combined with the housing element update, um, which is we're applying for a grant to, to, some work has already begun on that. We're applying for a grant to complete that work that's later on your agenda today. And um, the housing element update will be due at the end of 2023. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, one option if, if a problem is kind of identified would be to, um, Keep that in mind as we move forward into the next general plan update process, which is currently anticipated to begin in 2025. Um, 
any time we think about amending the general plan, one of the first steps will be really establishing that scope and determining how far upstream the problem extends. You know, we know that the problem ends with these maps and these land use designations. These are the things that um, community members have really told us they don't feel comfortable with, particularly this mixed use high density. Um, and also, I, I think that we will learn through the zoning, the work that we do on the zoning amendment, um, we'll learn more about what we can do to address the concerns and really dig, dig down into what are those concerns. You know, we have um, this concept of protecting a neighborhood. What does that mean? You know, we held these focus groups in the fall and we had a variety of opinions on what what's a neighborhood, what does it mean to protect Thing? What are the features of a neighborhood that need to be protected? So there certainly is more work that would have to be done to figure out sort of where does the problem begin? Is it in one of our guiding principles? Is it in the goals, the policies? Um, sort of how far does it extend? And again, in that conversation, the Planning Commission will play a role as um, a venue for community outreach and in contributing also, um, you know, just their expertise and insight as um, longstanding members of the community. So that brings us to our recommendation, which this is printed on your packet. Um, I'll just read it into the record. We're looking for um, our, our recommendation is that the council direct staff to proceed with work on the objective standards for multifamily and mixed use housing for the city zoning ordinance, including an analysis, analysis to indicate the need and utility of a potential general plan amendment and direct staff to report back at key project milestones which require council input and decisions rather than reporting back on a monthly basis. And then second, adopt the resolution amending the fiscal year 2020 budget to appropriate the funds in the amount of um, $310,000 from the SB grant in order to purchase consultant services. And um, those of us with audio are here to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation. I'll turn it back to council uh, to see if there's any questions right now for staff. Council Member Myers. Um, I was on the planning commission for nine years, many years ago, but this is just a kind of um, deep, what do I want to say, gutsy stuff that was policy stuff that was wonderful to work on. And I, I think I heard you say something that the planning commission would be a partner in this. I, you went very fast and I didn't quite get it. So of course, obviously my question is, what is the role of the planning commission, seven people who throw themselves totally into planning issues? So, is that my question? Sure, yes, I'm happy to yeah. answer that. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, so I think there are a lot of ways the planning commission can really um, contribute and add value to this zoning amendment process. Um, in the same way that we will be bringing this item back to the city council for comment um, on, you know, at points when we have kind of a decision to make or when there's a key milestone, I can envision also bringing it simultaneously to the planning commission at, to also have a conversation. Um, and then also um, many processes like that um, include a technical advisory commission or a community advisory commission that um, meets on some kind of regular basis to do the work on the project. And should that kind of a um, advisory group be formed for the zoning amendment process, the planning, we would assume that, you know, some number of planning commissioners would be a part of that commission. Did, my last question, did this, uh, I'm sorry, you know, I'm fairly catching up on all this stuff. And maybe in yeah. the past, did this go, this actual item go to the Planning Commission for comment? What we're facing today? What no, no, the Planning oh. Commission has not has not reviewed this. This is our regular monthly update. It, they, these updates have been doing, we say monthly, oh. it's May, and the last time we were at the council was in February, and you know, the month of March and April got kind of eaten up by the pandemic, and um, so, Apologies for missing those, but uh, this item that's before you has not been to the Planning Commission. Well, that also answers, I kept seeing these words monthly update and I thought, well, I haven't heard of any. Okay, thanks. <laughs> right, right, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Sorry, 
Council Member Matthews. Um, I might just make a comment, uh, Mr. Catherine, because you asked if this had gone to Planning Commission, but. Uh, when the state law changed um, requiring um, a more, um, uh, well, actually um, requiring objective standards um, uh, mm -hmm. or just taking control completely out of the hands of local government, that issue came to the city council and uh -huh. council said yes. Rather than be given no local control, we could actually get focus on objective standards for a review of projects. And, and successfully applied for this grant to uh, bring in the consultants to do that. If we didn't develop the objective standards, then we're just, we have we have no say. We just got to approve what's submitted. So um, uh, that, that was a very clear direction that council gave to go back to the department and work on the objective standards as a priority. So Sarah, here's my, my question. Um, that, that's a really quick version. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Sarah, as I read the recommendation, it's um, um, the resolution to appropriate the funds to get going on the, um, to hire the consultant and then to direct staff to work on the objective standards and not to decide at this point whether or not to go for a general plan amendment, but as to work on the objective standards moves forward to, to assess somewhere in that process if it makes sense to also go for a general plan amendment as well. Have I understood that correctly? Yes, that's correct. We think that we are going to learn a lot through beginning work on this zoning amendment and um, that's going to provide really valuable information in determining whether um, and to what extent we might benefit from engaging in a general plan amendment. Okay. but it, at this point, we're not making a commitment one way or the other. We'll say let's launch this process project and see how it informs us. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other questions on this item from council members? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll turn it over to members of the public for public comment. If there are any members of the public that would like to speak to us on item number 25, the monthly report on general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort and budget adjustment to appropriate SB2 grant funds, um, please call the number that is on your screen if you haven't done so already. Uh, once you've entered the meeting, you'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the time will be set to two minutes. And it looks like we have our first caller on the line. Hi, again, this is Candace Brown from East Morrissey. Um, I'm really happy that this is moving forward because there is a need, as, as um, Sarah mentioned, for objective standards. It would allow some level of control and uh, because of the new housing policies. But I also wanted to mention that it's really important to understand why um, many projects that were assumed would be built along Oakella Water didn't happen. Part of it had to do with the Corridor Advisor Committee, which revealed that these parcels were quite narrow compared to, let's say, downtown or Ocean Street. There wasn't the 20, 30 year investment in infrastructure to go along with the high density. There weren't parklets, there weren't accommodations for the businesses, and the street lists were varied. And in fact, in order to do a street, a complete street, you would have to basically completely gut the east side or midtown, as some call it, and uh, that would be, you know, impacting many beloved parts of our community. There was a petition of 300 businesses owners on Ocean Water and Soquel that signed a petition in order to pull this back, along with thousands of uh, people from the community. So again, I think this is an important step to. Um, to reflect and from everything that we've learned and also to ensure that there is both business and community involvement from um, people east of the river on these kind of projects in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll give another minute for other members of the public to weigh in. Um, so if you're 
you're watching or listening and you'd like to speak to us on item number 25, now is the time to please call in. Once you've entered the meeting, you'll want to hit star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you'll be given two minutes to speak. the work you've done and the thoughtfulness about how to how to develop a process that really uh, does involve the public in a meaningful way and I think it does it absolutely makes sense to uh, to report back to the council on project milestones where we need to make decisions rather than on a monthly basis um, so yeah I, thank you for uh, raising that I also think it's really important to clarify the role of the Planning Commission, and so I, um, you know, I understand that this is a work in progress, but I'd like to uh, try to solidify that today. So um, I'm going to make a motion, which uh, and and the city clerk has a copy of it. I don't know if it's possible, Bonnie, for you to put that up right now, um, so pe we, people can read along. I, I, we, so, we make motions that sometimes get a little confusing, so I just wanted to be really clear here about what I'm proposing. Um, so the first part is uh, just at, you know, as per the staff recommendation to, um, so I'll move that we, one, direct staff to proceed with work on the objective standards for multifamily and mixed use housing, et cetera, as proposed by staff, and to adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 2020 budget to appropriate funds in the amount of $310,000 from the SB2 grant to purchase consultant services with additional direction as follows. Uh, so three, uh, I'd like to request that the Planning Commission establish a subcommittee to fully participate throughout the proposed process by working closely with staff and the consultant on the task outlined in the staff report. Um, I think that's really important. We have a, these commissions for a reason and um, they really do spend much more time than we have available to us uh, to, uh, to dive into these things. And four, in the consideration of a general plan amendment, I think it's important to reaffirm, uh, you know, we have, a, we have uh, the council has voted to make sure that these are priorities in this process. And I think um, that restating that is important. So um, in consideration of general plan amendments um, to in the future, uh, policy, include policies affirming that the city's first priority is protection of neighborhoods and small business and maximizing affordable housing opportunities that those should be incorporated. We have a motion made by Councilmember Brown. Councilmember Matthews, I saw your hand has gone up. Were you, um, why were you wanting to make a motion? I had a question. I was prepared to move the initial recommendation. Um, Councilmember Brown. I was going to second, uh, second the motion, if I may. Okay. So we have a motion. Yeah. Councilmember Brown's motion. We have a motion yeah. by Councilmember Brown, right. seconded by Councilmember Byers. Um, Could I speak to that? Sure. Or should I wait? Well, you know, I was asking staff at the beginning, and my, my mind was going around because they mentioned something about an, an advisory body down the road. It was it just happened too fast, uh, and I, was, I kept thinking, well, wait a minute, you've got seven people who dive into all these planning issues. Why don't we use them as rather um, adjunct to this whole process? So I think uh, I think Councilmember Brown's motion certainly covered that for me. So I certainly wholeheartedly endorse it. Um, Councilmember Matthews. I, I will then um, weigh in. 
having also served on the Planning Commission for a million years in my day, I appreciate the role of the Planning Commission, and it seems to me that as the objective standards work goes forward, that that is entirely logical that that, be, that involves the full Planning Commission. It seems to me that that's appropriate. Regarding the general plan amendment, we don't know at this point whether or not or how that that component uh, relates to the objective standards. So I think that's um, a premature um, motion there, and um, so I, I can't support that part of it. I, gosh, I'm, um, I want to move something off my screen here. Um, I would just say um, uh, request that the Planning Commission be involved uh, working with consultants in the development of the objective standards. Um, I, I may, might even ask the Planning Director, uh, does that not seem um, a logical role for them going forward? Thank you, Councilmember Matthews and Mayor Cummings. Lee Butler, I'm the Planning Director, and we actually had this conversation with the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission um, had a discussion about whether or not they should form a subcommittee, and um, at that time, they declined to do so, and that was really on the advice of us uh, as planning staff in that um, when we get these responses back to the RFP, there may be a wide variety of ways in which the Planning Commission may be involved, whether it's a technical advisory committee, as uh, uh, Sarah Noisy pointed out, and a subcommittee of the Planning Commission could be involved with that. But certainly as a body as a whole, they will also be involved in um, providing um, recommendations to the council and also serving as a uh, a means by which additional community outreach is achieved. And so um, we do believe that, that forming a Planning Commission subcommittee at this point is premature given that we haven't gone out to, um, uh, to hear uh, what responses we get back from the RFP. Um, when we do bring the actual uh, contract award to the council, uh, which is expected in August, we would have additional information at that time that would inform us more about the, um, the process that the uh, winning uh, response to the RFP um, proposes, as well as how we would be involving the Planning Commission um, throughout that process. Okay, uh, council members, buyers. If, um, I was just trying to think of the words, but uh, so we'll, look, we'll know a lot more in the fall when we get the consultant on board, what, what the process should be. Um, and you, everyone's used the word involve the planning commission, but I guess what I'm hearing is you're asking us to wait till then. Maybe it will take a subcommittee. Maybe it will take the whole commission to come up with standards. Is that correct? Are you just asking us to sort of delay this decision or this motion? Thank you, Councilmember Byers. What I would say related to this is um, part of what we discussed with the Planning Commission uh, when they considered this was that if there is specific direction um, or if the Planning Commission themselves had already formed a subcommittee, that could potentially limit the creativity that um, comes back as part of the RFP. So the uh, responses to that RFP could involve some very creative ways to engage the Planning Commission, um, either through a subcommittee or um, just as, as a body during the process in terms of check-ins. Um, uh, in advance of bringing uh, policy decisions to the council. And if there were a, a, a subcommittee that had been formed, then you know, the, the responses that we get will likely um, cater to that format, whereas uh, another uh, format may actually come out. Um, and even if the winning bidder uh, or if the, the winning proposal doesn't include um, the, the creative use of the Planning Commission, 
there isn't anything to say that um, we couldn't take that winning bid and say, hey, you know what, we, we had a really creative idea for how we might engage the planning commission as a whole or as a subcommittee or as a technical advisory committee, whatever it may be. Um, and do you think you could do that as part of your project? And so that was one of the reasons why um, we suggested that we, we don't um, make that um, make that leap right now, and that we wait and see what we get from those uh, responses, and then um, identify the the best way to engage either a subcommittee or the planning commission as a whole, and uh, or a technical advisory committee, or likely some combination of that altogether. Just so I understand this, so at some planning commission in the past few months. They had the idea, but, and you discouraged them, did they just leave it at that? You discouraged them at this time not to have a subcommittee. Is that what I understood? That's correct. Okay, yeah. but we'll wait till, we'll wait till the R person comes on board. Okay, I understand. And in August, we'll be returning to you. We're expected to come back to you in August with the responses to the RFP. Um, and a contract, at that point in time, we should have a better understanding of how we can involve the Planning Commission and the, the ways in which we would be doing so. Okay, yeah, I get it now. Okay, uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, uh, so just uh, thank you for the response. Um, I'm just going to say, you know, I, I think that um, it's, well, let's see, let's see how to say it. So we form committees, council committees all the time. I feel like um, we often end up doing better work when a smaller group of members of the council can get together, roll up their sleeves, work with staff, um, and sometimes others in uh, consultants, et cetera. And the, in crafting recommendations. And so I don't see why this uh, would be any different. I think um, nothing that a subcommittee does would be, a, be the official uh, line of, of the entire planning commission. It's just an, you know, a decision to create some opportunity for the planning commission members who are, are so inclined to really uh, dive in and be more involved in this process uh, in between uh, uh, formal commission meetings. So I, and I don't see how doing this now would uh, necessarily um, limit the innovation of a, of a consultant. I feel like that, that would be worked on together. Um, and so I'm gonna stick with my, um, my uh, original motion. I understand the idea that it may be premature, but I, I don't think it necessarily is because we're not directing them to take a particular position or do anything in particular other than be involved in the process. So the principle is really the same whether we do it now or in August. So I'd like to stick with uh, the, the proposal to um, allow the Planning Commission to, or give them the space to set something up they can begin to determine, uh, along with staff, how that that work would be done, and one and a consultant once they're on board. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I just wanted to uh, thank the staff um, on this item. Um, <clears throat> they. The staff report was really well written, and I think it just continues to bring up the just the difficulty of um, really what 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 kind of occurred over the last several years, which is you know a general plan designation, um, the rollout of the update to the zoning ordinance, and then you know um, just this lack of lack of cohesion in our community. Uh, and I think that the interesting part of the staff report for me was really uh, identifying this, this, you know, diving deeper into really what, what does it look right? What looks, um, 
in terms of these these mixed use designations, why why are we getting some places where we are getting those kinds of projects brought forward, but in other places, most notably neighborhoods uh, on the east side, you know, why those those are not those types of proposals are not coming in? And I think exploring that with this consultant and um, having the time to really dig back into that is is useful. And I think um, Sarah, you sort of you sort of summed up uh, your re the staff report with that visual that you put on, in your presentation, which is, you know, wh what does the future of housing, our housing uh, mix look like? Um, and so I think, um, although I agree with number four in the motion, I think, I think we've said that many times through various motions over the last year and a half. Um, and I think that Overall, our general plan policies support these concepts, um, and certainly, as we get into our housing element, that will be um, that will be become apparent as well. Um, I'm also it's hard to um, ignore the fact that legislation is literally being written right now. The Senate in California has come forward with another housing package. Um, housing in general is just a moving target in California. I think for the next several years, and so. Um, I think that the clarity of having the, the work done by the consultants get started, um, have them begin to really dive into um, the work with the objective standards, with this lens and the ability to do this additional analysis. Um, I think it makes sense right now. I'm, uh, so I think item number four on, on the motion, um, I'm not sure that it that provides additional direction at this time. Um, and at this point, I um, also can't support the establishment of a, of a subcommittee at, at this point in time in the process. Um, it's very it's very close to, you know, most commissions and committees also taking the month of July off. We'll be into August and September before we know it. And I think it's important for the um, the staff to work with the consultant, um, bringing you know necessary updates to the planning commission. But I think um, creating a subcommittee at this point is a little preemptive to to the process. So I appreciate the intent um, and I appreciate the work of the planning commission. But I'd like to see a little more time before we we do that step. Um, the the uh, remaining parts of the. Um, of the motion as recommended in the staff report, though I would uh, I would be supportive. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, I'd like to ask if the maker of the motion would consider um, uh, changing item three um, to um, at the time the RFPs come back to the council for action, um, uh, the council at that time reconsider the role of the uh, planning commission planning commission subcommittee and or technical advisors in uh, working with the consultants you get that yeah um well you know I, I actually feel a little bit uncomfortable with that because i i feel like uh giving providing this authorization does not mean that they're going to like set up a subcommittee tomorrow and start working and then all of a sudden go on a break. I mean, this is gonna take some time uh, to move forward on. And so, so I, I, again, I'm just having a hard time seeing how the structure of a committee like this is going to um, either derail or undermine, or I think um, preempt was the word used, um, the process in some way. I just feel like this is uh, an attempt to involve the planning commission in a meaningful way in the discussion rather than just kind of at the public meetings, uh, hosting public engagement and um, getting recommendations what to, to review. So I think it's just, it's a request to have more meaningful participation from the planning commission. And um, I'd like to see that decision be made today if it, you know, if my colleagues do not agree, then I'm happy to revisit it in the future, but I'd like to stick with this right now. Uh, Mayor Cummings, if we could have Council Member Matthews repeat her friendly amendment. Uh, yes, well, I requested for uh, the amendment and I can make it as an official amendment. 
uh, is necessary. For, for the purpose of the minutes, can you restate yeah, your initial? Yeah. When the RFPs um, are brought back to council for action, um, at that time, the council considered the full uh, the planning commission, a planning commission subcommittee, and or a technical advisory committee in working with consultants on development of the objective standards. Thank you. And if I could just say at this point, I feel that this is a really big issue and it should involve the entire planning commission. I think this is what the planning commission does. So uh, if my proposal is not acceptable, then I would like to ask that the maker divide the motion so we can divide, so we can vote on the uh, initial part one and two separately from three and four. Would you like to respond? Well, I believe that's uh, that's the pleasure of the mayor. So I, I'm fine with it. Okay. Well, then why don't we um, divide the motion and we can vote on each of the pieces independently. Um, and then there's a few council members who have uh, further comments. So um, if you, since the council member Matthews, do you have any further comments? Um, I, no, I think. They, um, the maker was not willing to take my suggestion for a substitution. At this point, we'll divide the motion if you're willing. Okay. Council Member Watson. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't um, repeat any of the comments. I, I guess I'll just say I, I really agree with a lot of the um, sentiments behind Vice Mayor uh, Myers response to how to move forward and interest in trying to kind of um, move in an informed way that's going to allow us to uh, kind of evolve and knowing that this will come back, I, I too support dividing the motion. That was going to be my recommendation as well. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Byers. Real quick um, for Council Member Matthews, did you say a subcommittee and or a technical advisory committee? Is that in the motion or your amendment? That was what I suggested, that at the time that the RFP yes. for action, that we would consider the involvement of any of those three okay. individually okay. or in combination. Okay. Just, yeah, I just want to understand those words. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Um, Bonnie, could you scroll down so that we could see all four motions? Okay, can you scroll up just a tiny bit since the bottom of number four got cut off? Okay, great. Okay, so if there's no further discussion, we'll uh, vote on each of the motions before us independently. So the first motion is to direct staff to proceed with work on the objective standards for multifamily and mixed use housing projects for the city zoning ordinance, including analysis to indicate the need and utility of a potential general plan amendment. Including this motion is also to direct staff to report back at key project milestones which require council input and decisions rather than reporting back on a monthly basis. And so I'll, I will ask the clerk to please um, take the roll vote on that first item. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye, that passes unanimously. Second uh, part of the motion, adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 2020 budget to appropriate funds in the amounts of $310,000 from the SB2 grant in order to purchase consultant services. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye, that passes unanimously. 
Uh, the third motion before us requests that the Planning Commission establish a subcommittee to fully participate throughout the proposed process by working closely with staff and the consultants on the task outlined in the staff report. So we'll take a vote on this as well. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? No. Brown? Brown, we couldn't hear your vote. Oh, sorry, I. Holder? No. Watkins? Not at this time, no. Vice Mayor Myers? Uh, no. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that. Hold on. Hang on one sec. I'm sorry. What, was that on two or three? Sorry, I. No, I no. That was on three. Okay, yeah, mine's a no vote. Okay, so that motion fails uh, with um, Council Member Byers, Brown, and Cummings voting in favor, and Council Members Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, Council Member Golder, and Council Member Watkins voting in opposition. The last um, piece of this motion is the fourth part, which is in the consideration of a general plan amendment, policies affirming that the city's first priority is the protection of neighborhoods and small businesses and maximizing affordable housing opportunities to be incorporated. Council Member Byers. Catherine, you're muted. Sorry. Aye. Matthews? No. Brown? Aye. Holder? No. What? Uh, no, not at this time. Vice Mayor Myers? I'm going to vote no. And for the record, uh, I, I don't, it's not that I don't support the intent of the language in this. I feel that this language has been brought forward in many other motions regarding uh, this particular. Um, item uh, and work of the planning com of the, of the, with the uh, general plan uh, reconciliation process. So I'd just like that for the record. Thank you. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. And so that um, portion of the motion fails as well with council members, Byers, Brown and Cummings voting in favor um, and Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, council member Golder and council member Watkins voting opposed. Okay, that concludes um, that item and moves us on to our next item of business, which is item number 26, the 2020 Local Early Action Program State Planning Grant Application. So for members of the public who are streaming, um, if you'd like to comment on this item now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff for council members who brought this forward, all by questions from council. We will then take public comment and return to the council for deliberation and action. And so with that, I'll turn it over to senior planner, Catherine Donovan, for the presentation. Good evening. I um, apologize, my computer is a little slow here, so bear with me. Okay. using on the previous project, the LEAP grant that we're now talking about, and a REAP grant, which is a regional early action planning grant, which we will probably be talking about um, in six months or so. The early action planning grant program uh, is a non-competitive um, grant 
that is available to eligible jurisdictions, which basically just means you have to be in good standing to have um, submitted your required um, housing reports and similar things. Um, it's, the funding amount is based on population, and the City of Santa Cruz is eligible for $300,000 it's a reimbursable grant similar to the SB2, and the applications are due July 1st. The program goals for this particular grant are to accelerate housing production and facilitate compliance with the implementation of the sixth cycle of the Regional Housing Needs Assessment. Um, and the projects that we're proposing to fund, the main, the main project for this grant that we're hoping um, to complete is the update of the housing element for 2024 through 2032. Um, however, we don't know if we will use the entire grant for that purpose, and so to be on the safe side in case we manage to save some money, um, we're also proposing to use it for the objective standards for multifamily housing and mixed-use housing in um, case they need extra money to finish that project and or for the expansion of the downtown plan boundaries. And this is sort of our fallback position that we've been trying to update that for many years now. Um, our recommendation is to uh, that the City Council vote to authorize the City Manager or his designee to submit an application to the State Housing and Community Development Department for the LEAP grant, for the LEAP planning grant. And I realize I ran through that very quickly, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, I don't have any questions, um, but I would be um, ready to make a motion um, after um, any other council have questions and then public comment. Thank you. Any council members have questions on this item at this point in time? Okay. Hearing none, um, at this point in time, if members of the public are interested in commenting on this item, uh, please call at this point. In, at, please call in now. Uh, after you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and you will be given two minutes. interested in commenting on this item, I'll bring it back to Council for action deliberation. So Vice Mayor, Ma Vice Mayor Myers, I know you said that you, would, you were prepared to make a motion. Yeah. Yeah. I will go ahead and move the staff recommendation. Uh, and adopt the resolution directing staff to submit an application to the State of California Local Early Action Program, Planning Grant Program, to contribute funding towards the city's 2024 to 2032 housing element update. Um, Council Member Matthews, I saw you had your hand up next. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to second that, and I'm assuming it includes that language authorizing the city manager. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I just, this is just a question, actually. Um, does this uh, grant, uh, should we be getting it, um, does that uh, help just fund our own staff positions or consultant assistance or any combination as needed? This is just a question since we're looking at budgets <laughs> in the immediate future. Yeah, at this time, given the shortage of staff that we have, we're, aiming towards hiring a consultant for okay. the work. That, that was my 
was just an honest question. Yeah, thank you. There is no further questions at this time or comments. I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll and vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, seeing, seeing as how we have um, <laughs> communications at time certain of six and we haven't had a break. Why don't we take a break and What's the time? Okay. Sorry. What did you say was a time certain? Oral communications. We had that at on or around six o'clock. Oh. If that matters. Okay. Well, since we have about eight minutes, why don't we come back at six for oral communications and then uh, depending on the turnout, we might have another break before our evening session. Okay. Yeah. See you all in about eight minutes. Yep. Okay. Council members, once you're back, if you could please turn on your video at a minimum so we know that you're here, it'll be helpful. Our 6 p.m. session, the May 26, 2020 meeting of the City Council. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Council Member Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Holder? Present. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers. I just saw it on. Donna, I'm you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm here pushing the wrong things. Um, I am here and yeah, I'm here. <laughs> and Mayor Cummings. Here. Uh, the next item on our agenda is oral communications. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on items that are not on our agenda. If you're interested in addressing the council, please call the number that you see on your screen. If the first number you call is busy, please try other numbers until you get through. 
Um, if you're interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone once you've entered the meeting to raise your hand and you will have two minutes to speak. With your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that has been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making the comment so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minute. However, it is not required. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We will not engage in dialogue. At table, we will address the questions raised at the end of oral communication. And I'd like to ask uh, Robert Norris from Huff has uh, reached out to us early to request four minutes. So Robert Norris, if you're listening, when it's your time to speak, please um, make yourself known so that we can give you the appropriate amount of time. And with that, I will start oral communications. Okay, you're on the line. Hi, this is Robert Norris, yes, of Huff Homeless United again. Uh, May 10th uh, was declared Police Appreciation Week, and indeed, I've heard they were giving out several dozen sandwiches a week at some point, and I'm glad to hear that. However, Food Not Bombs recently celebrated its 40th anniversary, and it serves hundreds of people many hours a day. And it's time, that, it's time the mayor acknowledged this and declared next week uh, Food Not Bombs Appreciation Week. Uh, they've taken action. They've provided food, motel vouchers, survival services when the police contributions were forced illegal relocations and fences. City Council, as well as its predecessors, has a regular habit of rubber stamping the staff's presentations. This is another concern I have. In the current COVID crisis, city managers' edict seriously threatening the health and welfare of those outside have, without exception or debate, received a thumbs up from a complacent, complaisant, and compliant city council. This is a dangerous situation in a community that wants real democratic process, public input, and a significant discussion of important issues. Do your jobs. We have heard the mayor's regular announcement gagging any public input, comment, or questions on what is probably the most important section of the public meeting, reports by the city manager and the city attorney. We heard it again today if we were listening. There is no public questioning of these powerful people and the staff they work with whose frequently reactionary agenda reflects the interests of its own bureaucracy, private developers, select and favored nonprofits, and its own powerful department heads. Now, last year, several council members tried to let some air and light into this process. They tried to take the agenda-making process out of the back room. There was even rumors of a progressive majority on the city council at that time. But apparently, one person, Mayor Cummings, turned the other way, and now, of course, he's even lost that powerful, pivotal position, as we see by his failure to be able to get votes today, although I'm glad to see he's trying. To reverse the gentrification agenda driving longtime Santa Cruz renters out of town is still a big priority. It's, it's taken a global pandemic to get officials to begin even limited gestures toward the basic sanitary and life necessities for those without shelter outside, gestures that are likely to disappear once business as usual is reinstituted. Council members Glover and Crone were punished, silenced, and evicted by the powerful interests whose narratives they challenged. Long presentations by staff members with no possibility of questions to be asked and answered from the public does us and the council no favors. While in its way, survival encampments, particularly autonomous resident-run encampments, have been a long-time need and demand of activist progressive social service providers, of whom there are damn few in Santa Cruz, and of course folks outside themselves. The Benchland encampment, initiated as previous encampments have been by homeless people themselves. Also, but what have we got that we need now, and that's what I'm bringing to your attention, or what they need. I'm indoors myself. Also, lack, we have a lack of accessible potable water as of a few days ago, lack of electrical access so homeless people can charge their phones, have access to services and to the latest COVID-19 updates. These are unmet needs ignored by the city manager as well as the obvious flooding problem in the bench lands which may be coming up soon, which seriously impacts them. City Council needs to jump ahead and direct the city manager to provide the motel rooms for all who need them during this crisis, and he needs to be directed to address
address the needs of a number of those currently outside, providing the recharging, sanitary, and water needs that obviously impact their health and the health of the entire community. We're being told this is all an emergency. Well, has any council member do have the ovaries or the balls to stand up and make an emergency resolution, given the fact that none of these facts were presented by the manager earlier? Thank you. Thank you. Again, for members of the public who are listening, this is oral communications portion of the city council meeting. If you've called in and you'd like to speak to us on oral communications or on items that are not on our agenda, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be unmuted um, when it's your time to speak. Okay, next uh, community member, you're on the line. Okay, this is Garrett Phillip. When monarchs ruled the self anointed authority coming straight from God, or the Roman Emperor Maximus declared, All I survey is mine, that was one way to run an empire. Today, we will just have to be satisfied with people being told they need security. The government provides the chains, and then they are secure in them. Besides, the continuing COVID kill switch lockdown response is very helpful to the totalitarian collectivist socialists, communists, and leftists, because if it doesn't work, they can argue for an even bigger government footprint savaging self-responsibility, liberty, and demand even more subservience to the all-wise, even bigger beneficent central authority. It's also quite helpful backdrop to generating big pharma riches, a conduit for the congressional pork stuffers to distribute fortunes in ruinous debt, a chance to blame economic doom on the other political party for political gain, to attack freedom, promote debt slavery, blame capitalism, and bail out the bad actor corporations. Liberty, your job, and a lot of us are now deemed personally non-essential and everyone else that is subjugating gets a hero's check. Never mind this until we're safe mean actually means never because we are never safe. Your life is not about being safe. Never mind control is but an illusion and life is but a journey. And don't get caught saying that any more than taking a prohibited walk on the beach between 11 and 5 p.m. Never mind children have few symptoms and really very few die of COVID. Their personal growth is now permanently altered and they'll be the ones involuntarily inheriting the unimaginable debt dollars we burn like trash now and so suffer from inflation produce wants and suffer the ever increasing wealth inequality jet fuel of inflation. Keep saying this is the new normal even if nothing about this is normal. I'd like to be a member of an institutionally sociopathic ruling elite caste uh, also, but it looks like one needs to be Pelosi's nephew to be in that club or a megalomaniac monopolist with a healthcare dominance ambition. The hospitals are now empty because people are afraid to go, skipping needed health care and apparently brainiacs aren't available to figure out how to safely get a haircut. I see my time is up. Bye. Okay, if there's any member of the public who would like to address us on items that are not on our agenda, now's the time to call in and please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Okay, you have two minutes. Thank you for calling. Hello, my name's Karen Baer, and I'm a resident and employee of the city of Santa Cruz. And I'm proud to be part of the SEIU 521. This is a time when the city of Santa Cruz and all California needs public services and more jobs, not less. Just like a family that is short on cash needs to raise funds that are needed to thrive, we need to raise funds to invest in a healthy future for Santa Cruz. We in SCIU 521 are advocating with our campaign, invest in a healthy future to now. We'll, we will fight for federal aid to support state and local governments. We have already begun to do this with our union brothers and sisters and SCIU Local 521 and advocate for the HEROES Act, which includes $1 trillion in federal stimulus for state and local governments as well as hazard pay for essential workers. This bill has already passed the U.S. House of Representatives, now in the state Senate, or excuse me, U.S. Senate, needs to vote on this bill, and we are doing everything we can to support it, even contacting voters in Arizona to tell their senator to vote yes. We want to partner with the city to advocate and lobby for the HEROES Act so we can invest in our city's economy and keep people working. 
As city workers, we have done our part when the last recession hit. This coming recession may be avoided altogether if partnered together to advocate for funding, and we make decisions based on the facts when it is time. The time to implement furlough is not now. We must evaluate actual impacts of COVID-19 on our city and look for options before we decide to cut. Some actions may include ensuring all departments are tracking expenditures for the purpose of drawing down federal funds and conducting audits of all departments, reevaluating the need for existing consulting contracts, reevaluating management structure to give, given the increase in telework. Includes. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your time today. Yes. Yeah. All right, next caller. Yes, hello. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I'm just going to read something I wrote a couple days ago. By Dane Wigington, November 16, 2019, presentation number 223, 10 wars are upon Earth's biosphere. This pandemic has produced at least these two results. One, established what seems like an almost trillion dollar funding for even more surveillance capitalism. And make no error and either do your own research or inquire for me hundreds of links to the nefarious goals of the already patented vaccines. Two, the propaganda machines have placed fear and blind fiduciary trust in most citizens. Further, our children will be affected the most, then teachers and law enforcement and emergency responders, along with those who work in hospitals. As World War II never ended, the ABCs of war, see Cliff High, now have wireless weapons installed in all the above, street lights and home technologies. As such, the next biological warfare, 36-month cycle wave, will magnify cubed with the actual weapons, I put on my glasses, very few deaths from this bioweapon. Anyone can find my post and listen to my statements in Santa Cruz City Council about wireless weapons, weapons technologies released in 1976, 8,500 declassified documents from the U.S. Military, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and the Surgeon General. I will include this information about other various serious issues going on with life on Earth by Dane Wigington, April 25th, 2020. I will say this again about this sham. The shutdown has already greatly affected the global, the global food supply chain. If that is not remedied very soon, Agenda 21, 2030, clearly established in Santa Cruz County in 1993, will achieve most of its goals at least six years early. And yes, I welcome questions and remarks from those too fearful to start thinking for their grandchildren's grandchildren. Thank you, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Yeah. Okay, if there's any member of the public that would like to speak to oral communication, please press star nine on your phone uh, so you can raise your hand and we can uh, recognize you. Okay, seeing no new members of the public interested in uh, speaking to us on oral communications, I'll conclude oral communications at this time. Uh, however, before we move on, um, I just wanted to point out that after we had voted on item number 15, uh, I received an email from a public works director. One of the points, the concerns I had was um, having this that item go to the um, Transportation and Public Works Commission, and it turns out that um, at the request of the commission, they held a meeting on October 18th, or October 21st, 2019, at Galt Elementary School, where um, this project, along with a number of other projects, were uh, on display for the community to weigh in on. And so given that, um, we were able to understand that this did go back to the commission and there was further public uh, engagement. I'd be willing to reconsider uh, my vote on that item. Councilmember Myers. Uh, I would make a motion to reconsider item number 15. 
based on the information that you just provided, and I also was able to read the email that was provided as well. Okay, I'll second that motion. Um, Council Member Byers. Uh, no, nothing. Uh -uh. Okay. No question. Okay, so. Um, Actually, I do have a question. Sure. Sorry. I do have a question. I mean, that's exactly what Chris told us earlier. My understanding from earlier was that the, he wasn't sure what date it was. Date it was oh, it was the yeah. date that was concerned for. Yeah. But, but, the, but it is true the commission never sat down as seven commissioners and heard the project and took a vote. It looks, my, my understanding from the email that we received is that the request of the Transportation and Public Works Commission was that they hold this meeting and that this project be a part of that. So I understand that, but instead, okay, so. Well, that's my understanding from the email and that it did. Yeah, I, un I understand that too. That's what he said all along. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll call, we'll have a roll call to reconsider. What are we reconsidering? Well, just to confirm, this is a this is a vote to reconsider the item, and then you'll take a revote. Oh, okay. Item. Thank you. Yeah, I got it. Okay, thank you. I wasn't ready for that. Uh, Council Member, hold on. Byers. No. Matthews. Matthews? Aye. Brown? No. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that motion passes with Council Members Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, Council Member Golder. Councilmember Watkins and Mayor Cummings voting in favor with council members Byers and Brown voting opposed. So now I, I guess the, the, what we would do next is um, I need a motion from council members to um, on item number 15. Council member, Vice Mayor Myers. I will make a motion to, I'm sorry, the language one more time. Move the staff recommendations. For, yep, yeah. hang on one sec. My computer is frozen. Um, okay. I'm happy to make that motion. Go ahead, uh, council member. Watkins, I'm sorry, my computer is just froze up on me here. Is that is, is that okay, Mayor? Sure. Okay, we'll go ahead and move the recommendation for item number 15, the Highway 19 intersection improvement. Approve the plans and specifications for the Highway 19 intersection improvements and authorize staff to advertise for bids. Motion to approve the construction management services request for the qualifications and advertise for proposals. And motion to approve an amendment to the contract with BKF engineers for additional environmental right of way permitting design construction support services and authorize the city manager to execute the agreement in the form approved by the city attorney authorize the director of public works to execute change orders within the approved budget. Okay, so motion by council member Watkins. I'll go ahead and second that. Um, council member Matthews. I was just gonna second that. Okay. Council Member Byers. I am so sorry. I'm just going to muddle things. What was the last vote we took? I, my uh, computer froze up just for a few seconds after I spoke. So what was the motion? Do you want to finish this one and go to that? But I need to know what that first motion was about. Not about, but what it was. The first motion was in order to have a, a second vote on an item, um, you have to make a motion to reconsider, which was the first motion that we made. And now what we're voting on is item number 15. So how do I change my vote? I would have voted yes on the first one. Of course, I don't mind. 
Yeah, me too. I, I missed that. Okay. Oscar, Oscar, Tony, City Clerk. Yes, I want to vote yes to reconsider. The motion for reconsideration is on, yes. the, on the table for all three motions, and so um, the council can just take a roll call vote on all three motions at this point. And if a council member decides to change their vote, um, they may do so. Tony, I think the question was um, that Council Members Brown and Council Member Byers were fine with um, reconsidering reconsideration. Okay. I mean, it wasn't clear. So, how would they be able to change their vote to yes for the reconsideration? Oh, that the the answer to that question is that um, while uh, a council member who is in the minority on a on an item that's before the council cannot make the motion to reconsider, um, the council member may vote on the motion and should they choose to do so, change their vote. Uh, Mayor Cummings, if I may, we'll just make note in the minutes that council members Byers and Brown, it'll reflect that their vote was to reconsider. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, just the other way. So a council, a council member who voted yes at the beginning, they could, couldn't they take action to reconsider and then we all vote? They can, they can make a motion to reconsider, right? And, and that's what was done. That's right. No, it's just gonna reflect in the minutes. Oh, I mean, it's, it's close enough in time if a council member I think at this point wants to express a vote in favor, um, as Bonnie indicated, that could just Okay, be okay. I'm, I apologize for my inattention, but I was knee deep in the next uh, agenda. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Um, Council Member Colder. I was just gonna say, if Catherine wants me to make a motion to like re, I don't even know how to word it, re-vote the last vote so that she could vote yes and Sandy could vote yes, I mean, that motion. <laughs> we can go around again. Okay. That would be a motion to consider, to reconsider the motion to reconsider. <laughs> Good practice. Are we ready to vote? Okay, I think so. Councilmember Byers. Aye. Matthews. I'm assuming we're voting on the motion to approve the staff report now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Aye. Brown. Sorry, I'm now I am confused. Me too. We're the the vote is now on the on the Highway 19 item that we voted on earlier today. So the substantive that's right. the substantive yeah. motion. Okay. I'm I'm going to vote no on that. Yes, me too. I, I, I thought we were voting on reconsideration. Okay, only. so just to, so that we are aware for the minute, we have a motion to reconsider, um, which passed, and now we are back on 15, the okay. staff recommendation. Thank you, Bonnie. Yes. My vote is no. I may have said yes, but no, yeah. So, Matthews? Aye. Brown? No. Golder? Yes. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that motion passes with Council Members Matthews. Vice Mayor Myers, Council Member Golder, Council Member Watkins, myself voting in favor, Council Members Byers and Brown voting opposed. Okay, and that, um, I guess we have a few minutes um, if anybody needs to quickly take a bio break um, and then we can start with our, six, our evening general business item. Thank you, Renee.
next up on our agenda is item number one, general business, uh, resolution ratifying slash confirming Director of Emergency Services, Executive Orders, numbers 2020-07 through 2020-09, and the presenter for this item is our City Attorney, Tony Condotti. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Good evening, Mayor Cummings, members of the City Council. Um, I'll be very, I'll be uh, more, more or less brief about this item. Um, as you'll recall, on April 28th, the Council adopted a resolution um, both extending the emergency uh, declaration an additional 60 days uh, pursuant to the authority set forth in the Government Code for Declared Emergencies and ratifying a series of executive orders uh, issued by the city manager <clears throat> acting as the director of emergency services uh, pursuant to the authority set forth in the municipal code. Um, that gives the uh, emergency services director the authority to issue rules and regulations on matters reasonably related to the protection of life and property as affected by such emergency, but under the terms of the ordinance as well as state law, those orders um, are required to be presented to the council for uh, ratification or confirmation at the earliest practicable opportunity. And so um, a number of executive orders have been issued since then, uh, in particular, uh, executive order numbers 2020-07, uh, an order to implement CDC guidance uh, regarding encampments at the benchlands, uh, order number 2020-08, addressing parking on the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf, and order number 2020-09, an order to abate nuisance conditions on Coral Street and establish a nearby encampment that complies with CDC guidance. Um, so those are the items that uh, you're being asked to consider ratification at this evening's meeting, and I'm happy to respond to any council member questions or comments. I thank you, Tony, for that presentation. Are there any questions or comments from council members at this point in time? Okay, hearing none. Oh, Council Member Brown. I thank you, Tony. Um, can, can I just clarify? Um, maybe I already got this and I, I lost it, but it so it looks like the first one on guidance regarding encampments of the benchlands is is for now forward, and the others are um, um, are after the fact. Is that? Correct, for actions already taken, the this, this other two, but the first one on the bench lens is moving forward from here? Uh, yes, I think that's the first thing. Okay, thank you. Tony, I, um, maybe is there some clarification? Because my understanding and having, I went down to the bench lens recently was that um, there had been kind of a camp that was establishing itself and then the city had gone and kind of put up fencing and portable toilets. So I was just, just for clarification, um, is this kind of, this, this um, order before us, was that to allow that to happen? Or is there something new that's gonna be happening in the bench? Line? It is to confirm, it, it, it is literally just to <clears throat> essentially ratify the action that's already been taken, which um, basically establishes standards for the continued use of the benchlands as a homeless encampment. So um, it, it calls for laying out a plan, providing for adequate social distancing, uh, requiring those at the benchlands to stay within that layout plan, um, and then abiding by basic rules of, of conduct for the encampment. Um, it also directed the provision of restroom facilities, hand washing facilities, and trash facilities at the um, at that location. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because it sounded like um, Council Member Brown's question was whether this was going to allow for something to move forward. And I, my understanding was that the actions have already been taken to address the conditions at the bench lands, and this is just ratifying. That's correct. The action that has been taken. Of um, the city manager weigh in. I was, I was just going to say that, that it was to, to implement the, the changes that have happened there. So Tony clarified that. So. Okay. Councilman Brown. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so I was just um, just trying to get a sense of, I understand the, that an action has been taken to kind of rationalize the, the space, but then the operating procedure, the standards are, you're asking us to implement those moving forward, right? So, so they're being, they're in, it's been enacted, but this is something that is going to continue on. It's not just, we're just not, oh, I that's all I was asking. Yes, yes, yes. it'll, it'll okay. continue there um, okay. until, right, I mean, conditions may change, uh, obviously, and it's not, uh, you know, uh, a permanent uh, solution uh, for addressing sheltering. Uh, there are uh, plans for that and, and work being done on that. But for the foreseeable future, yes, is to be able to uh, be able to maintain those standards uh, while we have the sh at least while we have the shelter in place order in place. I'd just like to thank uh, the city staff for all the work that they've done at Coral Street and the Benchlands. I had the opportunity to go to both sites uh, with the police chief last week, and both of them were uh, a big improvement to what was there before. And so I just want to thank. Um, the community and the city staff for all the work they've done and, and um, really trying to improve the conditions for those folks who are who are uh, experiencing homelessness and living at both of those locations. Thank you. Okay, so if, this, if there are no further comments from council members, I'll turn it over to members of the public. If members of the public are interested in commenting on this item, um, they should call in now by dialing into one of the numbers that they see on your screen. Uh, after you've dialed in, if, well, before that, if you happen to get a busy signal, please try one of the other numbers that are displayed on your screen. Uh, once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and you'll be given two minutes to speak. Okay, first call, you're on the line. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Thank you. Um, these standards going forward are really going to be mainly enforced by the people who live there in the bench lands. So it would seem to me that you would want to consult with them and have some procedures for doing this. Clearly the city manager has not found this necessary, but the council can direct him to do so and to, in, in, to inquire what the real wishes and needs are of the people there. I, I was out there interviewing people the other day. They are concerned, of course, about porta potty problems, although those have gotten better, and a hats off to the city for doing that. But there's problems with no electricity, so people can't keep up with the COVID-19 updates, much less have their phones available. Uh, there's also no potty water, as I mentioned before, during the oral communications period. So these survival encampments are very important, and this is a good model if it is effectively integrated into having the residents have a real say in what goes on, because they're the ones whose eyes are going to be on each other and who will really be, if you will, the enforcing agency. That's always the best way to proceed rather than having external authorities do so. So I would ask you to make a recommendation, if not a requirement, that there be some real consultation with them to get their real needs heard and met. Uh, also, of course, the problem one of with, with this thing generally, the rationalizing this uh, this, uh, this order, is that it is. Uh, a, it also involves the fact that you have dangerous indoor group settings that currently continue, vacant motel rooms and people who are vulnerable as more and more tourists flood into town. Equally questionable was the 2020-09 forcibly removal of the Coral Street side, uh, sidewalk residents, many of whom were given and are still given no safe options, while a secondary tent city across from Coral Street run by the city and finally the arrival of porta potties long sequestered away are good or overdue signs. It's the responsibility of the city council to come out in front of this issue, not simply serve as a cheering section for Bernal's makeshift patchwork solutions. So do it. Yep. All right, next call, you're on the line. Yes, hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I don't consider myself a worthless eater and I don't consider anyone a worthless eater. This is from Forbes.com today. The world's 25 richest billionaires have gained nearly $255 billion in just two months. This was my comment. The next few months will be exciting 
in a rather planned well execution of generations of planning, what if their wealth was seized and equally redistributed? Sixty trillion divided by seven billion equals nine thousand for every human on the planet. When currently half the world population lives on less than two dollars a day, that's forty five hundred days of wealth. That's a twelve year salary, seven days a week. So what if that number was ten times larger? As I believe the Vatican would and should, I say must be included, on a side note, how much in taxes have those 25 richest corporate personhoods dodged due to corporate, due to current approved tax shelter laws? And yes, it might seem impossible, but in reflection, and using India as an example, Bezos and Gates, through the test run of what has been proposed to retrieve number 21 and 230 about six years early, as far as a 95% population control as India's middle and lower class have been crippled by Gates' control of what was Monsanto and is now Bayer, which is a Nazi corporation, Bezos enacted a card currency crippled hundreds of thousands of small businesses overnight. So do I consider myself a worthless eater? Do you consider yourself a worthless eater? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. There are members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item. Please press, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Okay, seeing no further members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, I'll bring it back to Council for Action and Deliberation. Is there a member of the Council who would like to move this item? We can move the recommendation. The recommendation, yeah. Councilmember Matthews. Oh, you're muted. I'm going to move the recommendation before us. Okay. We have a motion made by Councilmember Matthews. The Councilmember that would like to second. I'm happy to second the motion. Okay, we have a second by Councilmember Watkins. Is there any further discussion by council members? Hearing none, I'll turn it over to the city clerk uh, to call the roll vote. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. So with that, we'll move on to our next item, which is an emergency ordinance temporarily extending moratorium preventing residential or commercial evictions for non-payment of rent as a result of economic loss related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And with that, I'll turn that over to the uh, city attorney for the presentation. Yes. Um, Thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the City Council. This item is being brought forward by, it's actually being brought forward by um, the Mayor and Council Member uh, Brown for the Council's consideration of an extension to the existing emergency ordinance um, <clears throat> establishing an eviction moratorium for individuals uh, or commercial businesses that are financially impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and the resultant uh, shelter-in-place orders that have been issued and have had such dramatic effects on the country and, and the economy here locally as well. Um, that ordinance that was adopted on March 27th um, uh, established an expiration date of May 31st, 2020 to coincide with an order issued by Governor Newsom on uh, March 16th that waived or suspended provisions of state law that um, would enable local governments to act uh, or to enact eviction moratorium ordinances. Um, a little bit of a mystery as to why the governor didn't just issue an executive order to that effect, but in any event, um, responding to that, the city council along with um, other, many other city councils and boards of supervisors, including Santa Cruz County, City of Watsonville, City of Capitola, adopted eviction moratorium ordinances that have an expiration date of May 31st. Um, as we know, 
the, um, the financial crisis has certainly not abated and the, uh, the expiration of the ordinance is looming. However, um, on March 27th, Governor Newsom also issued executive order number 37-20 that established a statewide uh, eviction protections uh, covering local jurisdictions that have not enacted similar ordinances to the one the council did. And then on uh, April 6th, the California Judicial Council adopted 11 emergency rules in response to COVID-19. Uh, and the first rule states that a court may not issue a summons on a complaint for unlawful detainer unless the court finds in its discretion and on the record that the action is necessary to protect public health and safety. And the rule remains in effect for 90 days after the governor lists the emergency declaration, Ray, uh, COVID-19. Now, um, you can sort of parse all the different rules and try to make a determination as to whether or not um, the Judicial Council order would protect every tenant in every circumstance that might be affected by COVID-19. Um, I, I think it, it goes pretty far. I'm not sure that there isn't some potential individual who, whose circumstance might fall through the cracks, such that this ordinance would protect them where the Judicial Council ordinance does not. And so I think that's the spirit um, of this ordinance. And what is proposed here is to extend the existing eviction moratorium uh, about two and a half months to August 15th, 2020. And what that would uh, do is it would enable the council to have the moratorium in place um, through the month of June and through the July recess before the council next meets. I think it's on August 12th, uh, following the summer recess. So um, that's what this is about. I will tell you that there's been significant dis discussion in the legal community, um, particularly the municipal law and, and local government uh, law community about um, whether the city or whether cities like Santa Cruz have the legal authority in the absence of uh, an order extending Governor Newsom's original decree um, to uh, enact these types of protections, which otherwise arguably could be um, found in conflict with the state's unlawful detainer statutes, which essentially preempt the field of eviction laws in California uh, with respect to um, the unlawful detainer and eviction process. Uh, that's an unsettled question, but in moving forward, assuming the governor does not extend that executive order, and I'm seeing no indication that he intends to, then we would be relying on the city council's authority in an emergency, uh, under an emergency declaration uh, to, to defend that the ordinance were it subject to challenge. And then lastly, I just um, want to point out that the latest information that I've um, received uh, is that the County of Santa Cruz does not intend to extend its moratorium past the existing May 31st um, expiration date. And the County Council I've communicated with and their take is that the Judicial Council order um, basically accomplishes the same thing. Um, the city of Capitola will be considering an extension of their ordinance, but it would only go in effect if the governor does uh, extend his executive order, uh, conferring that authority expressly on local governments. And uh, according to an agenda report uh, at the, in the city of Watsonville's uh, meeting for today, the recommended action was not to extend uh, their ordinance, um, but I have not heard whether or not they've actually uh, considered that and, and taken action on it. So I'm not I'm not quite sure what Watsonville is going to do, but um, the recommended action is is to hold off on extending the uh, the ordinance for the time being. So happy to answer any questions or respond to any uh, council member comments. Uh, but that will conclude my report for now. Okay. Thank you for that report, Council Member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Tony, and I, I just I apologize. I didn't hear your final recommendation, which is at this time, based on your analysis, to not extend our uh, emergency ordinance, knowing that the state has other provisions in place. Is that correct? I don't have a a firm uh, recommendation on that point, given that that's a policy issue for the city council. Um, as you know, I did 
uh, have a confidential attorney-client privilege memo that was sent to the council over the weekend in, in advance of this item. And, um, you know, without going in, in depth into it, it does point out some of the potential um, pitfalls with the ordinance, but ultimately it's a policy decision for the city council. And there are, I mean, there are some arguments that we could make that, um, that, that I could make to accord with a straight face in, in an attempt to defend the case. And, um, and so I'm not saying it's a slam dunk. There, there is some vulnerability there. And if I could, um, what I also heard you say was that our neighboring jurisdictions are um, letting their uh, temporary emergency ordinances expire given what is already in place. Um, can you speak a little bit more to what Capitola is suggesting in terms of uh, extending it only if the governor extends uh, his? Yeah, their ordinance as drafted specifically reads that the ordinance would only take effect um, if, if the governor issues a subsequent executive order extending um, that authority and it would only be in effect during whatever period of time that extension is, is in effect. And that, in your opinion, is legally safe? It, it is a, it, it is certainly a more defensible position given that what prompted, what, what was the impetus for the ordinance in the first place was the governor's executive board. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Myers. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, do you, I don't know if um, the city manager or anyone from planning or economic development, I know these are sort of split between those. Do we have, um, I have reviewed the city of Watsonville staff report. Um, uh, so they have some statistics on evictions in the city that they're you know, using to base their recommendation on. Do we have any idea of, are we experiencing evictions currently? I know we were worried about as we went into April and May that you know people were going to become much more um, have have problems economically uh, with each you know with each month of closure. I'm just curious if we have any reports on on um, on evictions. I think you're muted, Martin. Yeah. Sorry about that. So I'll see if I can get uh, Lee on, but uh, as far as I know, I don't have a, in front of me any statistics, but as far as I know, we haven't had a large number uh, from uh, from what I've been told. Um, but I'll see if we can get the uh, more more specific statistics for you. And I would and I, just add that the courts are not are not moving eviction cases forward right now. So um, okay. all, all of the <laughs> actions are currently being stayed. So that that is it. So yeah, okay. So that that might be not a proper data point then. Um, I had a question. I recalled last month that we passed, uh, I think, legal services for tenant protections. Um, so I know that we have funding available with CAB. I think we I think we approved. Was it twenty thousand? Just remembering from last month, we we had legal service. Let me just look in the. Um, I don't know if Bonnie's on or not. She might not be on. Um, but I specifically thought our HUD, our HUD allocation last month uh, included using some of the CARES Act funding to, for uh, tenant legal protections and other items, correct? Martine, do you recall that? I can't recall off the top okay. of my head for that. I think I think we do. We have had allo we had a, we have allocated resources for that. Okay. Um, but I can't recall whether this addition, okay. but I'll find out for you. Okay. I can that, um, uh, for that item, we, I think it was around 30,000 that went to community action board. Right. For, uh, rent, rental relief. There was, we have, I don't think we made any allocations to legal um, assist, assistance for renters, but there was the allocation for the rental assistance. For rental assistance, okay, thank you. Um, that was, those are my two questions for now, thank you. Okay, are there any further questions from council members on this item? Okay, hearing none. Uh, if members of the public would like to speak to city council on this item, which is uh, item number two on our evening agenda, emergency ordinance, temporarily extending moratorium 
preventing residential or commercial evictions for non-payment of rent as a result of economic losses related to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, if you'd like to speak to us on this item, please call the number that's on your screen. Once you've entered the meeting, you'll want to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the time will be set to two minutes. Um, I'll turn it back over to the city manager. I'm just gonna point out, Lee, Lee is, on the, is on now, um, so he may be able to provide some additional information on the eviction experience in terms of what uh, information we've received or, or have available. Thank you, Martine, and Mayor and Council Members, Lee Butler, the Planning Director, and um, we have received a limited number of inquiries um, that have made it to me, um, and um, we have a number of resources on our website, um, some of which um, Tony Condotti's office and the, the City Attorney have uh, prepared, and so um, we have directed folks to those resources. Um, I do not have a sense of how many um, inquiries have come in that haven't made it to me, um, but, uh, but our team is aware of those, um, those resources, and so they could just be directing folks uh, to those um, online resources. So unfortunately, we don't have a, a good answer for you in terms of the overall numbers. It, it's strictly anecdotal and, and um, only a couple that have come my way. Okay, thank you. At this time, I'll uh, turn it over to the public to provide comments on this item. And so I'm gonna start with the first number of the public. <clears throat> Hello, good evening. This is James Ewing Whitman. Um, I wanna thank everybody for their input and I think it's incredible this relief that the county of Santa Cruz is offering to its community. I know I certainly appreciate it. I don't know if I'm receiving any, but I certainly appreciate that dozens of friends of mine, their businesses are, are gonna hopefully stay above water. But what happens in a few months when that situation ends? So yeah, what is gonna go on in a few months? So I'm, I posted something about 14 hours ago. I'm just gonna read certain ex excerpts of it. Bill Gates partners with DARPA and Department of Defense for new DNA nanotech COVID-19 vaccine. And my comment was, yes, Mr. Kane, the free choice of not taking the vaccine is simply house arrest in one's owned or rented coffin. But how to explain this to citizens? This would be my answer. See Lena Pugh's presentation, September 2019. Um, so all I can say is that we are in a really tough situation and I don't hear a whole lot of commentary about what's going to go on in six months and a year or even further because this is just crippling our society. So I'm just here and I'm listening and I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, next speaker, you're on the line. Yes, hello, this is Garrett Phillip. I, I didn't write anything up for this, but uh, just I, I have questions. I know you're not gonna answer them, but uh, you know, I am wondering where you got August 15th from. That seems like a very long time. Uh, you don't even know if there will be an emergency at that time. Uh, I don't believe, I, I mean, I'm not sure, but I, I'm not sure open-ended emergency declarations by anyone, including the director of health, are sensible or rational. Uh, um, I, I agree that the governor probably doesn't have authority to uh, can extend the, uh, his uh, kill switch lockdown uh, without going back to the uh, assembly. And so this is very questionable. I don't know why the uh, city attorney doesn't have an opinion on it. Seems strange. Uh, also, you know, why you've picked winners and losers here and you said, okay, tenants are winners, landlords, you're big losers. Uh, I, I, I didn't hear the justification for that. That would be interesting to hear that. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's all for now. I'm done. Bye. Thanks. All right, next speaker. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Emily Hamm, and I'm with Monterey Bay Economic Partnership on their um, housing team. And for those of you who don't know us, um, we are a, a group of 87 public, private, and civic entities throughout the Monterey Bay region, which includes um, Santa Cruz, uh, the city of Santa Cruz, and Santa Cruz County. Um, and in March, we, we worked quickly to uh, respond to the new housing realities and the ongoing threat of COVID-19 and issued a housing response position paper, which focuses on mitigating the impacts of the health emergency on renters, landlords, and homeowners in our region. Um, and we would like to thank the city of Santa Cruz for your efforts so far. Um, we support the staff's recommendation to extend the city's moratorium to August 15th, which um, exceeds our standard request to all local governments in our region to extend their moratoriums to at least June 30th. Um, and we also ask that they leave further extensions open for consideration on a monthly basis. Um, we believe that more time will help ensure that renters across the region are provided with sufficient economic relief and that we have time to work together to assess impacts and plan and implement policies under um, the new local and state budgetary realities. Um, we also advocate um, for um, local public and private funding for rental assistance, particularly vulnerable populations and individuals who do not have access to safety net resources. Um, and we understand, of course, that most landlords are experiencing strong rent collection, 95% um, or higher, but there are signs that um, undocumented residents and others are already experiencing difficulty. Um, so we would like to make sure that there are systems in place to help a very um, important part of our population. Um, so we thank you again for considering our recommendations and your efforts to fill the gaps between local, state, and federal legislation. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next uh, Good afternoon. This I'm calling on behalf of the Santa Cruz County Workers Benefit Council. The next speaker will be speaking in Spanish, and I will be translating for her. Hola, mi nombre es Felisa Guzmán. Yo y mi esposo Hermilo Carballo estamos aquí para pedir la extensión a la moratoria de los desalojos y para abogar para el Consejo de la Ciudad respalde las demandas del Consejo de Beneficios para Trabajadores del Condado de Santa Cruz. Good afternoon. My name is Felicia Guzman, and my husband Emilio and I are here to ask for an extension on the moratorium uh, of evictions. And we are asking this uh, to all of you city council members uh, to be a on behalf of the Santa Cruz County Workers Benefit Council. Desde el 16 de marzo, nos quedamos sin trabajo como resultado de la pandemia del coronavirus y la orden de quedar en casa. Since March 16th, we have been without work because of the pandemia of the coronavirus and the order to stay in, at home. No hemos podido trabajar y estamos preocupados por la renta y los biles que tenemos que pagar. We have not been able to work, and we are worried for rent, to be able to pay rent and other bills that we need to uh, take care of. Teníamos un poquito ahorrado, pero eso ya se nos terminó. We had a little bit saved up, but that we've already had to use it. Ahora no tenemos para pagar este mes y no sabemos cómo le vamos a hacer. Nosotros quisiéramos pagar, pero no podemos. We don't have any more money to pay this month, and we don't know what we're going to do. We would like to be able to pay, but we can't. Hoy no sabemos cuándo va, más va a durar esto, y cuándo podremos regresar a trabajar, pero sí sabemos que nos va a tomar un poquito más de tiempo para poder hacer los pagos de lo que se debe. We don't know how much longer this is going to last and when we will be able to return to work. But we do know that it is going to take more time and that we will need more time in order to pay 
uh, the, the cost of our living. Y debemos continuar con la moratoria de los desalojos durante 10 años, como se está discutiendo actualmente en la legislación del Senado del Estado de California. Después de que los trabajadores puedan regresar a su pleno empleo. We should continue this moratorium for the next 10 years as it is being discussed in the legislation, uh, the state legislation here in California, so that workers can return to work and can, can have their, their full job back. Mantener la moratoria sobre la desconexión por falta de pago de servicios públicos hasta que la economía se vuelva a abrir y los trabajadores puedan regresar al trabajo. Maintain the moratorium on disconnecting for non-payment from home utilities and other essential services such as electricity, gas, telephone, garbage, water, and sewage. For the duration of the pandemic crisis, including the time it will take workers to recover when the economy reopens and when workers can finally return their jobs to find new employment. Thank you for your comment. Next member of the public, you're on the line. You could, you could please turn down your uh, device and listen. Hello? Hello. Yeah. Okay. The next speaker will also speak in Spanish, and he will continue um, after Felicia's uh, comments. Hola, soy Luis Sendero debido a la pandemia. No sé si otros consejos municipales para seguirse de aquí el gobernador use su autoridad e influencias para detener las ejecuciones hipotecarias y las de trabajador el salario durante el, me el menos de un año después de que termine la pandemia. Cuatro por por poner en práctica salarios de dignos para el, para el bien de los trabajadores mal pagados por, y por el bien de esta, establecer nuestras economías para, todo, para todos. We need to mobilize with other city councils to ensure that the governor, the governor uses this authority to stop financial institutions from foreclosures and evictions for at least one year after the World Health Organization's formal declaration of the end of the novel coronavirus pandemic. Enforcing living wages in the lowest paid workers in the city and the county are not paid living wages and cannot maintain housing, nutrition, and sanitation. The whole community, from small businesses where we shop to the health of those we serve will suffer severely. Thank you for your time, and thank you for also joining the first moratorium. Okay, thank you for your comments. So if there's any member of the public who's listening, um, I'd like to comment on the item before us regarding an extension of uh, temporary rental protection, or sorry, uh, eviction protection on commercial and residential properties for non-payment of rent as a result of economic losses related to, COVID, uh, to coronavirus. Uh, please call the number that's on your screen and hit star nine on your phone uh, to raise your hand. Once you've been unmuted, you will be um, provided with an announcement that you've been unmuted and you'll be able to comment on this item. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Melanie Dillman. I've been a resident of Santa Cruz County for my entire life. Uh, I have, over, over my, the course of my life, I have witnessed the disgraceful treatment of low-income workers and the unhoused people by our city government, 
Um, I have seen just how far the moneyed interest in Santa Cruz will go with the complicity of city council to squeeze working people and jeopardize the health and well-being of the most vulnerable people in our community. I see the police. I see the police harassing houseless people every day, and I've seen moneyed interests kill Measure M rent control and get progressives recalled from city council. In Santa Cruz, a full-time minimum wage job nets $1,900 a month, where the average rent is nearly $2,400. Hotels and many other properties are allowed to stand vacant while people are forced to sleep in tents on the street, exposed to coronavirus and the coming summer heat. Uh, since I've started volunteering with a local organization, Western Service Workers Association, I've also learned that there is rampant wage theft happening all over the county, particularly to undocumented workers. And I want to ask, how can we claim to be a sanctuary city when employers are allowed such free reign to exploit undocumented workers? Employment in Santa Cruz, unemployment in Santa Cruz stands at 19 percent. And the recent decision to allow businesses to reopen will surely force low-wage workers to expose themselves to coronavirus, unless this government begins to act in the interests of the health and well-being of the people. I support the Western Service Workers Association's The Workers' Benefit Council demands for worker safety as follows. Maintain the moratorium on evictions for 10 years to allow for full recovery for workers um, and to be able to afford rent in Santa Cruz. Two, maintain a moratorium on disconnections of utilities and essential services, regardless of payment. Three, mobilize with other city councils to ensure the governor uses his authority to stop financial institutions from foreclosures and evictions. Four, enforce living wages. If workers are exploited and cannot afford housing and other essential goods and services, not only is their health, is their health at risk, but we all suffer the consequences. I would also like to add that I am formally incarcerated and I have experienced personally the horrible conditions of our local jail. Not only does the jailed population have to deal with extreme heat, extreme cold, and poor health care, now across the country, jails and prisons are becoming incubators for coronavirus. In addition to the health and safety of our essential workers, we must consider the most vulnerable people. I submit that everyone who is currently incarcerated in the Santa Cruz County Jail awaiting trial or serving time for nonviolent offenses be released immediately, and also that the police stop arrests for nonviolent offenses. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, this is the last opportunity to comment on this item. Um, please dial the number that's on your screen, and when you are in the meeting, please press star nine to raise your hand so that you can be acknowledged and comment on this item. Okay, seeing no further uh, public comment, we'll close the public comment period and return to council for action and deliberation. Uh, before we take action, I just wanted to make a few comments on this item. Um, uh, myself and Elmo Brown, um, in the, in the last meeting that we had had when we first approved this, uh, it was supposed to come back, and so we were very much interested in getting this item back on the agenda. Um, with the one comment that was made regarding the August 15th date, I'll just speak to that. Um, when we were kind of discussing the dates, we had thought about having the extension for an additional month, but then the concern was raised with if the council doesn't meet in July, then um, potentially the protections could end and there's not an opportunity for council to vote on this. And so by putting it on the August, the putting the date of August 15th actually allows us to have a council meeting before that date if we wanted to consider extending it even further. So I hope that gets to um, the questions around the August 15th date. Uh, I just think that it's important that we remember and we are aware of how badly this is impacting residents within our community. Um, we've seen disproportionate funding go to many of the small business owners. So while some businesses may have been able to use the PPP to help their businesses, there are other businesses that didn't get that funding and they didn't get um, additional city funds. And you know, personally, I feel that um, if the government is asking a business to close its doors for the health and safety of the public, that we should be doing everything we can to protect them. Uh, because there are businesses that were thriving and doing fine before this and are now struggling. And if the government's going to ask the public to do something and the public complies, then we need to do everything in our power to help protect them. Um, and 
I think we've heard some of the comments, especially from our, on our, our um, some folks who are in our immigrant populations and our undocumented residents. And I just want to remind folks too that most of those $1,200 relief checks came out in April, and for residents who were able to use those to pay their rent, um, many, well, no one has received any of that additional funding since. Um, we've heard from the Community Action Board that they had a 50% increase in requests for rental assistance. I think uh, Council Member Brown mentioned earlier that they were, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounded like 30,000 or so calls for financial assistance for undocumented residents asking for 10% salary reductions. Uh, the state's also gonna be asking for similar reductions uh, to, you know, for cost savings purposes. Businesses aren't operating at full capacity, and so a lot of folks in our community are gonna be in some pretty um, financially unstable times. And I think that, you know, it's important that, as I mentioned before, that we as a city, after having such good compliance from our community, can provide, you know, people who maybe um, finance, facing financial hardships with all the support they need so that they can uh, remain on their feet and remain in housing. Um, because uh, I think ultimately our goal is to not um, contribute to our homeless, pop our homeless situation and the homeless population. We want to keep people housed as best possible until they're able to financially get back on their feet again. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, so I did have, uh, I wanted to make a couple of comments, but I did have a question um, and I'm prepared to make a motion, but I, I have a couple of questions. So I wanna try to clarify this question around the unlawful detainer uh, freeze or the um, kind of staying of those uh, unlawful detainer motions or, um, at, in the courts. I think I heard you say, Tony, that this would continue for 90 days after the shelter in place is uh, lifted. So I'm just trying to figure out though, because that doesn't necessarily mean that taking no action here would be this would in effect result have the same results. So I'm just trying to figure out because it seems like with the unlawful detainer, if they can't be issued now, they could be issued, can they be issued retrospectively once the um, once the um, stay is lifted? So I'm just trying to figure out what the, what the difference would be kind of practically for people if we just went with that. Um, for any um, unlawful detainer action that's, that's not been filed, um, th then the, the owner or the landlord could not file an action in unlawful detainer until that uh, order or that rule is uh, in a, um, expires 90 days after the governor lifts the emergency declaration. So um, one could speculate on when that might be, but my sense is that the emergency is going to extend probably through the summer um, in, in some fashion or another. So. Um, you know, I think the, the bottom line is there may be some circumstances in which a tenant could fall through the, clack, the cracks based on the existing state uh, orders that are in place and, and that this ordinance um, w would, would protect, assuming it's not challenged. Um, I just haven't identified those circumstances yet based on the analysis that we've been able to do to date. So. Um, so, so I think that's the real impetus for the, the ordinance should the council decide to move forward this evening. Thank you. Uh, another question that I have is about, and this is kind of, I guess, for, for everyone, uh, the second part of this, uh, this agenda report recommends uh, consideration of other measures that the city might consider uh, to to uh, protect tenants, residential and commercial tenants, and you know, I just think it's it's we should have that conversation and at least try to think about what we might discuss at a future date. Um, the mayor and I, in thinking about this, didn't want to bring fully formed, uh, you know, recommendations, specific recommendations, and ordinance language or anything like that. But we did want to open up that conversation because I feel like. 
you know, we are on the edge of a cliff here. And the story, what we just heard about the people who are hurting it, it is magnified so many times over. And it's not going to get any better anytime soon. And I, I just worry that if we um, kind of just wait to see how things play out, we are going to be, um, you know, kind of creating, there will be new problems that are associated with like potentially mass evictions, businesses that can't pay their back rents right away and all of these things. And so I just, you know, and, and um, the mayor just um, kind of gave a few of those um, data points. So I, um, I do want to hear though, but you know, I'm, I am prepared to make a motion about some future uh, discussions that I hope we could have, but I do want to hear from people, um, you know, what you all are thinking before we move forward. If anybody has. Yeah, I think I'm, you're muted, Justin. My hand is up. Um, so next we have council members Watkins, Byers, Golder, Matthews, and then Vice Mayor Myers. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor. And thank you, uh, Councilor Brown and, and Mayor Cummings for, for bringing this forward. I actually just was briefly reviewing um, the Watsonville agenda report and I have to applaud them for uh, a really thoughtful process that it looks like they um, engaged in as it relates to this topic. I guess I'd like a little bit of clarification because I think um, what I'm hearing is that there are um, other policies in place that will likely get to uh, the, the, the important rental protections that we need. And that if I heard you correctly, Tony, you're saying that um, our emergency would carry legal risk, one, and two, could only necessarily provide protection for sort of the exception, not the rule uh, uh, folks. And, and you couldn't even identify who those folks were at this time. Is that, is that accurate? Um, I, I think that the, uh, and the, and the council has done this before, where there is an existing state law uh, and, the, and the council considers adopting a similar uh, legislative action as a, as a city ordinance or law. In fact, another one is on the next item on your agenda. And so it's not unusual for the council, for, for city and state laws to be somewhat overlapping. So I guess um, I, I would say that it would protect anyone who is potentially the subject of an eviction, both residential or commercial, until it expires uh, in addition to whatever protections uh, state law affords in that regard. So it wouldn't just help those that would otherwise fall through the cracks. It would be applicable to any tenant that's um, impacted financially by the COVID-19 crisis. And, that, uh, and the second just, part of my question for clarification was just sort of the legal, if all of if our neighboring jurisdictions are, um, feeling that, and I was sort of briefly looking at the, for example, the Watsonville staff report saying that they felt that they had a Watsonville eviction moratorium task force that they basically landed on that their uh, local eviction moratorium was redundant and that's unnecessary. And um, and so I guess I guess what I'm wondering is if, if your legal opinion, Tony, is that we would be outlying um, and legally vulnerable to then have an, an extension of a moratorium that is redundant and unnecessary, but if we couple that with other protections, which I know Councilor Brown was getting at, how do we kind of reconcile the two? Is that your opinion? Yeah, I would say that we would be an outlier in Santa Cruz County. Um, I overheard uh, Council Member Byers mention that uh, she had heard from her son, who happens to be County Council of San Mateo County, that that the county is extending its eviction moratorium. So I, I took an opportunity to go on their website and look at the agenda report for that. And what they're actually doing is they're extending the residential eviction moratorium ordinance uh, to the end of June. Uh, and they are making that apply countywide, uh, both in the unincorporated area and in the cities. And then interestingly, 
They also extended the commercial eviction moratorium ordinance for small businesses, and um, but that only applies in the unincorporated area. So I'm not sure why they chose to make that distinction. But that so it's not unprecedented. Other entities are uh, extending their eviction moratorium ordinances. I've not heard of a legal challenge to any of those yet. But as far as Santa Cruz County goes, um, uh, yes, the city would be the outlier. I guess I'm just a little bit confused and I apologize for that because I feel like based on the memo that we received as well as sort of your uh, legal analysis, it really alluded to that there would be, you know, legal liability with that. But if I'm now hearing you say that you don't know and possibly not, is that right? I mean, I I'm guess saying there is an increased risk of a legal challenge uh, without the support of the governor's executive order. I just can't quantify the level of risk. Uh, for you based on the dearth of um, legal research that's out there or, or, or of precedent setting case law on the topic. Um, there may have been case law interpreting shelter in place orders and, and the ramifications thereof, you know, based upon the 1918 pandemic, but it's a really unprecedented situation in California right now. Okay. I guess I'm just trying to understand what sort of the, um you know, given that there is existing policy in place that what is sort of that risk, I guess that risk kind of balance we want to take in terms of being almost vulnerable um, with not only uh, policy, but also with resources. So, um, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's right. It's a continuum of risk. On the one hand, uh, certainly there's a policy argument for extending as much protection to tenants as possible. On the other hand, uh, the argument is um, offset somewhat by the fact that there are existing state rules in effect that provide similar, if not the same, protection. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Byers. Um, well, thank you, Sandy and Jason, for bringing the eviction. Uh, information to us. Uh, just listening to the speakers who spoke earlier, uh, do we have, I, I'm looking at what can the city do to help people in their day-to-day -day living and they're running out of money and all these bills are coming up. Is there any, maybe it's already been in the past uh, or maybe it just happened in March, I don't know. Uh, economic development, is there, what part of money could we somehow subsidize people to meet some of these goals? Or do we, we have a program, or if not, could we talk about whether we should have one or not? Even Martine knows. Um, we have Bonnie and Lee uh, on. Oh, good, good. I think that Bonnie can help us uh, providing uh, a description, of, and, and both of them on what we have available. Hi, this is this is Bonnie. Um, so we do have um, that we budgeted for this year that um, that council approved at our. We got our last meeting, uh, 200,000, actually 230,000 combining sources of funding for um, eviction prevention. And so we have 30,000 through the CARES Act and 200,000 through our home funds approved. And this is up to two months of rental assistance um, that individuals in the community can apply for. And the distinction between this program and what we had previously is previously we were using a combination of funding that was restricted to the beach flats and lower ocean area. And so by the new um, approval of this funding, um, we now have it citywide um, available for uh, eviction prevention. And, and Bonnie, is that both residential and commercial? That is residential. Uh -huh. And do we have a program? In, did we do one for commercial for businesses to give them some boost? We don't have what a it, we don't have one currently. What we have provided is the uh, microloan program. Oh, maybe that was it alone. Okay. And then the PPP program does allow funding through that program to go towards rental assistance. So that's been the mechanism so far. Um, I will say that there's definitely a need for more, but there there is some funding sources out there for that. So there, so there is some funding sources for that. We don't need to maybe go there. Well, the funding sources that are available for commercial at this point are largely loans. 
you know, a portion of the PPP can be forgiven, but the portion that's forgiven is largely for payroll. That's right, okay. Um, how about um, rent increases? Do we have any program that um, the only would be a moratorium on no further rent increases? I don't know whether this has come before the council before or this the first time. It's so open-ended, Jason, what's on the, and uh, Sandra, what is on the uh, um, agenda, you know, let's look at all kinds of options. So I'm just raising some of those that maybe we could help out in some way. And of course that is a moratorium on rent increases, both commercial and businesses. Mm -hmm. the, the funding that we have for the eviction prevention is community development block grant, so it is federal funding. So we're not using any local sources. I think if we wanted to provide something for local sources, we, um, we may have to come up with an additional source of funding just because of some of the restrictions on the federal funds. And that could possibly help people rent. If there's not a moratorium on rent increases, it would help them if they got a rent increase. That part of the money we're gonna come up with. A new source. Yeah, okay. Oh, I'm sure I'll have more questions. That's it right now. Okay. And also, uh, just to, before I move on to the next council member, I wanted to mention too that part of the reason Council Member Brown mentioned earlier was the discussion of uh, potential additional options to protect uh, residents and businesses is that at, our, at the meeting when we first approved this, um, there was discussion around um, you know, having grace periods for people to pay back their rents uh, after COVID-19. And, uh, and as Councilman Brown said, we didn't want to bring anything completely constructed and fully baked in terms of ordinance languages, but wanted to have an opportunity to discuss uh, other, other protections such as, um, you know, freezing rents, do we want to discuss it and find out whether it's legally feasible to have a grace period for people to pay back those back rents so that once this is so that if there are no longer eviction protections, people plan having to pay two months of back rent immediately. And so these are all, you know, topics. And if there's other topics that come up, we be good to discuss so that if we need to take action, that we can um, put these on a future agenda. And so um, with that, I'll move on to Council Member Golder. So I really was moved by some of the things that the speakers were saying, and I, you know, had some friends over the weekend that told me some stories that are happening around the community. And I think that there's a lot of people around us that are getting support from other places, but I would hate to see people fall through the cracks, whether they're business owners or, um, or um, residential um, tenants. And I also don't want to see the city open to any potential liability. And so I'm, I, without like giving people ideas, I'm just curious, like what is the liability that you're talking about, Tony? I'm really confused. The two potential um, avenues of a legal challenge are that um, it could be challenged on the basis of a state preemption in the unlawful detainer statute. And the primary exposure to liability in that instance would be uh, if a plaintiff sued and was successful, they may be able to recover their attorney fees and costs in addition to get a, getting a court order invalidating the ordinance. Um, the other potential legal challenge is based on a theory of inverse condemnation in which the plaintiff would allege that by essentially prohibiting them from uh, 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 obtaining or, or benefiting from the economically viable use of their property, the city has essentially taken it in, in a manner akin to uh, the eminent domain law in which case the city could also be exposed to damages in the form of the rent that landlords should be collecting and are not, um, and uh, in addition to that, potential attorney fees. So I think it goes back to what one of the speakers said, maybe 
we as a city government or we as individuals should be pushing back on lenders that they could perhaps, you know, let people have deferments on their mortgages if they need it. But I think like that, like Justin said, we've asked people to stay home. So they're not working the hairdressers, the people, whether they're not getting income and they can't pay their rent or whether they're not getting, and they can't pay their rent where they live, but they can't pay their rent out of their business. I think that we as a government have asked them to shelter in place. And now there's these unforeseen consequences. I think that I would, and, and with the likelihood that schools aren't going to open normally in the fall and kids can be back at school for like at most two days a week or one day a week, I think the, the likelihood that some of these people are going to be going back right away is going to be unlikely. And I know that the initial uh, protection was given when we thought we had the earlier opening, but as things are getting more delayed, I think it's our responsibility to extend this right now. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. Uh, thank you. As I understand, the first part of this motion is restricted solely to this idea, adopting an emergency ordinance, amending and extending the emergency ordinance to prevent residential or commercial evictions for non-payment of rent as a result of economic losses related to the coronavirus pandemic. That's all that this one does. My, what I uh, understand from Tony is that the California Judicial Council's order achieves that uh, for 90 days after the end of the governor's emergency declaration. Is, have I understood that correctly, Tony? So we bought, and Sandy, you're shaking your head. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get clear on what the facts are here. So we have in existence now a 90-day ban on processing an eviction request for any reason, not even related to COVID. Is that correct, Tony? I think I've tried to get. That's my understanding, yes. Yeah. And Tony did prepare a confidential memo for us for obvious reasons, it says confidential, and I'm not going to read it. <laughs> but yeah, I took it seriously. Um, other information has come up, and, and many other requests have been made. Um, I know we have also, uh, Kath, Catherine asked about what else can the city done, have, have we done, can we do, have we done. Um, to assist people right now who are um, suffering from economic hardship. And my understanding is we did make some large allocations to um, uh, Second Harvest and other, other groups that were doing um, emergency food distributions. This is just as a poor example, not related to housing, but trying to meet emergency needs. Um, I'm certainly willing to um, discuss uh, other possibilities. But um, given what was said in the legal memo about the risk to the city, coupled with the fact that there is apparently in existence a 90-day uh, prohibition on processing any evictions other than those absolutely necessary for protection of health and welfare, um, uh, I don't feel comfortable going ahead right, this, right, right now with this. Um, I think of discussion about what's appropriate at the local level, looking at the totality of all the other entities and partners out there, um, that's something we we should continue doing. I was muted. Um, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just have a just a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, I co-sponsored the, the initial moratorium with the mayor, um, and literally, I think we wrote that within the 20, first 24 hours of, of basically the closure. Um, the county was developing it, uh, theirs as well. Um, Tony was looking at what San Mateo was going to do, I believe, um, or San Jose, city of San Jose was first out of the gate. Um, 
and I think you know that that language we developed it obviously has held up. Um, it um, seems to at least have prevented uh, people getting out of you know getting uh, evicted right now. At least from what we can tell, we don't know. Um, I echo the mayor's. Uh, I echo um, former Mayor Watkins' comments about the city of Watsonville. I think that. I think their approach to really convening um, folks was a really good idea. They have, um, you know, a, a task force that's made up of um, landlords, private developers, property managers, commercial landlords, realtors, affordable housing developers, and landlords, tenant advocates, tenant services, and lenders. And uh, it's an impressive, uh, impressive list. Um, good, good policy approach to something that none of us can forecast. Um, but what really popped out in their report to me was um, there is some pending um, both federal and state actions that we don't quite know what the outcome is going to be yet on. Um, also, um, I was missing a little bit of the detail about the CARES Act in the, um, it would have been kind of good to know uh, a little bit more about how the CARES Act has landed for people. Um, and I know it's, it's, um, irregular in its in its impact and benefit to people certainly um, I've learned that by talking to a lot of a lot of different people about it um, there's a couple things though the heroes act being the most um, obvious one which is um, currently in negotiations and right now the language in that would provide for 12 month moratorium on evictions um, as well as amending the cares act uh, with regards to uh, no longer uh, limiting to federally backed mortgage loans. So there's there's some important language in the, in the HEROES Act that I think um, it would be really good to know what's gonna happen with that particular piece of legislation. Um, also, there's SB 1410, which um, would make direct rental payments to help tenants who cannot afford to pay their rent. And that payments would cover at least 80% of the unpaid rent attributable to the pandemic. And that's um, in the Housing Committee, Committee on Housing for um, the Senate. And similarly, AB 828 um, has similar, uh, similar benefits. Uh, both of those are in the Committee on Housing right now. And we received information from our lobbyists on Friday that um, these housing bills are being fast-tracked right now through the legislature, um, through the le state legislature, recognizing that housing is the key ingredient that um, will keep California successful and not have us um, have uh, a huge amount of impact on, on both, um, or just throughout communities throughout the state. So I could be supportive of, of, of like a 30 day extension only because, um, I mean, obviously I co-sponsored the first moratorium. I believe that there is real risk to our community, but I also, um, we would have never known that the CARES Act was gonna hit. We didn't know what these different things were gonna hit from federal and state legislation. I think this is unfortunately something that's gonna be around for a long time. Um, I could support a 30 day extension, say through June 30th. Um, and I really think it's important that we as quickly as possible, figure out a way to um, help um, people with the 230,000 that we do have available for uh, residential um, rental relief, uh, and especially to undocumented immigrants if possible, so we can get as far extension as we can. Um, even if we were able to provide a thousand, you know, a thousand dollars to those that need it. Um, we can help 230 families. So I don't, I, I would be very sad to see that at the end of the fiscal year, we had money sitting in that account. And so I think it's really important that we do that outreach and that we as council prioritize that for both our communications of the city, as well as um, the departments responsible for doing that outreach. So um, I understand that the, the interest, but we could call a, a, a special meeting if needed to, to protect people to stay in their homes and in their businesses. But at this point, I would um, very much support a 30 day extension, but then really look to um, deploying the resources we have right now on hand. They're already sitting, you know, sitting with these organizations and making sure that we're using those as quickly as possible to keep people in their homes. Um, and then I'm really interested and I think we should very much stay on top of these pieces of legislation and either join our other cities in the region 
uh, writing a regional letter of support for these kinds of investments. Um, but right now I'm, I'm not, um, I, I feel like extending things to August 15th, again, we're balancing the need of, of lots of different folks here, people who have the mortgages, people who are, are, are the rent payers. Um, I think with, with COVID, we've learned, we've learned that slow as you go is, 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 pro, is a proactive way of trying to manage everyone that's at risk right now. So thank you. Council Member Brown. Uh, uh, hi, thank you. Uh, so a couple of points just based on what I'm hearing in the discussion, this is still kind of mostly about part one here of the um, recommendation. Um, just a couple of points. One, I would say that you know, I don't know where the housing authority is at with the funding that they receive for rental assistance, but I can tell you that CAB is on track to extend all of that money like in the very near future, I don't have the exact times, but they're, um, they've had requests that far exceed the, what they have available as with the other, the um, disaster relief assistance uh, fund that I discussed earlier. So I don't think there's gonna be any problem there. Um, and another question, I guess, kind of question comment, um, Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that in the case of local actions where there's some ambiguity about our uh, potential liability, uh, we have heard that it's possible to, um, you know, should we take an action that is subject to a lawsuit that we can then defend that rather than going to court. So the idea that we would commit ourselves to expending a lot of money defending a lawsuit is not necessarily the case if we were to follow up with a different decision should we um, find ourselves in, in troubled waters legally. I, <clears throat> yes, Councilmember Brown, I agree with that statement. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Watkins. Um, I just want to thank the uh, my colleagues for the discussion because I think this is, I mean, as we all know, and what we heard is this is a critical issue that we want to try to stay on top of and do the best we can to um, create good policy to support those uh, vulnerable here. Um, I guess I'm just wondering in terms of trying to move uh, move us along here and, and, and get something that hopefully uh, provides those protections and uh, also protects the city from uh, legal challenge, uh, if we can, uh, and. And I, I appreciate some of the comments that Vice Mayor uh, Myers mentioned, but maybe just to try to get the conversation moving for the interest of discussion, um, I'll go ahead and make a motion to direct staff to track um, sort of the state policy that's ongoing and evolving and mirror those protections as needed locally. To extend uh, our temporary ordin ordinance until June 30th um, and ask that the mayor uh, call a special meeting if need be uh, to extend beyond that and defer to um, the executive order and judicial order number one and work. And then I think, I guess this is also where I think we, I'll guess I'll pause my motion there for the interest of the minutes in our city clerk. So I wanna acknowledge my uh, narrative going into my motion. But I do wanna um, then now open up a conversation around what I observed just briefly when looking at the Watsonville item about the outreach. And they have a whole robust community marketing campaign that they want to get out to their community so that those who are the most vulnerable know what the resources are in their community. And as well, they have a, um, a temporary moratorium, uh, eviction moratorium task force comprised of the folks that Vice Mayor Myers uh, referenced uh, to be on uh, hand as needed to help their community, their council address these uh, evolving uh, issues. So I, I think that, that I think is the second part of the of the item. But I I just really want to say that I I support that as well. But in the interest of trying to move forward in a in a way that hopefully balances all the competing challenges, is that's my motion. Okay, um, so we have a motion made by Council Member Watkins. Um, I know Council Member Brown had discussed making a motion earlier, so I don't know if there's any reconciliation between 
the action was, that was just taken on Councilmember Brown, your interest in making a motion, but then wanting to have um, have other council members weigh in. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I guess um, what I w am thinking at this point would be to because I had some I, I have some uh, ideas for a motion for the second part of this. Uh, a gender report, and so I'd like to maybe keep those separate rather than combining them all because it, it sounds like we may have some uh, differences about um, specifically what we would want to consider moving forward. Um, in terms of the, um, I, and I appreciate uh, Council Member Watkins, your, the additions that you've uh, provided to the uh, extension, the eviction moratorium extension, um, so I want to I want to say that I, I support those. I think it's a it's important to um, to think about how it is that we outreach and engage with the community uh, as we move forward in this really uh, rapidly shifting landscape. Um, in terms of the question about June thirtieth, I, I mean, I you know, if that is the will of the council, I, um, I that I mean, I can support that. But I, I just I guess I'm just not clear why August 15th would be um, so much more risky than June 30th. Um, the reason, as uh, Mayor Cummings said, that we said August 15th was to um, ensure that we were covered through the month that we're on um, on break. And I don't know, um, maybe Tony, you could remind us, would we be able to, to, or to extend an ordinance at a special meeting? My, I seem, I feel like I recall that that's we can't do that. It has to be a regularly scheduled meeting. Um, I believe you can adopt an emergency ordinance at a special meeting, but uh, if you just um, if you want to continue with your comments or council wants to continue, I'll confirm that. I know you cannot finally adopt a regular ordinance except at a, a regular meeting, but let me check the charter on that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I guess what I what I would like to do then is just um, reserve, I, I would like to make a motion after we complete this portion of the conversation about uh, moving forward with, with other discussions at our, a future meeting. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and leave the, the motion on the floor, but I will say my, my preference would be to just um, extend it through August 15th. I mean, nobody's going to be all of a sudden flush with money to pay all their back rent and, and take care of all this you know, on, on July 1st. So I think uh, we're, it's pretty clear what's, what we're looking at moving forward, that it's not gonna get any better for a while. Um, so I'll just leave it there for now and step back in once we finish with this. And just following up on your question, um, the rule about uh, adopting an ordinance at a special meeting is not applicable to an emergency ordinance. So you would be able to do that. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have a motion on the floor by Council Member Watkins. Uh, I just want to check with the city clerk. Bonnie, were you able to capture that motion? Um, I got direct staff to track state policy that is ongoing and evolving and mirror that. <laughs> Extend the moratorium until June 30th and ask the mayor to, call, to schedule a special meeting and refer to executive order one. That's all I got. Does that capture the motion that you made, Councilmember Watkins? Yeah, um, thank you. And and to uh, Councilmember Brown's uh, point that I think also there will be a question of how to move forward with the, um, uh, the outreach plans and next steps to support our vulnerable communities. So if, I think there will be another motion, but I think I just stopped it for this particular point. But I think that that captures it essentially. Okay. And, and I'll just maybe say to the June 30th, if I, if I may, while I have the floor, it sounds to me that since um, other jurisdictions aren't really extending theirs and they're relying on um, kind of the judicial orders and the other policies, and the only other one we hear from is uh, San Mateo. It seems sort of like. Also, knowing that the mayor can, can also provide or call a special meeting, it sounds like a nice kind of compromise without as much risk is sort of my thoughts on that. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Um, I know Councilmember Byers had her hand raised before, but, I'm, but I'd like to see if we can get a second on the motion. I'll second the motion. Okay, so we have a motion made by Councilmember 
Watkins, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers, Council Member Byers. Thank you. Um, is Bonnie uh, around? Bonnie Lipscomb? Uh, yes, I'm here. Oh, thanks, Bonnie. I still wanted to follow up how we can help people. Uh, some of those things are going to take months, and it, it really concerns me. Um, what and the whole idea of maybe a, a freeze or a moratorium on rent increase for commercial? I mean, you you know the tenor downtown and what's going on. Have, I wonder if you had some ideas of how we can help both the businesses and our and our wonderful renters and people um, that we could give you direction to come back in a few weeks with some ideas. There, there's got to be other ideas out there. People are doing things and. And it's just kind of hard at, you know, an eight-hour meeting coming up with these things when it really takes staff to look at uh, look at all of this and maybe give you some direction to look at it and see if there's, you've come up or your colleagues in other places have come up uh, with viable ways of helping, whether it's with their rent or um, moratorium on rent increases for commercial, rent increase, um, moratorium for businesses. Anyway. I'm turning to you, Bonnie. Um, well, if you want to provide that direction, I would be happy to come back with some options for you to consider. Um, I, I think if you could um, maybe have the discussion and frame it a little more of what type of funding um, you would like us to, to look into, because I, I, I think what's needed and what we're hearing from so many businesses is just the lack of available resources. So. From a commercial perspective, um, it's it's always been a balance. So our uh, microloan program, where we provided the 500,000, that went out to 51 businesses, and there's definitely the need is much greater. But it, that that balance and that discussion, I think, is um, in the context of our overall budget deficit, is where and what funding source we're using, you know, for what purpose. So. If we're talking commercial businesses, we do have available our economic development trust fund, but at the same time, we're we're in such an economic uncertainty that I know we've been we've been cautious on how how we're utilizing that funding. So we've been offsetting um, businesses as well as providing the free business kits that you know we've been doing over the last two weeks. So that's gone out to 200 businesses so far, and. Um, that includes, you know, everything that businesses need to reopen, including the hard to source, you know, san um, right. you know, sanitizer and, you know, all of those things. But if we're talking rental assistance, um, I just need a little feedback on what funding source you're comfortable with us tapping into. I think when we go on the residential side, that's where we've been pretty successful in getting the federal funding to offset that. And we really, we're pursuing every opportunity. The other thing that we're in the process of is we're pulling together an application to the Economic Development Administration for an expanded countywide revolving loan that would be broken out proportionately across the jurisdictions within the county. And there's a, a local match provided, but there's, that's a really good use of our local resources because we can leverage that five times. So those are the types of things that we're working on now. So it would be really good to get some feedback from you on which of those areas you would like us to go a little deeper. And then we can come back to you and present you sort of a, a menu of opportunities as well as funding sources that uh, that are available to do that and those that are both sort of grant funded that we could apply for or in process versus those that we can tap into existing revenue sources. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, one thing, I, I certainly have no idea what our possible funding sources are. So we could just outline whom we want to help and you come back with that. Um, I mean, we you've can, already mentioned some funding sources that I don't know anything about, so I, I just couldn't do that. But Yeah. I will say one thing we're doing right now is that we do have a pretty intensive survey of all businesses right now, so we're getting some really good feedback okay. from businesses. So we can take that as well and look at what feedback we're getting, and we have that by industry, that they're saying by industry within the city of what their top needs are, and we can we can – you know, sort of bring that together and share that data with you as well. Well, maybe by our next meeting, which is in two weeks, you could come back with, um, you 
we've heard a lot of discussion. You're down there talking to the businesses and a lot of other people uh, come in with some suggestions to how to help both the commercial and our uh, citizens. If that seems okay, I think you understand the parameters or we understand. Yes, I, I can definitely do that. We'll have to, I, we'll, I assume we have to have a motion on that. But yeah, maybe that's I'm wondering if what we can do is we can um, maybe take care of this first item and then after that we can make another motion. We can make a, se a second or motion. Or could we just add it to an uh, addendum to the motion? Either way. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll let um, our city manager chime in real quick. It looks like you. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add. So a couple of things with respect to the question of uh, a rental. Uh, freeze or, or cap, um, we certainly would be happy to do some additional research there. But from what um, we're seeing is that uh, at this point in time, there, there really isn't uh, an incentive to increase rents. I think most landlords are actually trying to keep tenants, and, and so they're very much focused on Good. how to keep tenants. And since uh, really uh, businesses are struggling with uh, revenues and, and being able to make rents, uh, and uh, landlords, uh, many are struggling with mortgages, um, there really isn't, a, at least when we've seen, you know, a, a big challenge with, with uh, rent increases at this point in time. Again, we could do more research. I'm not aware of any cities or anyone doing anything actively on that front, uh, but we can look into it. And then with respect to uh, additional resources, as, as Bonnie pointed out, uh, it would just be a matter of really trying to, to figure out uh, with resources we can we can also uh, muster to be able to to be responsive to that uh, and that really is the central challenge we have because we uh, at this point really the only uh, source is our own general fund which is uh, obviously in, in jeopardy and or some additional resources from the state and federal which we're really focusing on trying to provide and get some assistance from from them there's also the stimulus package which is being worked on which, uh, as I understand, is intended to include additional resources and assistance to um, uh, businesses as well as uh, individuals. Uh, uh, and, and so I think a lot of uh, a lot of work can be done, hopefully, to try to get that to move forward. If that if that uh, uh, does move forward, that can also make a significant significant difference to businesses, individuals, and cities and, and counties as well. So that's our dilemma: is that uh, we're all limited to with respect to resources. So it's a question of how do we um, obtain additional resources and assistance to be able to, to help uh, our businesses and our residents, uh, and as well as uh, uh, to be able to keep our essential services operating. So that is our challenge. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor Myers, your hand was up, and I think it went up a lot of time when um, Council Member Watkins was making her motion, but I wanted to just uh, see if you had anything. I'm good, thank you. Uh, Council Member Matthews. Yeah, I think the whole topic of, of the appropriate type and level of assistance for um, Santa Cruz-based businesses, that's another whole issue. It's very interesting, but um, uh, regarding the motion that's on the floor, um, I don't fully understand it. So the first one is to track state policy and to mirror that. Now, what does that mean? I understand extending extending the emergency ordinance to June 13th, 30th, I understand that. But the first part of the motion, I think I wrote down, to track state policy and mirror that. What does that mean? I, uh, if I may, uh, Mayor, I think essentially looking at how it's just so rapidly changing in terms of the state policies, and maybe it was sort of a rushed motion, so I'm happy to do some wordsmithing if need be, but um, looking at what we can do at the local level uh, to enhance our policies that uh, are also being supported at the state level. But I'm happy to, I'm happy to have some wordsmithing around that. Well, you know me, I like to know the words before I vote on them. So um, and then the other, I believe the third part of that motion was uh, something about an outreach plan. And that, again, that's people and resources. So um, uh, I think extending the uh, emergency ordinance 
um, spending residential and commercial evictions for non-payment of rent as a result of COVID emergencies for one more month. I don't personally see the need for it, but I can accept it. Um, the tracking state policies and the outreach plans, I'd want to know more. And then I do, I do support the idea of getting an inventory of resources, both for residential and residents and for our businesses, and seeing how we can identify the um, anticipated emerging resources and particularly leverage our local dollars to make the most out of those. But I don't yet see that in the language. Mayor, um, one of the things I guess I would say is that we haven't necessarily, I think, had the conversation around the outreach plan at this point, so that at this time is not a part of the motion. But I think in terms of tracking the state policy is just sort of recognizing that this is a really um, fast-paced, like evolving situation, right? And so the governor may, governor may extend his uh, his uh, order or other state policy might come in or a more uh, restrictive uh, shelter in place might be a reconstituted, I think just monitoring, I guess, instead of um, tracking is a better word, but just recognizing that this is changing so quickly. So how do we remain nimble? It's the intention behind that statement. What I, what I gather that you mean by this is monitoring the evolving state policies and resources related to COVID economic stress period and extend the eviction moratorium till June 30th. Are those good things? Yeah. I mean, that, I think that, that captures it. Because whether it's policies or resources, we want to be knowing what they are and responding to them. Yeah, and not only the economic policies and resources, but also just what's happening with our renters and, and the housing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That works for the vice mayor as well. Yeah, something like monitoring state policies to include possible extension of governor's orders or state legislation focused on rental relief actions that are longer term and evaluate for action by city council. That might be a way to capture it. Okay. Um, I think we're gonna need- Noodling. <laughs> we're gonna need one solid um, motion uh, just for final clarification before we take this vote to the body and capture it appropriately in the notes. So, Vice Mayor, Myers, do you want to restate what you just said? Yeah. So, the motion would be to extend the existing emergency moratorium um, until June 30th, 2020 and monitor state policies to include possible extension of governor's orders or state legislation focused on rental relief actions that are longer <clears throat> that are longer term and evaluate for action by city council I think that's my start with that. Yeah. Um, and then I think in terms of the outreach, we could direct staff to um, to assure that uh, existing resources are deployed with nonprofit partners as quickly as possible with a report back to council in August to get a sense of whether the resources are holding up or if they're errors, as Council Member Brown mentioned, they might be gone in a week, we don't know. So maybe getting a sense of, getting a sense of how quickly things are going out the door so we, we can make adjustments. Is that, uh, is that amenable to you, Council Member Watkins? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So we have, is there any further questions? I know that Council Member Matthews, your hand is. I hate, I hate to do this, but it's, um, the language that we just put forward had to do with rental relief actions. And 
what we've really focused on is eviction. eviction. Point. That can include people who can't make their mortgages. So whether you want to say residential protection or something, yeah, that's just a question. Do you want to include it to that or do you want to keep it focused on that? Our, our original emergency moratorium was for both commercial and residential, so I'd like it to be consistent. Um, and it was, I don't believe I don't believe the governor's order, though, the initial order. And Tony, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe that it covered commercial. I believe that 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 was a anomaly that we had, or not an anomaly, but we had an intent to also extend it to commercial properties, if I remember correctly. I believe that's correct, but I can um, quickly check that. So I, I'm sorry, Council Member Matthews, I'm not completely clear on your question, whether no, or not that- I answered my own question. The, the moratorium is related only to evictions for non-payment of rent. It, has, it doesn't get into the others at all, so I'm good. Okay, thank you. Did you have any further uh, questions or comments, Council Member Matthews? <laughs> okay. Uh, I saw um, a couple of hands up, so uh, Council Member Byers. Real quick, uh, this probably uh, not for, for Martine. Doesn't the staff, it seems to me Bonnie does a lot of that, pour over what the legislature is doing all the time and seeing what they can't grab some money? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's so just we, a day to day exercise, I assume. By yes, yes. So we, we monitor legislation. Moreover, we have our, our lobbyists, both at the state and yeah. federal level, and we ask them to particularly pay attention to issues that are particularly important to to the council and to the city and to track them for us. So, yes, we'll, we'll do that. I just assume that. So, this motion is fine, but you're doing it. Yeah. No. Okay. And just to clarify, uh, responding to Vice Mayor Myers' question. Um, the uh, the governor's March 16th order did, did uh, reference both residential and commercial eviction. Oh, it did. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, great. Um, Vice Mayor Myers, I saw your hand was up prior to Council Member Byers. Did you have a, another comment? No, okay. Council Member Brown. Uh, well, so I, I'm actually just have my hand up to kind of talk about the the next piece of this. So, but I so I want to wait till we have a vote on this piece, this motion. Okay. So that's my hands up for that. Okay. So without, I think um, doesn't seem like there's any further comment on this portion of the motion of the item that's before us. So I'll turn it over to the city clerk uh, so that we can take a roll call vote. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Oh, there she is. Sorry, I said aye. I didn't know if you heard me. I didn't. Uh, Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. And so um, now kind of moving on to the second part of this was a discussion of um, potential options for protecting residential and commercial tenants impacted by COVID-19 pandemic response and directing staff to return for city council consideration and action at future meetings as appropriate. And so I have council member Brown. Yeah, I, so I want to make a motion here and uh, just as a caveat, just to say these, this is a, the, the, what's included in this were, was a brainstorm that some of us did or that I've had in conversation with people in the community as well as with Mayor Cummings about possible angles that, you know, things that a city could do um, it, as a response to the COVID crisis. And so I'm gonna, uh, I'll state them, but I also sent this to Bonnie, so I don't know if you wanna put it up, um, if, that, if you got that email. Um, thank you. So the first part is already done. Um, so 
Um, the sec so what I was hoping we could uh, talk about now is, you know, I'll just move that as part of the city's COVID-19 pandemic response that we direct staff to return to the council. Um, here I have at the June 23rd meeting uh, for starters, with options to provide temporary relief to residential and local businesses, business tenants, including uh, one uh, a draft ordinance to enact a temporary moratorium on commercial rent increases uh, to the extent we can legally do that, uh, two, a draft ordinance to enact a temporary moratorium on residential rent increases, three, possibilities for de developing a payment plan program for residential and commercial tenants to pay back rents over time, uh, and four, other possibilities for the city to provide additional support to oh, uh, small business and uh, 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 residential tenants. Sorry, I don't know where that went. Um, so that's uh, the motion I'd like to make. And just I think we number four, we already started talking about some other possibilities. Maybe we can add some uh, some clarity to that piece. Um, there's my motion. Thanks. Thanks. A motion by Councilmember Brown. I'm happy to second. Oh, Councilmember Byers. Well, on number four, I think um, we're working with Bonnie that, yes, look for pots of money, but not general funds of those that in any way affect our services uh, and come back. If, if there is such a thing, I'm not using the right words. I'm way overdue to take a break. But um, for her to come back to us, uh, if she can identify any fun funding sources in order to pr provide some relief to businesses or tenants, some financial relief. So I'm just adding to number four, I think. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and second the motion um, that's on the floor. So um, is that language, Sandy, um, accepted? Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to, I mean, I think there's some discussion to be had in particular about number four, what we mean when we say other possibilities. Okay. Yeah. Um, Councilmember Matthews. Um, well, this is a case where I would really like to involve um, what we're learning from the community uh, as well as just asking staff to cook it up. Um, gosh. Um, it seems to me um, very specific if we're expecting Bonnie to do this, we're throwing half the world on her shoulders right now already. Um, I, I would almost feel more comfortable leaving this fairly vague. Uh, asking the mayor to consult with staff about um, uh, 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 a reasonably prompt way to um, to bring together some um, um, community thought on this. It's not good language, but. Uh, Are you talking about just four or all of them? Well, that, um, that whole number two, a draft ordinance to enact temporary moratorium. Well, could we ask Tony to do on those? The, just on the commercial rent thing, as, as someone said previously, you know, the, the commercial landlords are, are fearful they're going to be losing tenants, and certainly some number of people think the commercial rent is going to stabilize or go down just so they can keep people in them. So. Uh, there again, I think a better understanding of what's on the ground would be helpful to us to, there. Um, a temporary moratorium on residential rent increases, is that more important than the uh, uh, moratorium on evictions for non-payment? Uh, certainly maybe uh, talking to community partners and banks, I mean, what, is, what are the possibilities for uh, a payback plan? I think it's, it's um, Certainly, in some people's mind, that this is a moratorium on rent, which it's not. 
so just better clarity on, on what our priorities here and, and, and certainly uh, involving some people in the discussion who are closer to the financial aspects of this uh, would, would be a benefit, I think. If I could just um, mention something, I think that you touched on a number of good points. Um, <laughs> I would say that um, as far as rent increase, the commercial side of rent increases, my understanding is that um, some commercial leases, general, generally commercial leases are, are um, you know, longer durations in time, and built into those leases are annual increases in those rents. And so um, I've spoken with some um, business owners whose landlords, for example, don't want to budge on um, the rent they're paying and are expecting to have all that rent paid back. And, you know, obviously people are not being, you know, released from their leases. And so I think the, the intention here is that if a rent increase is um, anticipated to occur within a commercial um, lease and those businesses aren't operating, that, you know, it would, if there's any way that the city could protect those tenants from being in place of those increases, uh, it would be good for us to do so um, when there's situations where, where property owners don't want to um, kind of waive that increase. As far as the rent increases, similarly, I think when this first hit, um, I reached out to a number of property management companies, and they, again, said that, you know, they had um, rent incre annual rent increases built into their leases for the tenants, and that they were not interested in um, eliminating those increases at this time. Um, a number of people, when the COVID-19, in March when this first hit, and we had these emergency um, this emergency ordinance come before us, there were people who reached out and said that they had just got a rent increase and were looking at losing their jobs. And so, um, and now one of the things that we're faced with is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of folks who are either losing their jobs or they're faced with pay cuts. And some of these people who reached out to me about this had uh, struggled to find housing, they got housing, they got a new job, and now um, they're seeing a reduction in their pay and they faced a rent increase in March, and now um, the pay is being reduced, and that's putting them in a, a very difficult situation financially as well. So that's kind of the intention around um, these, and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, have discussions with people in the community on this, but I think that the whole intention is really trying to um, protect people and businesses uh, as we're still being, you know, impacted by COVID-19. Um, Council Member Byers, you have your hand raised, and you're muted. Sorry, I no, I have nothing to add or say right now. Okay, Council Member Brown, and then Council Member Matt or Watkins. Sorry. Yeah, hi, thank you. So. Um, I guess, so I, I um, in response to Council Member Matthews, your point about uh, talk, engaging with uh, various stakeholders, I'm all for that. Uh, right now, what, you know, like Mayor Cummings, what I know is what I've heard kind of anecdotally from friends, acquaintances, people who um, have communicated with me uh, as a council member, also the the folks who are um, uh, working with Tenant Sanctuary, that um, there is, uh, you know, kind of an ongoing challenge here. So I, I'd be, you know, I, I'd welcome, very much welcome uh, some outreach and engagement around that. I don't know uh, in terms of the, the challenge of staff resources, what it would take to do something like that. So I would ask, um, I think Bonnie, um, or and or others, uh, maybe in the city manager's office, what how realistic that is to kind of do that kind of process. I, I personally don't think it would require a huge investment of resources, but generally when we start talking public engagement, what we get back um, is like a proposal that is going to take a lot of staff time. And since I don't know kind of all of the ins and outs of what it would entail um, from from your perspective, I'd like to know more about that before kind of directing it. But I would I would welcome that conversation. Um, I think that 
the with in response to the the point about uh, you know mark rent in, rents are not necessarily going to be increasing and I think writ large that's the case I mean the market is gonna um, will will tell us um, what uh, you know where rents are going to go and I you know as we've seen in some some big cities that actually have some data tracking and um, have been able to uh, provide some data on this I mean rents are you know, 15% in decrease um, in, you know, just two, two months' time um, in some places. And so I think overall, this is not going to, uh, you know, doing some kind of uh, moratorium on rent increases, commercial and residential, would not be um, a real hardship for, um, well, I guess it, it, it wouldn't affect very many people because there, there most likely will be decisions that are made kind of marked based on what's happening in the market. But for those who are um, not um, having that experience, we know we have, um, you know, larger absentee landlords in our community who have the ability, and I mean for the multi-unit uh, complexes, et cetera, they have the ability to wait and not rent, uh, to maintain higher rents. And, and so I say, and or increase the rent. And, you know, if they don't get it, then, you know, they still have, they have that cushion. They have the ability to, um, to weather a uh, short downturn. And so I, I just feel like it would be a protection that while it probably wouldn't affect a huge number of uh, tenants, that it, it could actually be a real benefit to those who, um, as Mayor Cummings suggested, um, have a situation where they just don't ha they have uh, landlords who are unable or unwilling to do that. And so I, I guess I'd just leave it there on the, um, the question of, of rent increases. Um, and again, this was in it, there's no date on it, but the intention is that this would be during temporary during this, uh, this period of extreme crisis. Um, and I think I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Uh, council members Watkins and Golder and then Vice Mayor Myers. Um, I just have a quick question because I think for me, I see the first part of the motion as um, sort of more exploratory and then I sort of see the second part as more prescriptive. Um, so I'm, I'm personally more comfortable with sort of looking at the various options which could include some of the prescriptive uh, elements, but not um, necessarily having those come back on the 23rd, I guess, because I just don't, I don't quite know, but I'd like to see if maybe Tony would want to weigh in on what that type of um, ordinance would look like. Well, I, I've given it a bit of thought because I've been part of the same, I mean, I've had some of the same communications as council members with members of the community. Um, I have. I have a lot of questions about a commercial, uh, a moratorium on commercial rent increases, and, and one of one of those was already called out, and that has to do with the fact that most commercial leases are for multiple years and have the rent increases built into the lease agreement. And there's a question in my mind about whether or not the city can legislate in a way that impairs a contractual. Uh, arrangement between an existing commercial tenant and, and a landlord. Um, the, the reason why I think it's more of a question with regard to commercial than it is with residential tenants is that most residential leases are not for more than a, a year or maybe two years uh, at the top. And, and most uh, residential tenants, when they move in, do not um, perform a bunch of ex expensive tenant improvements on their residential rental unit, whereas most commercial, uh, for, for commercial tenants, it's a big investment to move into a new commercial space. And so they need a long-term lease to, um, to to ensure that they have an opportunity to recoup the capital investment that they make in entering into a lease agreement. So that's a, that's a big concern. Um, secondly is the fact that I'm not aware of another commercial uh, uh, rent control scheme in the state of California, although I've not done exhaustive research on that. I do not think that the Costa Hawkins uh, law would apply here. So um, based on you know what I understand of the existing uh, legislative framework for this, I don't believe there's a state law that expressly would prohibit the city from 
uh, entering into a commercial rent um, moratorium or or a commercial rent increase ordinance. And, and then again, as with some of the other topics that we've discussed tonight, is the fact that it would only be in effect during a declared emergency, and the city has additional authorities in a declared emergency than it does uh, in the absence of one. Um, the big question that comes to my mind with respect to the residential moratorium is Costa Hawkins. Uh, I am aware of a couple of other cities. I think I think Berkeley, Oakland, and San Jose have all enacted emergency uh, rent freeze or uh, rent increase moratoriums in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. But as I read those, and I did not do exhaustive analysis on it, I read those uh, those moratorium provisions would only apply to tenants that were already in rent controlled units and not to residential tenants generally. So, so there's some potential areas there that would all need to be researched. Um, I, I don't have a problem with uh, the timing for June 23rd in terms of drafting something, but it would be brought to the council as a work in progress and, and the, um, you know, uh, whether or not we can do all the necessary research in order to give you a, a confident opinion on its defensibility is something that um, remains to be seen. But if that's the council direction, I'm, I'm certain that we can have something for the council to at least discuss on the 23rd. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins, does that conclude your comments or questions? I guess, I, yes. <laughs> I think, um, you know, I, I, I feel a little bit more confused, I have to say, but I guess what I ultimately see this going towards is really three and four. And, and so what are we doing to find ways to support our small businesses and residential tenants? Um, when we get into sort of these difficult kind of uh, legally uh, ordinances, I, I I just don't. I don't. I don't know if I. If I'm just not understanding Tony, correct, you know, as clearly as I as I could. But um, I just don't. I don't have enough clarity on what that could be. Other than that, I think what it's intended to do is to sort of get to three and four, which is trying to support these folks. So those are my comments, I guess. Okay. Uh, Council Member Colder. So I was also a little confused on some of the. Um, wording and one of them was the word temporary and one and two is that just designed for during the I mean they just seemed super vague to me so I didn't know what what if there was you know months years what what that looked like um, and then the other one um, was four it, I feel like four is kind of already happening and and maybe someone could speak to that um, Councilmember Brown that's why you Put your hand up so maybe you want to speak to it and yeah uh so yeah the intention well and again i didn't i, I didn't flush this out um so I, I didn't give a lot of detail on what the intention was aside from was considering this kind of temporary ordinance but yeah the the intention that i had in in drafting this was to have this be in effect temporarily during the while the or emergency order is in effect so just temporarily during this time. And, um, and then number four, um, yeah, I think we, we have been talking about this and I guess what I would be interested in having a bit more of a conversation about is kind of in response to Bonnie's sort of question or, or uh, prompt to the council about uh, further direction on, on what we might be willing to do um, or consider in terms of what uh, what additional assistance we, we might provide. And I think that that is sort of up in the air. I mean, the um, Economic Development Trust Fund was mentioned. I know we have, I mean, we are looking at massive, massive cuts on so many levels. It's hard to imagine, uh, you know, allocating any serious resources to this. And we also know that we, as a local jurisdiction, we just don't have the uh, the resources and capacity to really solve this problem, or even temporarily, um, uh, you know, help this problem on a on a um, the scale that it's needed. So I do think that uh, you know, kind of looking at the the mix of you know what's available, and I know I trust our our staff is going to do that. They're going to track and find whatever resources um, we might have um, the ability to to 
to get access to at the state and federal level. And um, so if there are places, for example, where there might be the potential to match or leverage money if we, if the, if our local, um, if we were willing to put up something, then I, I just feel like those are, those are questions that would be worth considering further. Um, and so, but I want to kind of hear what others have to say. I just, I, Bonnie asked for a little more clearer uh, direction in terms of our intention. And so I think that would be helpful if we're going to move forward with that piece. And I'll just, I guess, follow up with that by stating, I remember at a previous meeting, we kind of got a update on the um, small business emergency loans. I mean, I think this is another area where, you know, I guess it was mentioned that if council wanted to, you know, increase or provide additional funding, for example, in another $500,000 um, $500, towards that loan, I mean, this could be an opportunity where we could have a discussion about some of the different types of, you know, areas of funding, and then where would we like to see that funding go? So, um, you know, a recommendation could be that we have an additional 500, add an additional $500,000 to a small loan program, or maybe there's other ways that we can, um, there's other funds that we could then also apply um, in creating um, more opportunities for people to get resources. And um, and again, to talk to this, to, for the, as far as the um, moratorium on rental increases for both commercial and residential, I think Council Member Brown um, really spoke to it, that this is for during this emergency um, time period. And additionally, I mean, as we're moving forward, we don't know, um, you know, how many people are gonna actually receive federal funds. And so um, we could, you know, have something that's temporarily in place and then revisit it uh, in the future um, as we have a better sense of how many people are getting resources. And then, um, you know, maybe more, like an, another possibility could be to more heavily track how these resources are getting spent. So, um, but just, I guess, to clarify that, yes, these are the moratoriums on rent increases are meant for the state of emergency. And, um, and then there's these other options worth discussing as well. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers and then Councilmember Matthews. Um, what I, I, I was wondering, um, I guess one thought I had was, um, and the mayor and I have been talking with staff about this, um, is, is to try to kind of maybe take a little bit of a step back in terms of um, sort of developing our own recovery plan and really being able to identify the key areas of investment that we need to do for our community as we're gathering additional information. I know, for example, that economic development is doing a lot of work. They're doing a survey currently with um, businesses and, and trying to dig into some of the specifics. The chamber just um, updated and produced a survey of businesses. That, that one's countywide, but I know they, um, they, are, they also were able to identify which were city businesses and county businesses. So, and then there's the uh, business uh, council that's been um, put together with the help of the community foundation. So there's, again, just a lot of moving parts. And I'm wondering if we could move um, a more general um, proposal tonight, um, identifying some of these as key questions to answer and develop um, suggested language for um, so I'm, I'm gonna take a, maybe a crack at this um, to see if we can maybe get something that we could at least um, wrap up for, you know, for now, knowing that this work will be going ongoing. So I'm just wondering if the, if the if, uh, Council Member Brown, if you would consider something to the effect of, as part of the city's COVID-19 pandemic response, um, the mayor and staff um, will assess impacts to local businesses, residents, families, and gather information and data to the extent possible to inform uh, measures to protect, um, measures to 
protect um, against rent, rent increases, explore the development of a payment plan program for residential and commercial tenants to pay back rents over time, and continue with developing and increasing potential and potentially increasing support for local businesses, for local small businesses, something like that. Did anybody write that down? I just sort of winged it there. <laughs> I'm trying to scribble most of it. Okay. I'm just trying to see if we could um, put the intent together tonight and then um, I'm, okay, I, I'm okay with the June 23rd meeting. Um, I think Mayor Cummings, we were thinking about trying to bring sort of the skeletal out, uh, kind of outline of a recovery program that we would sort of, you know, as a city be enacting. And I'm wondering if this matches up with that. Um, and Council Member Watkins had discussed some of these, we had discussed some of these things as well through the HIAP program. I just, I'm not sure if this is fitting together. Um, I think, Mayor, you're probably the one that's been in m multiple conversations. I'm just curious to hear if, if this makes sense to you or if you can potentially nuance some of this with me as well. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, Council Member Brown, since you're the maker of the motion, maybe you can start and then I can follow up with some comments on that as well. Sure. Uh, so I, um, yeah, uh, Count, Vice Mayor Myers, I, I appreciate the, um, the thinking around kind of stepping back and, and wanting to have more information before you make some of these decisions. Um, although I, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, kind of a direction to further assess um, and gather data to come back at a certain point, which then will lead to another discussion is, um, I mean, I, I feel like that's a little bit far off and it also could entail uh, some, um, you know, additional resource time resources to try to um, develop an, an assessment that would actually be useful in making some of those decisions. Um, like what data would need to be gathered? How extensive would it be? You know, how much more would we really know beyond what we're kind of already seeing? Um, and so I, I'm wondering if, if perhaps um, maybe what I could what I could try to do here is, but I, I recognize the the issue about trying to move too fast without more information. So um, I'm wondering about if for um, rather than uh, return the draft ordinance, um, we said um, if you could just scroll back down a little bit, thank you, Bonnie. Um, uh, direct. So for number one and two, it would be. Um, including uh, an evaluation of the need and potential uh, for adopting a temporary moratorium on commercial and residential rent increases. Does that, and then just delete two and then the rest of that. So rather than the draft ordinances. Um, so I think that like just ha like having some evaluation to report back on those things, is, I don't know if that's way different than what you were suggesting. I'm just trying to, to kind of parse the, the word terms. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would be amenable to that. I think, I think, I think the intent is that, you know, these things don't take months and months, but that we're nimble enough to um, get a sense through our relationships with both business owners and, 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 and hopefully through some of the connections we have through, um, through tenants um, and tenant organizations that we can get a sense um, whether or not, and again, reflecting back on whether the state's gonna do something, you know, it's just, but yeah, I, I think I think that language looks a little, a little more one step back, which is what I was intending. And if I, if I could just jump in really quickly and then I'll um, let you move on, but um, would it, so would it be helpful to include something about, um, you know, in conversation with local business, um, and uh, I'm sure you, you mentioned um, maybe um, service providers who are involved in um, rental assistance and tenant protections or tenant legal services or something, um, would, would that 
would, would you like to see something about that um, kind of laid out in this first part? I, um, yeah, we could put that detail in there, although I trust, you know, the staff has a pretty good sense of, you know, the, the business organizations and some of the things, and I'm, you know, to the extent that they can utilize their existing network, um, uh, I think, you know, but I'm comfortable either way, either way, yeah. Yeah, if, I mean, if the intentions seem clear enough and staff is clear on that, then I, you know, I don't want to be more prescriptive than necessary, <laughs> like for our, you know, our staff to, um, they're yeah. the experts. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. And maybe one, you know, one way to capture that is after the period, um, we can maybe put a comma and then just say in consultation with community members and partners. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mayor, which period are you talking about? Right, exactly where you're at. Where it says uh, on commercial and residential, yeah, in consultation with um, community members and partners. Okay. Um, so then with this bottom paragraph, then get deleted since it's kind of captured in number two? Yeah, just get rid of that altogether. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Council Member Matthews. Uh, this is going in the right direction. Uh, I was not uh, so enthusiastic about expecting a fully cooked ordinance on June 30th. I think the idea that we're doing a little bit more litigation is, is better. Um, I'm just going to read it just for one sec. Okay, it's really clear it's related to the COVID pandemic, temporary relief. Um, and here it says temporary relief to residential and local business tenants. So it's just for tenants. I think in the bottom, um, maybe we should say, I don't know, this is just a, a number three, we talked about extending some sort of, and I think we all see this as some sort of bridge relief, um, possibility for the city to provide additional support to small business and residential tenants. But I think we were also thinking of it as um, support to the extent we can make sense to small businesses. Do others understand that in the same way? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it might pull around the language there. Does that language seem okay or? Well, it just, it seems to be in reference only to tenancy and not to the survival of the business per se. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe other possibilities for the city to provide additional support to small. I might just say uh, to the local residents and small businesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. There we go. That's a good cleanup. Local residents, P, as in P there. Yeah. P, there you go. Yeah. And you could just um, delete the other from and, yeah. Yep. And, and just, I'm just assuming that number two doesn't involve the city being a banker between a tenant and their landlord. No. Is yeah. that a correct assumption? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that would be a, a little much even, even for me. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I see the city manager had his hand up. So if you, uh, Martine, maybe if you wanted to uh, yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to just quickly reference uh, an item that will be coming before you that I think the Vice Mayor uh, referenced, and that is the discussions around our strategic planning process and our work plan and how they interrelate moving forward with the 
the COVID response and, and the strategic planning process and, uh, and how it affects everything else that we're doing. And so that is uh, expected to be before you on June 9th. So you'll get that on June 9th. And uh, I just wanted to just give you that information uh, where we'll be bringing that forward. So you'll see that and, and how everything interrelates. Um, so I just wanted to just uh, clarify that. Great, thanks. And to um, Vice Mayor Myers, to your point earlier, I, I realized I didn't, um, didn't respond, but I think that um, yes, part of this is a part of the recovery, I guess, effort, but I think that you know, the intention was just kind of seeing that this is gonna drag on longer, and given that we were able to have a conversation about evictions, because that was supposed to come back at this meeting, we thought that it might be good to see what other protections we can put in place moving forward, but I think a lot of this is gonna end up overlapping with our recovery since this is gonna probably last for a fairly long time. Thank you. Uh, uh, can I just add, I'm sorry, uh, just on that topic that, uh, yeah, the recommendation before you will uh, involve, uh, you know, having the council, uh, you know, accept the report on reconciling the, the traditional strategic planning work and then the, the reality of the response to the pandemic and then also um, uh, establishing a uh, council strategic recovery plan committee. So um, the sort of ongoing work can be certainly integrated in, in, into that. So uh, you have an, you know, there'll be an opportunity to, to cover those issues as well so in, in, as part of that process. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any um, further comment on this item and so if I think we're at a point where we can take a vote, I'll uh, ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote. Who was the second on this first? That was me. Uh, Catherine, do you have a uh, comment? You're muted. Catherine, you're muted. No, I, sorry. Um, I wondered if we did public input and I had fallen asleep or something. Yeah, Honestly, we did. We, we did, did. Okay. Yeah, we yeah, did. Thank you very much. I, I really, I'm truly couldn't remember. Yeah, thank you. No I'm ready for the vote. I think it's excellent, excellent. Uh, Great, uh, Council Member Matthews. Yeah, uh, I just can't see the whole motion. There's some stuff going off the top with mine to it. So that, that's crossed so, off. That disappears, and that there's really no one. It's just right. Right. There doesn't need to be a, a one with a presence there. Yeah, I think we deleted. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'll turn it to the clerk so that we can vote on the item before us. Oh, and you're muted. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. All right. Moving on, we have I think two more items before us, so we'll just have a lot of work will be done uh, before midnight. <laughs> I'm sure we will. So uh, the next item, it is number three, ordinance creating an infraction offense option for violating county and state orders related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'll turn that over to our city attorney Yes, thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the City Council. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Cassie Bronson to present this item. She's been working very closely with the police department, fire department, and the city manager's office and Parks and Rec in implementing the various uh, enforcement tools that we have, uh, but in this case, in, in particular, with respect to um, the, the county health officers, shelter in place orders, and, and the statewide orders. And so I will turn it over to Cassie. And I would just note that the, both uh, Chief Mills and Chief Hyduke are also 
here and available to answer any questions or provide their input uh, on this item. All right, hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for the thoughtful discussion of the last item. Uh, this item is uh, a proposed um, ordinance and we're proposing it on an emergency basis. And what is pretty simple, um, the proposed ordinance would be to essentially create an infraction offense under city law uh, for violation of um, the various public health orders that have been rolling out uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, one uh, major issue that we've sort of uh, come across is that um, under current law, uh, it is a misdemeanor to violate um, these public health orders, uh, whether they be from the county or at the state level. Um, this is a major concern uh, because uh, mis committing a misdemeanor is a pretty big deal. and. Um, you know, it requires the district attorney uh, to prosecute you, and uh, depending on your income, you may be entitled to a public defender. Um, so the end result of the various um, citations that are um, sort of in progress that are on the misdemeanor track is, is sort of unknown. And just sort of common sense wise, um, you know, I think there's a sentiment within the police department and also within our office that um, some of these violations should really um, be infractions um, uh, just because it's the conduct is um, more in line with basically like theories of negligence. Um, it's more similar to a traffic ticket versus, um, you know, willful criminal conduct. Um, so uh, what we've drafted is a proposed um, emergency ordinance to essentially um, create an infraction offense um, within the city of Santa Cruz um, for violating uh, public health orders, um, you know, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I saw some of the public comment. Uh, there was one comment in particular that was interesting um, that talked about uh, potentially uh, more coordination with the county, whether it be the public health officer or sheriff's department. Um, you know, that's an option if, if that's the track you guys want to take. Uh, we could bring this back to you at a, another date um, for coordination with the county. Um, from my perspective, um, you know, if we went that track, it would, we would, uh, we would want to really, if the county said no, then we would say, well, are we gonna rethink this or are we not? Um, in my opinion, I think this seems like a good idea, um, regardless of whether, you know, regardless of what the county's official position is. Um, but, you know, we could certainly um, reach out to the county and work with them uh, to try to get a uniform approach. Uh, I've got Chief Mills on the line here. I don't know if he wants to add anything. Um, he's here for questions. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council Members, and uh, Cassie's analysis was uh, spot on, and uh, we do think this would help us because it would give more even distribution throughout the entire department as opposed just to the sworn members of the, of the agency, as well as uh, there's, very, there's very frequently incidents that take place that really don't rise to the level of a misdemeanor where somebody's gonna have a record of some kind, that this would be more of an infraction. So we wanna be pretty sensitive to, sometimes people just don't understand the ever-changing environment, and this gives our officers a little bit more opportunity uh, to be judicious and, and metering out these citations. And uh, just addressing Cassie's last point, uh, in terms of coordination, we coordinate very closely with uh, all of the other police agencies in the county. Uh, the Sheriff's Office, as well as Capitola, Watsonville, Scotts Valley. We meet regularly on Zoom uh, calls and make sure that we're all coordinating and doing the enforcement exactly the same way. And so we're pretty confident that there is really uh, no need uh, to go back to the county or other agencies and have something formal. Uh, our biggest concern, obviously, is the behavior and the things that take place in the city. And so uh, 
uh, and all of us are on the same page and making sure that uh, we're enforcing the same way uh, without uh, completely clogging the courts with hundreds of citations, which would be debilitating for the justice system. So this, uh, I do think, is the best way uh, to move forward, and the city attorney has been very thoughtful about uh, how this has been proposed. So uh, we obviously in, in strong support of, uh, of this ordinance. Thank you. I think it's worth adding also, thank you, Chief, um, just emphasizing, emphasizing um, you know, public comments that the Chief has made that really um, even issuing a citation is, seems to be pretty late in the resort, <laughs> last resort for the police department. Um, they're giving a lot of warnings, a lot of education. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, to ensure compliance, there is um, sort of a law enforcement element to this, and some citations are uh, going to need to be issued. Um, one thing that, you know, is actually maybe worth clarifying right now, so we have a current process that we're using to sort of achieve this same result, but it's extremely um, clunky. Uh, basically, we have an executive order that Martine issued that um, essentially requires all people in the uh, city of Santa Cruz to obey these orders. And then we have the ability to enforce that through the municipal code. And then we have the ability to downgrade that to an infraction through our office. Um, we've been working out this process. It's, it's extremely clunky uh, because the person who's actually cited is cited with a misdemeanor. Um, but then it needs to go back to our office and then we need to work with the court to downgrade it to an infraction. Um, it would be nice if there weren't that even misdemeanor citation to begin with. Um, so that's just a little extra piece of information. Um, and I think that's it for my, my, my presentation. I don't know if Tony has anything to add. Looks like not. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> No, I appreciate that presentation and, and thanks. I think it's important that we're trying to balance um, and trying to get people to shelter in place. And then also, um, you know, as, as it's been mentioned, you know, if somebody gets an infraction and then that turns into a misdemeanor, which creates, which, you know, then they have a record. I think that's not what we're intending to do as we're trying to, you know, get people to comply with sheltering in place. So thank you all for bringing this forward. And uh, I'll see if there's any further questions from council members. It looks like Councilmember Matthews has her hand raised. And you're muted still. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no questions, but I cannot resist the temptation to make a motion to declunk our procedures. So <laughs> <laughs> once you ask for public comment, I would love to make a motion. <laughs> Oh, one thing I also wanted to point out, sorry, as I was going through the draft ordinance, I note that in section two, it says, as well as any oral testimony on the May 12th meeting, I think that's a typo. I had intended to get this in front of you on May 12th. Um, today is not May 12th. Um, so hopefully that should be amended uh, to say May 26th. Great, thank you. Um, are there any other questions from council members at this time? Okay, seeing none. Um, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Um, once you have entered the meeting, you'll need to hit star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you are unmuted, you will um, hear an announcement that says that you're unmuted and you will have two minutes to comment on this item. Okay, we have our first caller on the line. Is that me? That's you. Okay, uh, this is Marilyn Garrett. I'm listening to your meeting here. I wanna give you a quote from an article that sheds insight into this. This is by Arthur Furstenberg. The evidence mounts is the title of the newsletter, An Ocean of Viruses is this section. And he says, the idea that we can keep from sharing viruses with each other by 
being a certain distance away from each other and wearing masks is as realistic as pretending that putting a mask on a fish will protect it from getting wet. And he describes how viruses are all over in the hundreds of thousands, and I've heard this from other medical professionals. And to give fines for people not wearing masks or following these um, orders that I consider draconian is uh, very inappropriate for local officials who are to represent the public. This is um, the viruses I don't see, though problematic in cases, as the existential problems of the threat of nuclear war and the environmental degradation that's taking place. And I would refer you to Dr. Thomas Cowan as a source of information, Arthur Furstenberg's cell phone task force, and a um, professor, Dolores Cahill. So I think, and also what's going on now, as we're sheltering in place, Trump launched his six force of the military space force that really threatens the nuclear war. Okay, those, those are my comments. Thank you. Well, good evening. This is James Ewing Whitman, Maryland. Thank you so much. Um, I heard most of this. I was still working. This comment affects what's going on. So right now in Minneapolis, the police station is surrounded and there's a riot going on. This is very sad. This is what I wrote while I've been listening to you guys. Um, violence is not the answer, but change must happen. Yet as the greatest form of violence is silence, Albert Einstein, communication, mindful, meaningful, and hopeful are critical now, as is justice here and on a much larger scale, as no one is a worthless eater. So what will justice actually look like here and other issues? Other issues. And what could happen on, when, a very, when very large amounts of populations everywhere are starving? My hope is that magnetobiologically, words, energy, like I am not afraid, creates courage with love to triumph over fear. Rudolf Joseph Lorenzo Steiner, 1905. And men like these, Mr. Daryl Davis, why I, as a black man, attend KKK rallies. So I posted this on my Facebook about an hour ago. Um, okay, I don't really, really pray for myself. I do and know, know that magno biologically, this anger energy has grown from information I am not aware of. I am aware that we need law enforcement and all military personnel to wake up to the reality that the super elite are using them more than even the average citizen. With that, let's really start talking about our grandchildren's grandchildren's future. It is not that we are alive, sentient beings, so don't believe a word I say. Do your own research as the only way the human body can survive even a short time as a controlled slave from the alterations of this already ready RNA and chip vaccine. Now, mostly still human, will now be humanoid. I have one more line. It will not feel pain. How will that affect the feeling of a natural orgasm? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, this is Gary Phillip. I'll read a little of my letter. Uh, I see you have at least partially come to your senses concerning the outrageous assignment of a misdemeanor offense to COVID-19 social distancing, as I argued against uh, before to deaf ears. I still don't think it should be anything but at most an infraction. Nothing has changed there. Again, it is a ticket for what is defined as risky behavior, much like speeding. Well, actually less than that, uh, because at least for the speeder, the risk is proven and positive witness of the risk-taking can be proven. For 
someone of an unknown health condition, there is no way to know if they actually present any risk whatsoever to other people. Many of the social distancing measures have little of any scientific basis, and the small number of people actually at risk is unknown, but it is small given the so few testing positive in the county. I would love to see 12 people on a jury try to give someone a misdemeanor conviction, for instance, walking on the closed beach at 459. I suspect a great many juries would come back hung. Uh, this is not, uh, or this is more about not being able to prosecute in a cost-effective manner. Thank you, uh, some recognition you were wrong before, and the penalty is outrageous, but you still don't get as an option. It's, it is still outrageous. I, I, I might be confused on this, but I, I think that you are still leaving intact the misdemeanor uh, option uh, using the emergency powers of, you know, the, the law that was there before. I don't, I, I'm not sure this replaces that. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, well, you know what, that, that's all I have to say. Bye. All right, next speaker, you're on the line. I believe I got four minutes. Um, I don't recall. Yeah, that's what you wrote me yesterday in a letter, so that's what I should be taking. Oh, oh yeah, that's correct. I apologize. Uh, so the previous speaker's confusion is correct. This can be charged as either a misdemeanor or an infraction. Uh, why you're using an emergency uh, procedure to make a supposedly help out people with uh, lesser penalties. What it really is is it's a tool that allows the police to make more use of these penalties. At any time the district attorney or the city, actually it's the city attorney wants, whether with a misdemeanor or a, an infraction, it can be withdrawn. So it's not like they have to pursue it. Misdemeanors require jury trials and a public defender, which in fact gives an additional level of protection to the defendant. Two weeks ago, a measure essentially authorizing infraction and misdemeanor citations by virtually every city employee was passed. City Attorney Condotti assured us then this was merely an administrative measure, but provided no specific instances, as we are not hearing any specific instances, of where such an ordinance is. Uh, this clarification, as he put it two weeks ago, would have been necessary. Uh, many are concerned with the natural, national expansion of police and military power. Others are worried about this operating at a state level. My focus has usually been the local police tendency to use the hideout or get out strategy against homeless people. This was pioneered by Councilmember Matthews back in the day, when he was a ready supporter of the Councilmember Rotkin's support of the unconscionable sleeping ban, which is still apparently at the top of Chief Mill's agenda and Tony Condotti as exemplified by Mill's numerous public meetings prior to the COVID situation and also an up upcoming camping ban. Um, the proposed Chapter 6.94 that you're considering is another one of us the police department has traditionally gotten quick passage through insisting it's just another useful tool in the toolbox. This allows police to enforce the edicts of the county health officer, the governor, and the state of California public health officer as either infractions or misdemeanors at their discretion. This discretion gives police a kind of power that can be used arbitrarily, even with the best intentions. We, we see in the city and county's defiance of CDC guidelines, uh, we see this problem of the whack-a-mole approach regarding the encampment security for homeless folks, as well as individual motel rooms for the vulnerable, that is, say, the refusal to follow CDC guidelines. The motel rooms are empty when asked for the stats, the mayor ducks. As I mentioned earlier, we've seen attempts to expand the Rent-A-Snitch ambassador program. These fancied up patrol, security patrols, have not sworn off regular harassment of homeless people in city after city, and our police department, while enforcing the camping ordinance less during the past Past year or two has ramped up enforcement of other laws with the same effect. We need more positive programs, like the police department's recent handing out of sandwiches, being concerned about social services, helping drug, drug addicted people get to them, what little services we have. These are the positive motions we need, not more infraction laws at this point. There's already lots of public concern and conflict around enforcement activities. While I support the general direction of health officials encouraging caution regarding public gatherings why expand police power at this point? What are the specific police problems
problems that seem to require this. So it was good to hear Councilmember Brown ask the ambassador advertiser for the actual stats that would back her up, her so-called we're so friendly claims in the future. But it's now, not in the future, that we need this direction before the vote is taken to provide the information of why this measure is really necessary now. What specific problems have the police department had? How many cases they had? And I have more, but stopping here. All right, thank you very much for your comments. And for members of the public who are watching, uh, this is item number three on our evening agenda. If you'd like to call in, now is the time. And after you have entered the meeting, you'll need to press star nine on your phone uh, and you will be given two minutes to speak. Okay, next caller, you're on the line. Uh, good evening, this is Scott Graham. Um, my objection to this is the real cost of each of these infractions. I mean, you have it listed as, you know, 50, 100, 200 dollars or whatever, uh, but each one of those has an administrative cost at the courts, which adds hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars, to each one of these fines. And if you start handing these out to homeless people and uh, people of uh, very little means, you're putting an undue burden on people. So if there's some way to lower this, you know, uh, this whole idea of that the police need another tool in their toolbox, their toolbox is overflowing with tools. There's stuff in there about horses and, you know, stuff about, you know, shooting off six, you know, having a, a shootout in the middle of town at high noon and things like that. We, we ought to go through that toolbox and throw a bunch of this stuff away before we start adding new stuff to it. Look at the real cost of these fines. It's outrageous. Over and out. Thank you. And with that, um, that brings us to a close of our public uh, comment on the item that's before us. And so um, I'm wondering if there's any further questions or comments from council members. Oh. Council member Golder, you're, you can. I don't have any questions. I'm prepared to make a motion to move forward. Okay. Um, um well, I'm going to make that motion. Okay. So, um, I, uh, shoot, my iPad's plugged in over there. <laughs> um, I'm, would, uh, can someone help me with the language? Because I left my, I'm prepared to, um, make a motion for the ordinance adding chapter 6.94 to the Santa Cruz Municipal Code, creating an infraction offense option for violating the county and state orders related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so the motion by Council Member Golder. Council Member Matthews, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, I'm gonna second to be Chief Gunkabayo. <laughs> okay, so the motion made by uh, Council Member Golder, seconded by Council Member Matthews to um, adopt the staff recommendation. Uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, I um, I just, I'm gonna support the motion. I just wanted to comment that I, you know, I do understand the concerns expressed by uh, a couple of our uh, public commenters about the potential for kind of um, uh, unequal burden on, uh, on members of our unhoused community, or unhoused community members. Um, in this case, though, I think that I understand correctly, we are uh, trying to uh, move away from the more punitive, harsher, and lengthier uh, kinds of uh, um, consequences. So I, I support the motion and thank you for your work. And I'll just say that um, I understand the concerns that were raised as well. But I also think that, you know, we also have to understand that 
if there's nothing in place, um, you know, our park staff and um, our police officers and public safety officers are just, you know, running around telling people to not do something and they don't have any way of kind of ensuring the overall protection of our community. And so we've been trying to do the best we can, obviously, to um, balance, you know, giving people access to um, the outdoors and beaches and at the same time being able to protect our community from people who may be coming from other areas where um, there are higher prevalence of COVID-19. So I think that this is, you know, striking a really good balance between, um, you know, being able to enforce the court orders or the, uh, the shelter in place orders while also um, trying to not, um, you know, be too punitive on people. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. I just have to say uh, uh, that an ordinance like this is always preceded with a warning as a standard operating procedure. Mm -hmm. Am I not correct on that, Chief? <laughs> you know, you know, you're not supposed to be close to the here. What, whatever the current public health directive is, and we're lucky in Santa Cruz. We have avoided some of the worst because our population, in general, has been really observant of some very tough directions, and they're changing and they're loosening. But um, you know, getting down down to the heart of it, I do believe that uh, in a health emergency. There's a role for public health direction, and uh, we have to be able to uh, convey that and enforce it at a reasonable level. And before we take the vote, I just wanted to share some information that came out of our um, out of our uh, mayor's meeting with the sheriff about a week or so ago, and I was able to ask the sheriff on demographic information of who's been receiving the tickets throughout the county. And so just briefly, um, when we look at race as a demographic um, of the people who received infractions, 46% were white, 24.2% were Hispanic, 2.4% were black, 4.7% were, were Asian, 0.9% um, were American Indian, and then 21.8% were other. For sex, 60% of the infractions were given to men, given to males. 40% um, were given to females. And in terms of age, um, for people between the ages of 0 and 17, 6% um, received infractions, 18 to 29, 42% of those um, people received infractions. Um, of the infractions that were given to people between the ages of 30 and 39, or 19%, 40 to 49, or 20%, 50 to 59, or 7%, 60 to 69, or 5%, and people above the age of 70 who received infractions, only 1% um, made up that demographic. So I just wanted to say that to be clear that, you know, if there's any concerns that people of color are being disproportionately ticketed or that there are any demographics that are receiving more tickets than others, um, it seems that, you know, our, um, that, that there's not a disproportionate amount of tickets going to, or infractions going to people of color and people aren't being targeted. Um, in that way. So I just thought I'd share that and I'll be sending that over to council members as well. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to um, Bonnie to conduct the roll call vote. Council member Byers. Oh, you're muted. Aye. Matthews. Aye. Brown. Aye. Holder. Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes unanimously. Thanks for bringing that forward. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I think I'm actually also the next item, which is re it's related. Um, a resolution to update the bail schedule. Um, do you want me to just start going into that now or? Go right ahead. Okay, so as you all know, um, as part of updating the municipal code, uh, we also need to update the bail schedule, um, which will define or help to define um, what the fine is for this type of um, infraction. Uh, the 
bail schedule that we've proposed um, mirrors sort of like the default within our municipal code, which is $100 for the first um, offense, uh, $200 within the second offense within one year, or $500, and $500 for the third offense within one year. Um, so that's what we're recommending. It's sort of the default. Um, and uh, we think that's reasonable. One uh, thing to add is the city's, and you know, you've been over this before, but the city's base fine is actually, and the amount that we can control really, is actually, you know, really low in comparison to the total fine that a person um, will end up paying for one of these tickets. So we recently we recently received the calculation that the court uses uh, to establish what the fines are, and we believe, uh, based on the calculations that we've received, that if we set our base fine at $100, um, the total citation will be $480. Um, for the $200 um, citation for your second offense, that'll be $890. And for the, the third offense, the base fine would be 500, which add, add, adds up to a total of over $2,000. Um, so that's what we're proposing. That's the default within the municipal code and I look forward to your discussion on it. All right, thank you. Um, Councilmember Byers, to see you with your hand raised. Oh, no, I th thank you for showing what the actual cost is. And I think that's what some of our speakers were already talking to, how it isn't $100, it's this. So that, that's my own. I'm really ready to support the motion when it's mm -hmm. ready. Great. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for uh, finally getting us an answer to that question about um, how our bail schedule kind of translates in uh, the through the to the final uh, fine. So if I understand this correctly, it's somewhere around like four times. It ends up being about four times whatever our base is. That's what it appears. And this is right. information uh, received from an attorney at our office who's been doing this, Stephanie Duck. So thank you to her in public. Um, so she's the one right. who's able to get that information. All right, thanks. That's kind of shocking, but here we are. Thanks. We're working on it. <laughs> um, if Andy's still on the phone, this is still a question for him. Does it make any difference, would it, <laughs> if, if uh, Tickets, the citation being written, and the person citing it said, Well, I've asked you to do such and such. You're not doing it. I am going to write your citation. It's $100, but I, I want to tell you that when this was the collection, it's actually going to come to XYZ. Would you like to rethink your action here? <laughs> oh. <laughs> it is. It's a lot of money. Yeah. But when, when you consider that there's a request and a warning given first. Yeah, uh, Council Member uh, Matthews, you stated earlier that we often warn people, and you're 100% right. Uh, over the weekend, in the last couple of weeks, we've warned literally thousands of people uh, on the weekends and ticketed a handful. And uh, right now, we've, we're about 300 citations. Uh, and we certainly could write a lot more, but we would rather gain compliance and, uh, and have people move off the beach on their own. And most often people do once they're educated or directed. Um, you know, you ask, you tell, and then you cite. Uh, so uh, only about 300 people have needed citations. And uh, so we're happy about that. But so you're right, we almost always warn first and try to explain to people the consequences uh, uh, that are potential for the, the citation. Thanks, Chief. Are there any further comments uh, or questions at this time? <coughs> Seeing none, um, if, for members of the public uh, who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you'd like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. 
Once you have called into the meeting, you'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. If there's any members of the public, please call in now and remember to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Hey, you're on the line. Oh, yes, hello. This is James Ewing Whitman. I'm reopening up the order that I believe is the May 22nd, 2021, the health order stay at home. I'm trying to figure out what the small print is, and I've been trying to read it. And, okay, I'm assuming that's correct. I'm not seeing the similar stuff that I saw in the earlier orders that gave certain people who were involved with critical business the ability to to maintain the social distancing and the mask and the proper mask, because I did read that at least it explains that some masks are not proper. Um, so I'm just, I don't know, I didn't read through it, so I'm not really prepared to make critical remarks. Another 10 minutes and I would have. I was hoping more citizens would speak before me. So I'm gonna do what I can to support everything I can. That's all I can say. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. So again, if you are a member of the public who'd like to speak to this item, please call in now and press star nine on your phone and you will be given two minutes to speak. Okay, next speaker. Hello? Hello? Am I on? Yes, you are, good evening. Okay, uh, uh, good evening. I'm just wondering, given how so many people have no employment now uh, and on their way to starvation and homelessness, are you planning to establish debtors' prisons? Um, this is a lot of money for people who don't have it. And um, these are such amazing crimes to be walking on the beach. A friend of a friend got a $1,000 ticket for jogging at the non-designated time at the beach. These are the commons, the public place that we have paid for and are um, they're ours, and I consider this very um, unhealthy policies, the orders supposedly in the interest of health, and it's very unhealthy wearing masks. You can't get the oxygen, you're breathing your own carbon dioxide. Uh, some of the masks have toxic chemicals. This is like a myth of mask safety. I really think all of these um, tickets for these um, what are called crimes uh, should be dismissed. I have a list of crimes that I can think of that are real crimes, like being poisoned by pesticides, like Verizon microwaving people uh, against their informed consent, um, uh, fracking. Um, I mean, this is just... Um, very anti-democratic, militaristic. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, seeing no other members of the public who'd like to comment on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. <laughs> Council member would like to, if there's no further questions, I'll be looking for a motion from council members. Council member Matthews. I'll move the item before us. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by council member Matthews, second by council member Byers. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we will, I'll uh, ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council member Byers. Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? 
Aye. Holder? Aye. Um, Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously, and that brings us to the conclusion of our meeting for this evening, or today and this evening. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Have a nice dinner. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.